Okay, and hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas here. Welcome to another day of the CUR uh, 2020 live stream. And let me get us all uh, situated and, and in place here. Um, so let me pop this on up so people can see what I'm talking about this morning. So, and so I can hear that I can hear my voice in the background, which means one of you guys has your computer on, Paul or Steve. Not I. Paul. Not I. On me, 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 me. Here we go. <laughs> we got the sound down. Big, big surprise. Listening to music. <laughs> it's one of our okay. of the, um... <clears throat> Yes, this is why Paul is, has has been banned from calling into talk radio, right? From, from sports stations because he always <laughs> he leaves the he leaves the radio on. Um, yeah, then I, I I made a lot of calls to sports stations. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to another edition of CUR 2020, the uh, the Groundhog Day edition um, here. So I have Paul Farkas and Steve Silverberg here as usual. How you doing, guys? Hi, Robert. We're, we're good. All right. So um, I guess it's day two, and uh, you know, second day. So we're we're picking up steam. You know, I think Steve, we had close to a thousand people here yesterday uh, taking classes. So you know, the conference is is chugging along. Um, so today, what we're going to do on the live stream, you know, if, if anybody's out there watching, and I know in about 10 minutes more people are going to join us, because the way I do this for all the, you know, the, the people who watch this is I send out an e-blast after about 10 or 15 minutes of going live, uh, just to make sure that nothing has blown up. So there's going to be an e-blast going out to all ODWire people in a few minutes, and hopefully they'll be here and they'll join us this morning. But just to let you know what's on the schedule today, let me bring it up so I can show everybody uh, what we're doing. Or what we think we're doing at the conference, right? We hope uh, hope everything goes well today for us. Let's see. It's, um, you know, as we do this, the technical problems get smaller and smaller, which has been great. And let me pull up the schedule, which is the most important thing that everyone needs today. So I'll put it right here. There we go. Okay, so that was yesterday. And today we've got a whole bunch of lectures, including Steve, your lecture's coming up, isn't it? Landmark lecture at 11 o'clock. If um, you've seen it, of course, you don't have to see it again. But if you haven't, I, I think it's real interesting. It's real stuff about epigenetics, which is a sister of genetics uh, and how it affects eye care and probably affect you more in the next decade than it will in the next week or so. But uh, I welcome everybody. I'll be in the room in about uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, there's other lectures going on at the same time. And um, just choose your poison. Excellent. And I see you got some. you got some tough competition. This yeah. Morning, though, yeah, you really do. Opposite you. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, yeah, because I've Who's actually, Mark? yeah, I listened Who's to Mark Sue's Friedberg lecture. Talking? Yeah, so, so, so Mark Friedberg, of course, that OCT2 lecture that's there is one of the most popular ones ever, uh, looking at the sheer number of people that have taken it. So, you know, Paul's right, Steve, you're up against some pretty, pretty tough competition. And Sue, of course, with her specialty lens practice, I actually listened to that one as well. Um, so she knows more about specialty lenses than just about anyone I can think of. So, um, yeah, you're sandwiched in there, Steve. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. That actually is amazing. Um, I, I heard it live in Jersey, um, or at least a, a version of it. And he, he, a lot of times when somebody does the OCT and let's say somebody has macular degeneration of glaucoma, um, can we use the data? And there's no articles I ever saw about whether the data is good or bad if there's commingling conditions because the OTCT might read different things. The GCC complex, for example, around the macula might be good or bad. He answers all those questions, and it was, it, it's amazing stuff that I don't think I've seen anywhere, as I said, in the um, optometric ophthalmology uh, literature. Yep. And let me, uh, let me pull in here um, just uh, one, one more thing to note about Friedberg's lecture. Later today, uh, for, those of us, for those of you who are just watching the live stream instead of actually you know, registering and taking classes, um, we're going to run one of Dr. Friedberg's lectures again right here in the live stream when we take a break. So you can actually hear what he's like and maybe it'll inspire you uh, to sign up because it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, so definitely check it out. The other thing I wanted to mention that even though all you guys are competing against each other this morning right in the four tracks, uh, people don't have to worry about missing your lecture because, um, as we've noted uh, numerous times now, um, we are doing this all again. So. Um, you know, the conference itself is the largest in optometry now by far. So we will, you know, we cracked 5,000 a while back. Um, we'll have, you know, more numbers for people when this is all over. But the most interesting thing is that because Arbo has suspended the rules around CE, online CE counting, you know, the same as 
Um, in person C, we've decided to do C wire all over again. So many people might not know this, that the conference is going to return again live four more times, right? So in August, October, November, and December. So what that means, even for people who just signed up right now, uh, if you look at the schedule, notice we have four tracks, right? So that means that people can come back and if they wanted to, take every single class, right? Because we're giving that many live lectures. So I'd highly encourage people, if they're interested, to come on back um, on those dates and do it all over again and again and again and again. Yeah, and the courses will be in the same same dates and times mm. as, as you have today. Yep, people ask so me that all the all the time why why we do that how come the grid always looks the same over and over and that's on purpose so that people can keep taking uh, different courses so if you take steve's course today next time around you can take sue's course so that's why we do it and Ted, there's always a little bit new content there's a new lecture this um conference with sue resnick and and dr whitney hauser um and we're going to add some more new content as it goes we want to have you have the opportunity to take everything that we've uh put out there over the last couple of months because I think every lecture is excellent. So uh, take advantage of it and watch me one time, Mark uh, Freeberg one time, Sue Resnick one time, and uh, Charles Shiflowski one time. You can get it all. all very diverse and, and also, subject. And also, if you like the courses, uh, tell your friends. We really do promote as much as you can promote, but it's remarkable how many optometrists still don't know about CE Wire, that if it's like new information. Yeah. Uh, so, well, you know, yeah, optometric friends, let them know. Yeah, it's it's funny. I guess with marketing, you have to just pound pound into people's heads because they might have seen the name once or twice, but then forgotten about us or do not know it. Um, yesterday, we had a really interesting case. Actually, C wire is good for orals for people who are in New Jersey um, who have an orals requirement. Uh, a lot of our lectures, I think it's how many, Steve? Like five or six of them actually qualify for that. Uh, exactly. um, Narcotics counted. There's about eight or nine, eight yeah. or nine, which is almost entire New Jersey. Right. And so over it to you. And what was funny to me, though, Steve, is we were having this conversation with a doctor via email. He didn't realize that and he didn't even know about it. And the fact that, you know, we are good for orals, I don't think many doctors in New Jersey even know that. Um, so there's definitely a whole bunch of people who haven't heard of the conference yet or don't even know, you know, what's inside and, and how useful it can be to them. So anybody who's listening to this, if you want to get the word out, please feel free. As you can tell, we don't do any real marketing for the conference, right? We don't, um, you've never gotten a mail flyer, <laughs> right? In, in the, using the U.S. Nope. Postal Service about us. Um, we just sort of go by word of mouth and working online on OD Wire and, and a little bit on the different social media channels, but that's it. So uh, we, you know, anything we, we can do to help to, us would be great. We do try to um, um, have courses for what states are requiring now. We have three uh, hours, for example, on opiates and narcotics mm -hmm. uh, by Dr. Bella and Dr. Vizmenti, and I know certain states now are requiring uh, something on human trafficking, and we're going to add that to the schedule at some point in time in, in the far or near future. So let us know what the states need, and we'll incorporate it like we did the orals for New Jersey, like we did narcotics for several states. Uh, we need to know because every state's so different. Yeah, and you know what's fascinating, too, about that? Um, you know, looking like I was looking at Florida's requirements. A lot of times the states will have requirements that have nothing to do with eye care, that all healthcare providers have to take, like human trafficking. And many of the courses that, that I've seen anyway, they're not necessarily COPE approved, right? It's, it's a completely different accrediting body, just getting it approved for that particular um, topic. And so, you know, you have to take a $50 course or whatever it is in Florida for human trafficking that sort of stands alone from the rest of, of their CE. Whereas what we'd probably do here is get that lecture COPE approved. So not only can people take it to meet that specific requirement, but then you can also use it as part of your COPE credits. Now, the one in Florida allows you to do human trafficking. I want to make that clear. It doesn't teach you about it. That's just kidding. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know what's funny, too, is um, when I, you know, as a Florida license holder uh, in medicine, you know, I, was, I have to take those, too. And when you get material from CE companies about these specific requirements, again, those courses stand alone. Like, I'll get a thing, you know, with 50 um, Category 1 medical credits and, you know, from a company, but then I'll get a completely different packet just with those two or three specific special credits that you need just for Florida. And those special credits will, all, will cost almost as much as the other 50, 
general medical credits. <laughs> um, so there's definitely some room for us to come in here and, and make it part of CEY and hopefully save people some money on these special credits that they might have to go elsewhere for. Yep. Much like CPR credits, which we obviously can't do online totally, but um, they have to be done by a licensed CPA person in person, and um, we can't accomplish that goal. Yep. Okay. I'm going to beg off now to go my room. Oh, yeah. Good, good um, luck. <laughs> Okay, good luck, Steve. Yeah, and the other thing uh, is that you've got to keep checking with your state board because even though some state boards have very limited uh, online requirements now, they may change their mind come September. So keep keep checking and, and yep. see what, what your board is doing yep. because it is, things are changing. Yeah, that's a really good point, you know, and, and <clears throat> even if your board has not loosened up yet, uh, on these things counting as live. If you take a bunch of credits at CE Wire, what you may find is that, let's say they only would have accepted you know, 15 credits and now they're gonna let you do 40. If you take 40 at CE Wire, you know, you'll have them banked. So if, you're, if your board does change their mind, you'll have them on the transcript. Arbo will have them in their files. Um, so you basically meet your CE requirement just by doing nothing but sitting there and wait for, waiting for your state board to loosen up a bit. So, cool. So yep. uh, what else did I have to say? Oh yeah, plan your day, critical thing. Uh, if you're here today, download that schedule. And again, it's at cewire2020.com. If you go to where it says courses, you can download the printable course schedule. That's the, the thing I've been showing you here. Um, obviously I have it on screen, but it's very easy to print. And this is probably the easiest way for you to, to plan your day versus you know, looking at onesies and twosies. Um, so go check that out. And remember, you can't be in two places at once. If you want credit, you have to sort of stay in a room uh, and watch the thing, um, you know, that's an Arbo requirement. Uh, even though they've started relaxing a lot of their rules this year, and we know a lot of CE providers are not, um, you know, they're playing a little bit fast and loose with the rules, it's important with our software that you sit there and you actually watch. And um, obviously you can't tell if your eyes are open, but leave your browser window open um, as you're watching, because uh, it does have a timer, right. a timer that you can't see, it's and also, an internal timer. And then at the yeah, end, and, and, mm -hmm. You've you got to remember that uh, you, it's, the courses are eight hours straight, so most people cannot sit there for eight hours. So if you want to take a break for an hour a couple of times a day, don't worry about it because the courses will be repeated another four times. So you have a chance to take the, the other courses uh, in, in uh, August, October, November, December. Correct. So yeah, there's, so there's do things in more. a leisurely pace. Yeah. Don't kill yourself. Yeah, there's, there's, there's always more time now. I mean, before, you know, this used to be a kind of a one and done thing, but now with the rules loosening up again, we're doing this over and over again as we, we put up here. Um, so you can always come back. So yeah, don't kill yourself over this. Uh, you know, if you get tired, you can always come back those other days. Um, and the lectures will, st will still be there along with a few new ones. And I have a feeling that this year, you know, every year we have some crazy people who complete all the courses, and it gets harder, right? The more we add, the harder it gets, but we usually have a couple dozen people who will try to complete the whole thing. <laughs> so. Well, the, for the ones that are fanatics, don't you have a group from Estonia? Is it Estonia that, that signs up as a group? Yeah, yep, so we do have, we do have some people from there. They've, they've uh, you're right, they do take every course that they can, and so it's not even a matter of credits, it's that they want to learn. Yeah. Yeah, so the, there are optometrists overseas, well, actually worldwide, that are uh, taking the courses now, and they really are eager because they can't get this quality, well, I, I don't think, uh, that we're offering. As a matter of fact, even in optometry, if you look at our list, we are so top-heavy with, with MDs and giving medical courses, I don't think there is any other uh, course, uh, continuing education courses that offer this much medicine. What would you think, Ed? Yeah, no, not, not an optometry, certainly. We made an effort to reach out to a lot of ophthalmologists. And, you know, we even have some, some doctors here. We have a pediatrician, uh, the head of pediatrics at Mount yep. Sinai, actually, in New York. So we, we've, we've made an effort to reach out to give people CE that's a little bit different than they might be able to get somewhere else, which could be fun, you know, so you don't get the same old, same old. Um, in terms of the people from Europe taking the classes, I think the interesting hook for them is, you know, like everywhere else, traveling for sea is expensive. And to get a, a group of people like this together in one place, like even, you know, and I know that there are some big conferences in Europe where they do it, but again, it's expensive to go to and a huge pain and a hassle time-wise to go. 
Um, so the fact that they can get it done here is great. Of course, the only issue with Europe is time zone issues. Um, but, you know, most people have been making it work. And again, if, if you don't need the credits, you can always watch the stuff on demand, right? Because you don't necessarily right. need to be there live if you don't need the credits. Uh, I think our live audiences have been so huge this year just because, you know, people are getting full credit for this if they show up live. So anyway, uh, that's today. And we got, you know, it's the usual slate of classes plus a couple of new ones. Um, the, the most important new one uh, that we're going to have is um, the lecture all, all about ptosis that uh, Sue Resnick and Whitney Hauser uh, put together for this particular show. And what I'd like to do for that is show people the actual lecture here in the live stream. So if someone took the effort to turn up and listen to us this morning, uh, I'd like to reward that by having us play the lecture in the live stream. Now, if you watch here in the live stream, you're not going to get credit for the lecture, obviously, right? Because you're not inside of CE Wire right now. You could be listening to me right now on OD Wire. You could be listening to me, you know, in YouTube itself. Some people stumble across this that way. You could be on Facebook. So you could be listening to me in a variety of different ways. But if you want credit for this stuff, you have to listen to it within CE Wire, where our software will track you. Uh, and then you can enter your OE tracker number and you'll get credit. But anyway, we're going to uh, play Dr. Resnick's uh, and, and Hauser's talk in this live stream today. Uh, so you'll get sort of the world premiere of it, even though you're not in C wire proper. So that should be fun. Cool. What, what time do you plan on doing this? Is this going to be the first screen? Um, nah, I, that's a really good question. So we have a couple of other clips that I want to show people today, too. Uh, you know, we have, like I mentioned, Dr. Friedberg's lecture that I'd like to put up there. Um, so I'll tell you what, why don't we, we, we could make it the first one, I guess. That, that might be interesting. Um, maybe we should. What do you think? Should okay, we vote? Maybe, <laughs> I'm not only that, but I think you might want to publicize it on OD Wire. So why not uh, send out a, a quick flash? To people <laughs> with my can you, can you do it with my abundant can spare time here <laughs> with, with all the time well, you have available <laughs> like a, an email I, flash you know yeah watch Susan Resnick's lecture no and, and I, I get don't it out to 24,000 people I don't think that's going to happen because in fact everybody just received our, our message about two minutes ago about the live stream being on right now so if they're going to be here they're going to be here mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe in a few minutes we can play it. So what I'd like to do, though, before we do any clips or anything like that this morning, uh, and by the way, I don't, I don't know if Gretchen's going to be here with us today. I don't see her here yet. She may or may not stumble in and out, but, uh, but I guess we'll see. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do before we do anything else is we can just, you know, thank our sponsors for, for, for uh, being here. And again, let me just finish up by reminding people, watch the entire lecture if you want credit. Enter your Arbo OE tracker number. Um, and, uh, and attest to the fact that you were at the talk. So there's a little box that you do it in. It's very easy to do. When you go into a talk, there'll be a chat window at the bottom, and someone will usually be there to walk you through it the first time just to show you how to do it. Uh, and then after that, it becomes very rote. You take a class, you fill out the little box that says, I attest to the fact that I was here, and you put in your OE tracker number, and you should be good to go. Um, because there's no quizzes right now for live credit. Uh, and again, that's not our rule. That's Arbo's rule. They said that there don't have to be quizzes now if you're doing live CE. So that's that. again, if they run into trouble, it's uh, yeah. Where, so, where do they have to go? So if you run into trouble, there's a little box with, with a live chat where you can actually talk to someone immediately for support, or you can just send an email to support at cewire2020.com, and we're always here. Which is another thing that I think. Um, I want people to be very aware of the fact that we are always here to help. Um, you know, the, the number that you have on your transcript that you see, the phone number, that goes right here to me, actually. Um, the support email address goes to several people at once, including me, so I see everything that happens. So if something gets messed up in your transcript, or you don't attest to something properly, or you mistyped your OE tracker number, which, by the way, happens a lot, so don't worry, don't worry about it, um, we can fix that. So you don't have to worry that, oh my gosh, I took all these classes and now I'm not going to get credit. That's not the case. The system tracks that you were there and we can fix any problems that you might have. Uh, so again, it's a, kind of a different experience than you might have of using, you know, other online systems where when an exception happens, right, when you have a problem, actually trying to get a human being to fix it is almost impossible. It's the opposite here. Um, you know, we're standing by and we continually field support emails from people and don't mind doing it. We want to make sure that if you took the classes that you get credited properly. 
So again, don't feel like it's a bother. If you send an email to support at cewire2020.com, we'll answer it. In fact, last night I got one, I think it was around 7 p.m. Um, and you know, happily picked up the phone, talked to the person to try to straighten out their issue. Um, and again, not a problem. So that's what we're here for. Okay. Okay, so, um, and I'd like to thank our sponsors uh, for being part of the show again today. Um, who knew we'd be doing this all the way into June <laughs> and beyond? Right. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like I could almost do this with my eyes closed talking about the various sponsors. Uh, but let's go. But don't forget to visit them. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's. Even though you're talking about them, there's a, there are booths. Yep. So you can go visit them in person. It's critically important, actually, that you, you visit them. Um, <laughs> obviously, you know, they, they could use the business, but more, th more than that, you know, you, you can stop into the booth and learn what they're doing. Right now, you know, as the pandemic is continuing on, people are, you know, all opening up their offices now, more or less, right? Or some people are operating under the new normal where their offices are open, but they're modifying their procedures. And each one of these companies, you know, has been trying to help with social distancing and trying to get your, the, your practice back on its feet. And let me show you how. So first and foremost, we have Marco. Marco has been the sponsor of this live stream since the conference started, in fact six years ago. Um, Paul, I'm, I'm sure you remember that Marco was one of the yeah, companies yeah. that gave us the, the inspiration to gave do this. the idea. Sure. Yeah. So I, Absolutely. I, I approached them and I said, hey, what do you think about this? And they looked at me and they're like, you know what, if you feel like going ahead and doing this, go for it. We'll support you. It sounds like an interesting idea. And from that, we now have this conference. So I thank Marco for being behind us all the way. Marco is actually now part of Advancing Eye Care, which is a, a, a group of several companies that have come together with Marco Lombard, EMS, Innova, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, and the, yeah. important, the important thing about the tie-up with all of them is that, you know, you can now get support, you know, nationwide, or should I say internationally too, because Innova's Canadian, right? Um, and so it's really, having the companies come together has been very helpful, uh, I think, from a, a service perspective. Uh, so check them out for sure. And in fact, in their booth, they'll tell you about any specials that are there. Um, because I don't know them off the top of my head. So that's the other part about this conference running so long is that so the specials are constantly changing and morphing over time and I can't possibly keep on top of all of them. Um, so again, same thing with Optos, uh, you know, makers of the, the wide field uh, imaging systems. I don't know what their specials are today. I wish I could tell you, I just don't know. Uh, but if you go into their booth, I'm sure there are things listed there. Um, and go check them out. So thank you for them for sponsoring. Now, Conan Medical, I do know their specials because they emailed them to me. So the more communicative the sponsors are with me, the better it is because I can then create things like this where I, I put up what the specials are. So for them, six months deferred payments, six months no interest on approved credit for all devices, and then low rates after that, 4.19% for qualified customers. Um, and they're also having a, a really good sale on the Retival ERG unit, and it's going to be $2,000 off the list price, which is their best special ever. And we have a webinar about uh, ERG that we did with Craig Thomas that we're going to show later in this live stream. If you've never you know, done ERG in your office and you're thinking this is something you might want to do, uh, he reviews what ERG is all about and why it's useful. And in fact, he will talk about the Retival unit as well, uh, so you can get a sense of it. It's funny, it's, it's very much like every other piece of technology, right, where things start out very large, very clunky, very expensive and slow, and then over time, they get smaller, faster, cheaper. And when you see the Red Eval, I think you'll be shocked. It's handheld. I mean, it's tiny. Um, so the, the way things have, have progressed is kind of remarkable. Um, also note that they have a BOGO uh, offer uh, on restocking of electrodes. And again, that'll make sense if you look at the Red Eval. It uses these electrodes uh, as consumables. So check it out. So Mackey Health, makers of supplements, and I know Steve would tell you if he were here that he, he uses them in his own office. Um, so they are also running a big special, and I'll have that up on the screen for you later today. Uh, typically, the specials that they have involve uh, when you buy a case of their product, um, they have volume discount pricing. Um, so check them out. Uh, Steve will tell us a little more about them later because he can actually give you real experience about his office and, and how he uses their products. Um, so Luno Technology, again, another uh, so-called tie-up. Um, I know, Paul, you were asking, what is this Luno and, and who are they and where are they? Um, so yeah. that's, that's a French name, right, I believe. And uh, I think it is. 
And they're actually, though, in, uh, in uh, Illinois. <laughs> so they, I believe they're in like, suburban Chicago. So, but they're a tie-up of a bunch of companies that we're all familiar with. I mean, you know, you look at some of those brands like Brio Edgers, right? You, th that was from your day, right? Brio sure, has been around a, 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 an incredible amount of time. And so they have, you know, things like Edgers, but also a, lo a lot of high-tech pro uh, products as well. Um, you know, and in fact, their, their auto refracting systems are really cool and can help with social distancing. We had a good interview with them at the last C Wire, but let me just explain what they have going on special wise. 0% APR financing uh, up to 60 months, and that's only valid through the end of July. You can look in their booth and see, you know, more about their technologies, but I can just sort of share with you on the screen. If you've never seen their stuff before, uh, they have digital refraction systems, and if you look, it's sort of tablet-based. So take, if you see on your screen, there's a tablet. Uh, so you can really distance yourself from patients if you need to, right? So this is social distancing in the extreme. You could probably do this from the other side of your office <laughs> if you really wanted no. to, um, because the tablet actually has the identical user interface, right? It has exactly what you need to do an exam. Um, so, uh, you know, they have other products, again, with 0% financing, like a wavefront lens analyzer, um, wavefront refraction system, uh, anterior segment analyzers, uh, the Nexi, which is a really cool camera if you've never seen it before. And this is a product that they acquired. Um, so this, this takes some amazing uh, pictures of the retina. And the device itself, it's hard to actually appreciate there. It's small. Um, so it's, it's very easy to place in your office and it looks high tech. It's a very impressive instrument. Um, so again, 0% financing on it. And even 0% financing on uh, a Brio Edgers. Um, so the Attitude Patternless Edging System. So 0% financing. So check it out. So Hog, uh, you know them as the, the makers of the Octopus, the, the perimeter. Um, and right now they have a $2,500 million rebate when you purchase an Octopus 600 Pro. Now that one expires really soon. That coupon expires on June 30th. Um, so if, you're, if you've been interested in, in purchasing a perimeter, this might be the time to jump on it. So go into their booth and learn more and contact Hog that way. If you want to contact any of these companies, go into their booth. They'll either have somebody there to chat with you live via text chat or uh, an email form where when you fill it out, they'll get back to you quickly uh, as they know you're from CE Wire and you want to take advantage of the specials. Neurovisual Medicine Institute. So uh, this is a, a place, it's a physical place that you can visit in uh, Southeast Michigan, right? Suburban Detroit, so go blue. Um, they are concerned with the identification and treatment of patients with binocular vision dysfunction. And they use fractional units of realigning prism. Now, the interesting thing about the Institute is when you go, they'll give you a crash course over a period of several days. So you go there and they teach you uh, all about how to, to diagnose and treat BVD, um, but also how to integrate it into your practice, right? Because this is obviously important from a practice management aspect. How do I actually do this uh, and you know, build it into my practice and actually make it profitable as well? And they'll show you entire systems about how to integrate it into your office, how to market it to your community and so forth. Um, the most important thing that I can tell you is that the Institute is up and running and accepting students. So even in this time of, of COVID, they're there and, and you can come, um, assuming you can get there, uh, and they, they can have you there safely uh, to learn these techniques. So NVM. Uh, Site Sciences, makers of tear care. And so this is a, uh, a, sy a system for treating my, my bone gland dysfunction. And let me, uh, I'm trying to think, did I actually pull this one up? Already? Uh, no, let's see. But I will do it for you. Okay. There we go. So Site Sciences makes several things, but most importantly to everyone who's watching right now, the tear care system. So what you're looking at right now is tear care. Uh, this is actually a really good shot of it, probably even better than on their main website. Um, it's about the size of a hockey puck, and if you remember the you know original systems for, for treating MGD with heat, they were big, um, very expensive, um, and, and somewhat cumbersome. This is the, the opposite. So you have this hockey puck sized thing with a timer on it and a way to adjust the heat, um, and then you have these, these probes that you, you attach to the lids. And let me actually give you a picture of that as well. And there we go. 
And so you can see how it works. So it's very simple to use. Uh, it's not painful at all. Patients actually seem to like it. I was talking to Sue Resnick about it before. Um, she says it's almost like a spa, a spa day for people. They just sit there. You attach these things to, to the lids. Um, and then you can express what comes out. So it's, it's a, a very simple system, easy to learn. And I guess the most important thing is it's cheap. Well, should I say inexpensive, relative to the initial system. So when, when these types of systems came out originally, they were easily over $100,000. Uh, and they were large. And you know, people were kind of concerned about trying to implement them because it was uh, you know, a challenge to meet the note on them. Uh, tier care itself is, is much more inexpensive. I want to say, I don't know the price off the top of my head, but I think it's around $10,000, give or take. Um, so almost an order of magnitude cheaper. So uh, for doctors who have always you know, thought they might want to, to try a product like this, this might be the time to do it. Um, and in fact, if you look at the news that they had, they just did a clinical trial where the endpoint was comparing tier care against uh, other competitive systems. And the endpoint was uh, they were looking for if it had equal efficacy, and it did in their trial, the so-called Olympia study. Uh, and this is new. This actually just came out in May. Um, so you're looking at a de device that showed equal efficacy but is a lot cheaper. So you may want to give it a shot. So that's, that is tear care. Uh, VTI Natural View, so they are makers of custom soft contact lenses and specifically custom soft uh, multifocal uh, contact lenses. And these lenses have been used extensively for myopia control, even though the company can't really say it because it's an off-label use, but I will say it. Uh, and it's a great lens. Steve actually used them in his practice as well. And when he gets back later, we'll talk to him about uh, why he chooses them um, to use them for my myopia control. So check them out. I know they have usually have deals running. I don't know off the top of my head what they are right now, though. But usually it's a price break, uh, depending on volume. Uh, Zeiss, so makers of instruments that everybody knows and loves. And so Zeiss has been a huge supporter of the conference, so we thank them for this. Uh, and they have actually been really at the forefront um, since this whole COVID thing happened. Um, they have really stepped up with their educational efforts uh, and trying to support clinicians. And uh, let's see if I can even pull this up. Um, what Zeiss did right out of the gate was they have these breath shields. So if you haven't gotten one yet, um, you can go to the Zeiss website and you can purchase a breath shield uh, for your slit lamp. Um, and this will work, it's a universal shield. It'll work with any slit lamp. Go there, they'll send it to you for free. Just put in your name and address and they'll send it out. They've, they've actually delivered thousands of these things already. So they were the first out of the gate doing stuff like this, but also putting on a lot of shows. Um, on, you know, these online productions, these webinars with educational material. Uh, we produced one for them back in March and literally we were able to throw the whole thing together in three weeks. Um, so it was a remarkable effort. They've been really responsive throughout this whole thing, so kudos to them. They're going to have a series of conferences in the fall as well, online conferences with you know, more education. I don't think any of it's going to be COPE approved. A lot of it's um, for OMDs, but ODs are certainly invited to attend as well because uh, obviously the material has a lot of crossover, so highly recommend going. Um, their events are always fun, and in fact, I think I'm going to be at a few of these online events as well, just doing this sort of exactly what we're doing right now. <laughs> um, so that, that should be interesting. I always love doing it when somebody else has to produce it because I have a lot less work to do. So kudos to Zeiss. And AB Max, so uh, you know this instrument for treating anterior blepharitis. Uh, this is the second generation device. The folks behind AB Max actually created the first generation device as well, which you may know under a different brand name. Uh, but, but you know, the, the people who made the AB Max hold the patents on this and they decided to come back and make a new generation device. Critical things to know about this one, um, it's, so first of all, it has different modes of operation, which uh, some people feel work better, but more importantly, it's a lot cheaper. The consumables are, I, I don't want to say 50% cheaper or even, even more than that. Um, so it, it's much lower cost to operate. And they're running specials right now. Um, where you can actually get the, the device itself. If you buy a certain number of procedure packs, those tips, they'll give you the, the device for nothing um, after a $350 deposit. So, uh, and you'll have no payments for 90 days. So uh, definitely if you, you know, thought you were interested in this, this would be a good time to check it out. They're also doing other things like certifying your staff and your doctors. So right now, obviously, travel is not really happening for most people. 
Uh, but they have educational efforts online via video conferencing, and you can train your staff that way on how the device works. And we were talking to Steve about this yesterday, how when he first got the device, he would be the one to use it. He'd keep his staff away from it. He was concerned, oh, you know, can I possibly trust them to use it? But over time, as he got more comfortable with it, he realized his staff members could actually do the procedure just as well as he could. Because um, it's, not, it's not hard to do at all. It's not painful. I've actually had it done to myself. Uh, it just tickles a little bit. It's not really painful at all. Uh, and patients seem to like it because they can see the results of it immediately. The before and after is very dramatic when you use it. And they'll train you via Zoom and you can get this really cute looking certificate. <laughs> okay, so NeuroLens, uh, so they make a device that measures misalignment um, between the eyes and then from that, that device that you see there on the left side of the screen creates a prescription. Uh, it's a really cool device actually when you're, you're taking the test, you stick your head in and they show you planets and there's all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, to try to measure that, that misalignment. Um, but anyway, it spits out a prescription for you with um, where they create lenses that have a contoured prism. So uh, I actually have my neural lenses right here. So you can sort of get a sense of what these look like. Uh, my prescription, I just have nothing but the prism and I think there's a quarter diopter in here. It's just, I use them when I'm at the computer. Um, and I find it, it really helps relax my eyes uh, just having them and uh, you can actually, I don't know if you saw, just how thin the lenses are as well. Steve was saying that he has a prescription as well, his full prescription, and they're still very thin. The optics of these lenses are really good. Um, so anyway, uh, one thing that they're doing for folks here at the conference is no payments until January 1st, 2020, uh, if you purchase uh, the device at MSRP. Um, so uh, it's a really interesting system, especially if you have patients who have sort of intractable headaches or other uh, symptoms of eye strain, you might, you know, want to give it a shot. It's unfortunate, you know, one of the interesting things about C-Wire is that we can't actually use the, the instruments. I'm, I, I know that we do a lot of stuff here, Paul, online, but I'm still a big proponent of in-person conferences whenever we can get to them. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we can't have you play with the NeuroLens device, tragically, um, because it is a really interesting instrument, uh, and it's something that patients find very impressive, too. But take my word for it. Uh, it's an interesting device and uh, no payments until January 1st, 2020. So Oculus, you know them as maker of many instruments that you use. Uh, they have an offer of flexible financing options with no payments for six months and you choose the installation date and receive 2.9% financing for 48 months on their instruments. Um, they also have refurbished units for sale. And I mentioned it numerous times, but I have to say it again. Oculus is a German company uh, you, you know, when you look at their website, it's actually got this big impressive facility that they have, so it looks kind of imposing, and you think, oh gosh, is this company going to be difficult to deal with here in the States? But the reality is they, Oculus USA is a small company. They're out, out here near me in Washington State, um, not even in Seattle, actually, way out in, out in the sticks, right? So it's a small, a small company here and very easy to deal with. When you work with Oculus, in fact, you a lot of times can work right with the, the CEO of the Oculus USA. You know, he's very hands-on and um, works with doctors who use the products to make them better. Uh, my own doctor here, Charlie McBride, uses a Pentacam to create scleral lenses. And I know he's constantly in contact with the folks at Oculus, giving them input into the software to try to make it better. And they, they roll a lot of his advice, you know, back out into the software. Um, so it's a very sort of small interactive company and great to work with. Um, and they have refurbished units for sale, and I'm gonna guess they refurbished them right out here uh, in suburban Seattle. Um, so check them out as well. If you've been interested in something like a Pentacam, but perhaps didn't want to spend full price on it, this is a great way to sort of get your foot in the door with it. So science-based health makers of the Hydro Eye Supplement. Um, so again, this is a, a nutritional supplement for dry eye. The cool part about them is that they really do let the science guide the way their supplements are made and they constantly keep up to date with the latest studies. If you go to their booth or even more importantly go to their website, they have tons of information about different studies uh, and how they relate to their supplements and, and how they uh, manufacture them. Uh, so go check them out. We did an interview with Zach Denning uh, at Science Based Health all about you know, why they make the products the way they do and why they you know, put certain ingredients in. It was just you know, really fascinating. Um, if you ever have any questions about supplements, he's the guy to ask, for sure, uh, because he's forgotten more than most of, of us will ever know about it. 
Covalent Careers, so this is the largest site in, in iCare for jobs. Uh, so if you're looking to find a job or if you need to hire somebody in, they are the ones to call and uh, they have a discount. If you're looking to post a job, um, if you go to odyr.org slash jobs, you can get 10% off a job posting. And I can probably do that right now. I should remember how to get back to our own site after all. So see the link right there, jobs? Click. And you can see that they have a whole bunch listed. Now when you list with them, <laughs> 770. So when you list with them, the critical thing to remember is that you're not just listing at one site. When you give them a job listing, they syndicate it. So right now, you can see I'm on ODWire. That's where this list was syndicated. But this same list will be syndicated in a huge number of other places uh, that face eye care professionals. So it's a great deal to post there because you know that the audience is going to be big and across numerous sites. You're not just posting it into one silo. It's going to multiple places. So anyway, yeah, if you're interested in posting, you just click right there and you'll get 10% off. I care live, so makers of uh, telehealth solutions. Uh, so obviously with social distancing and practices being closed and so on and so forth, uh, having some sort of a remote solution has become incredibly important. Uh, some people like to use things like Zoom, which are very sort of unstructured, just video chat or Skype, you know. These are good stopgap solutions possibly, but for the long haul, what you want in your office is a tool that's structured, that captures the entire interaction, and more importantly, that you can use as evidence when you're submitting an insurance claim and the insurer comes back to you and asks, well, how do I know that you actually did all these parts of the exam? Well, a tool like iCare Live, which isn't just video chat, it captures all of this, these interactions. So you have evidence that you've actually performed these services, which is incredibly important, right, when you're dealing with third parties. Um, and it's also important for your own record keeping, right? It can help you keep everything straight. So check out iCare Live and all the different features of their platform uh, because you might find that it's, it's worthwhile, especially if you're starting to do a lot of telemedicine or telehealth. And I have a feeling, you know, this is not going to shrink in the future. This is only going to get bigger. Um, so you're eventually going to be using one platform or another, and this might be one you want to check out. iCare Pro, if you have a website or social media presence, and basically everyone does, you might want to go with them to handle uh, or to basically let them run the whole thing for you. You're outsourcing it to them. They focus on iCare exclusively, so they know what works for iCare practices and what doesn't because they've done it hundreds of times. Um, so again, instead of you taking a shot in the dark and maybe knowing what will work and what won't, they kind of already do because they have the data. So you might want to let them run it for you uh, and you know you can focus on more important things in your practice. Black Rivera, makers of punctal plugs, they have a huge number of discounts at the show. Go into their booth to see their laundry list of what they have going on um, because it's literally too, too numerous to mention here. This is a PDF that's just a a gigantic list. So thank you to them for sponsoring the conference. We have a talk today actually late in the afternoon about punctal plugs as well uh, if you want to show up for that. Um, you know if you've never fit a plug before or if, if you have in the past and have stopped doing it you might want to stop into that lecture and just see what the latest state of the art is. As Steve mentioned yesterday patient selection for plugs has become a lot better since our diagnostic tools have become better. Whereas in the old days, people would much more indiscriminately use them, and sometimes they would have success, and sometimes they wouldn't. Now we have a much greater understanding of which patients would benefit from plugs, and uh, so I think people are moving back to them again for those patients that can really benefit from them. So check it out. Optometry time, so practical chair-side advice. Gretchen, unfortunately, is not here today. Um, but what she would tell you is that they make a journal that has bite-sized, digestible chunks of information that you can read. As she likes to say, their journal is a magazine that you read and then throw out when you're done with it. It's not something that you're going to keep forever. It's something where you can get chunks of information, useful clinical information that's practical uh, and useful immediately. So that's, that's their shtick. They also have a, a good presence online. and. Gretchen really keeps them sort of updated constantly. And you can uh, see they have a bunch of videos that they're doing now as well. And again, these bite-sized chunks are all here online as well. And, and I, don't, I, I wish you were here because I wanted to ask her. I have a feeling that a lot of their volume these days in terms of how they're being read is going online. That you know, paper, I'm, I'm not so sure um, how many people actually read it in paper versus do it online these days. 
Paul, you'd probably still read it on paper, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a paper guy, but, but for most of us now, digital is really the way. And uh, you can see that they have a pretty, pretty robust website here, a lot of interesting content on it that doesn't take forever to read. And that, that's the critical thing. <laughs> And finally, Vision Equipment uh, Inc. This is Leo Hadley's company with refurbished equipment. And again, he's got you know equipment that's literally you know almost brand new from practices that might have gone under recently. Um, sad to say, right? We have a lot of offices who, you know, they they really kit out their office with incredibly expensive equipment, and then unfortunately can't make the note on it. And that's where Leo gets a lot of his equipment from. Um, he takes the equipment in, he refurbishes it, and then he backs everything that he sells. Leo also has a wide array of older equipment as well. And if, you, if we ever get to go to a trade show again, you know, knock wood, um, it's really fun to see his uh, displays a lot of the time because you'll see some classic equipment that he's refurbished that looks like new, even though you know it's not. Because um, you can tell this by looking at it, you know, it looks like it's been in a time capsule. Uh, but a lot of what he has is actually nearly new. Um, and he refurbishes it, everything that he sells to like new standards before he sends it out again. So if you're looking to equip, you know, a, a second or third lane, or, or you're just getting started and want to do it in a, in a much more inexpensive way, this is a, a great option. Uh, you know, Leo has been, we've been working with him, I guess, for over a decade now. And, you know, we've never actually had anyone complain about the equipment that he sold them, which to me is remarkable. Uh, and it tells me that he's actually doing a good job of, of refurbishing it and making sure that it's good before it leaves uh, his facility. So that's Vision Equipment, so check them out. All right. Yeah, so, but what's you. also important is to understand that these uh, vendors are getting very anxious. There's a good <laughs> chance that uh, <laughs> the rest of the uh, uh, shows are, are not going to be uh, live and they won't be able to exhibit. Yep. And they have a lot of equipment and they want to negotiate. So go visit them, talk to them. You may be able to come up with uh, deals that are as good or better than at Vision Expo. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Because you're right. I know that there are, still, there are still several shows that are planned to be physical shows in the fall. <clears throat> but I just kind of wonder if that's even going to be a thing. I don't know. Yep. For sure. So, yeah. Uh, so, so take advantage of, of uh, them being here and, and talk to them. Yeah, definitely take advantage. I mean, you know, they they have equipment they want to sell, and if you need, you know, anything, this is this is the time to do it. Um, isn't that always funny? It's like the, the the best time to buy something is always the the you know feels like the worst time, right? That's <laughs> what they always say, sure. right? Buy you stocks, know. buy stocks when the world's falling apart, right? Um, yeah, I mean, with the stock market, you always want to buy low, yep. and then uh, when, when, when it's available, so go for it. Yep. So definitely check them out. All these companies are really great to work with, and uh, you know, I'm sure I'm sure they're willing to deal at this point. All right. So right now it is what time is it? Eight. 8:36 Pacific time or 11:36 Eastern time. Right. So what I'd like to do then now uh, is maybe we can we can show off. Why don't we? We'll start a little bit slow today, showing these videos. Um, I would like to show the Clark Chang video from yesterday, the surgical one. Uh, I don't know, Paul, if you sat through it or not. Um, no. So <laughs> I, I know surgical topics are something that we don't cover a lot, but it's it's a really useful one. So so Clark obviously is an OD, and he works with the MDs at Wills. And uh, this is a, a lecture that he did with one of the surgeons here at CE Wire, but I'd like to show it to everyone so they can get a sense of what the content in the conference actually is all about. Um, you know, if you've never attended a CE Wire before but you're watching me, this lecture is very typical of the kind of things that you'll see here, where we want ODs and OMDs collaborating with each other and, you know, so we can all learn stuff. So why don't we show this one and then we'll come back in a little bit and uh, and then we'll talk some more. Steve hopefully will be back after his course. I'm curious as to how it went and uh, we'll see you guys then. Okay, how, how long is the time on this one? That's a really great question. Well, so since it is a COPE approved lecture and it's probably about an hour, I would say. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you in 50 minutes or more. All right. About an hour. All right.
Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Clark Chang. I'm the director of specialty contact lens at cornea service in Will's Eye Hospital. I'm here accompanied by one of my go-to cornea guru, Biran McPara. Uh, he is our co-director of refractive surgery uh, in cornea service at Will's Eye Hospital. Today, we're going to be talking about soup to nuts of the uh, modern corneal transplants. Here are our uh, disclosure for code purposes, as you can see nothing really relevant here and um, so you know the we are very accustomed to obviously co-managing um, patients with surgeons after corneal transplant but in the recent years there has been a clinical trend moving from uh, away a little bit more from uh, your full thickness penetrating keratoplasty to more disease specific and layer specific transplants such as your DALC, your DSEC, your DMAC, and what are the differences, what does all these alphabet, uh, alphabet soup means, and today we're going to give you a clarification uh, and hopefully for those who already know what these are, we'll get, be able to provide some uh, clinical pearls to you in terms of um, post-operative management and co-management and what to look out for. Um, so let's start off with uh, the penetrating keratoplasty. Obviously, it's not going away. It continues to improve. Uh, and patients are, you know, we have, we'll talk a little bit later about the fact that advancement of contact lenses have also helped us in deferring uh, the need for such procedures, as well as helping patients getting better visual outcomes after surgery. So I certainly see our contact lens technology and our ability to fit our fit patients in contact lenses as very synergistic to uh, surgical co-management. And as you will or um, are familiar, the indication of corneal transplant or your uh, full thickness penetrating keratoplasty is... Um, Obviously, keratoconus is uh, top of our, uh, our list within U.S. Uh, fail graft, corneal scarf of uh, different etiology, stromal dystrophy, corneal edema um, from, uh, from endothelial uh, etiology such as your fuchs and PBK uh, or pseudophagic uh, bullous keratopathy. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what um, endothelial corneal uh, keratoplasty is like later on, uh, congenital opacities as well as for therapeutic purposes uh, such as in cases of uncontrolled infection and potential risk of perforation. Uh, Prognosis-wise, obviously this is where I think we can play a big part in controlling patients' uh, condition or at least they dictate their, the timing of their referral, right? So if a uh, you know, if we could instill in our patients good contact lens hygiene and compliance to what we prescribe them, then hopefully, if should they need a corneal transplant, they would be have very minimum to no vascularization or chronic inflammation uh, to the eye and certainly to the cornea. Uh, obviously, the, the pathology is more central rather than very peripheral uh, or near limbus. They have better uh, prognosis. Keratoconus is likely one of the um, uh, you know, the one of those conditions that has the best outcome after penetrating keratoplasty. And so again, combining with the advancement in contact lens uh, technology is really good news for our keratoconus patients. Um, and obviously, again, le less favorable or more poor prognosis, those with uncontrolled ocular surface diseases. So ocular surface optimization is very important prior to referring patients to um, surgeons like Biren to uh, uh, to discuss corneal transplant and, uh, and hopefully again, Again, no uh, uncontrolled inflammation and vascularization to their cornea. Uh, infancy, it's an interesting one because a lot of times to me, uh, and Biran, I want to ask for your opinion, if you have a congenital uh, opacity, assuming that whatever underlying uh, condition is as controlled as possible, uh, at what age would you consider performing a corneal transplant for somebody so young? Yeah, it, it varies depending on the indication. So for example, I would say the most extreme example is a patient with Peter's anomaly. You know, Peter's anomaly is present at birth and these patients, if it's bad enough, if it's obscuring the entire, entire central visual axis, they have no vision in that eye. And in order to prevent the development of amblyopia, we're, we're on the clock here and we're talking within the first few months of life. Are, are we doing transplants? And, and, and the reason the prognosis is poor um, in infants and, and, in, and, and in very young patients is, one, the indication. So the indication 
Um, for example, like Peter's in and of itself has a poor prognosis, but then two, the fact that, that the patient is a child or a baby. So one problem with that is, is they're very difficult to examine. Okay. So things that I could easily pick up on an adult patient, I may not be able to see subtle issues that are creeping in until they become big issues. Um, they need a lot of follow-up visits. So, you know, they need 120% commitment from the parents. Um, the, the patients are dependent on the parents to bring them to their appointments, to put the drops in the eye. Um, you know, you can't get hit in the eye when you have a corneal transplant. Well, right. kids are doing crazy things all the time. Babies are all over the place. And then and, and the patients have to be hypervigilant. And then when things do go wrong in children, like, you know, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but let's say rejection. Rejection in an adult can oftentimes be stopped with treatment. Rejection in a child, once you get that, you know, boulder going down the hill, it, it is tough to stop and it, and it goes quickly. So there, there's a lot of reasons why the prognosis is not great um, for for any indication in, in infants. Yeah, that robust immune system is, is tough to suppress. Um, so this will be very similar to even after such uh, procedure in a young uh, patient or infant, even if we have to move towards uh, fitting pediatric contact lenses um, when we're co-managing, uh, you know, with uh, with surgeons like yourself, uh, we a lot of times also same thing have to recruit or solicit the help from parents in terms yeah. of insertion, removal, and lens handling and caring. So certainly, you know, there's a lot of parallels here uh, in terms of treating these patients. Um, can you talk to uh, us a little bit about how the procedure is done and what your preferred protocols are? Right. So this is a full thickness corneal transplant, right? So it's a penetrating keratoplasty. So essentially, what's going to happen is a portion of the patient's cornea is removed and we put a new one on and suture it into place. So as far as, you know, the, the basics of it, this is pretty simple, right? We take a cornea off, we put a new one on. It, it's not that tough. But, um, you know, the, there are uh, um, issues that can come up. So the most crucial part of this case is what we call open sky time. It's right when I remove the cornea before I get the new one on um, secured completely, or, or at least adequately. And this is kind of the danger zone of the surgery. And this is where we have the risk of expulsing intraocular contents. Whereas, you know, if it's the iris coming out of the eye, or the crystalline lens, or the IOL coming out of the eye, um, the vitreous coming out of the eye, or the most dreaded complication, a supracroidal hemorrhage, where all of the contents of the eye come out. Um, and this, and if it were going to happen, it would happen during that open sky time. So one of the big things that we focus on with penetrating keratoplasty is to optimize the eye ahead of time. So what does that mean? We want to soften the eye. We want to decrease the posterior pressure. So we will have our anesthesiologist give mannitol um, prior to opening the eye. What mannitol does is it dehydrates the vitreous. It reduces posterior pressure and tries to keep things from coming forward. Another thing that we do is, is we like to shrink the pupil using pilocarpine. Um, by doing so, again, we're trying to sequester the posterior segment, segment contacts posteriorly. Um, and it, it's not that pilocarpine is going to stop a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, but maybe it'll prevent um, the crystalline lens or the IOL from prolapsing out of the eye. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we do is we, we uh, support the sclera and if you imagine that, you know, you, you take off the cornea, the contents of, of the eye or the wall of the eye can kind of collapse in on itself. And we can put a metal ring on the eye, and I'll show you a video of this in just a minute, called a flinneringa ring to kind of support the structure and prevent the eye from collapsing. So once you have the eye optimized, then you got to look at the eye and decide, you know, how big of a, of a graft you want to do. And we'll show you some different examples of that. But basically, it's based on the size of the pathology. Then, again, we'll cut the cornea, remove the diseased cornea, and then place a new cornea on there, and then suture it into place. And typically, we use 10-0 nylon sutures, and different surgeons like to use different suture patterns. Um, there's interrupted sutures, running sutures, a double running suture, or some sort of combination. 
And in terms of these different suturing technique um, techniques that you uh, use, Bjorn, do you can you explain the different purposes of, of uh, different type of sutures and what's your preferred type of suturing techniques to use? Sure. So an interrupted suture pattern is you place usually you know 16 to 24 individual sutures to secure that cornea into place, and that can be kind of a longer, drawn out, maybe more tedious process. The more sutures you put in, the longer it takes. Um, the flip side to that is to put what's called a running suture. So that's just one single suture that you kind of weave in and out um, 360 degrees, securing it into place. So the advantage to that is it is generally a quicker procedure. Now, what's the disadvantage? So sometimes sutures break. Sometimes they can get infected, sometimes they loosen. If you only have one suture there, you better hope that's a good suture. Uh, because if anything goes wrong with that suture, that wound um, could be in peril. Whereas if you have 16 sutures or, or 24 sutures, if one or two or you know, a few of them you know, need to be removed, then, then you're not in as, uh, in, in as much of a perilous situation as you would be if you had just a single running. Um, the other advantage is what, what's called selective suture removal. So when it's time to remove sutures, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, we can remove one here, one there, um, to, to essentially neutralize astigmatism based on topography. Um, and sometimes these sutures can, can kind of help us. So it's called selective suture removal, and that's possible with interrupted sutures. And before we get into the great video that you're going to show us, um, one more question about the po decreasing the posterior pressure. Uh, after the administration of mannitol in the OR, do you have a specific range of pressure that you are targeting? Do you measure that, or do you kind of feel the globe and then say this is soft enough? That's a good question. So I actually... I don't measure it. Essentially, it's about timing. So mannitol generally takes its peak effect 10 minutes in. So basically, I'll just reverse time it. I'll anticipate when is that eye going to be open. And 10 minutes prior to that, I will have the anesthesiologist go ahead and push um, the dose of mannitol that I want. Um, so it's, it's purely a timing issue. That's great. Good to know. Let's take a look at the surgical video that you have prepared for us. All right, so this is a patient um, with keratoconus, had an episode of acute high drops. We let that high drops heal, and then that patient developed a visually significant scar where the vision could not be improved with the contact lens. So a couple pearls before we even get started with the surgery. Number one, when a patient has acute high drops, we do not intervene acutely from a surgical standpoint. You want that edema to go away. Um, one, because it's very difficult to, to suture into an edematous cornea. The wound just isn't um, that strong. And then two, a lot of times you may not need a transplant. Sometimes as the edema resolves, you'd be surprised, and then you've seen this, I'm sure, that you know the cornea actually flattens out a little bit. The patients can see around or through the scar. You put a contact lens on them, and actually they do quite well, and we save them a corneal transplant. So that brings me to my second point is I don't do a corneal transplant unless the patient either A, doesn't see well in a contact lens, or B, um, cannot tolerate a contact lens in the eye. So, you know, this patient um, kind of met those criteria, um, and, and here I am suturing that fluoringa ring. That's that metal ring that um, we basically suture onto the sclera, and this ring will essentially provide support, prevent that sclera from collapsing in as we open the eye. So now I'm using calipers to measure the size of the pathology. It looks like this is about, you know, eight millimeters. Um, so that's the size of the cornea that we'll put on. We'll mark the center of the cornea, and this is an RK marker. This is purely meant to help with suture alignment. And now we're putting a tree fine on the cornea. This is a circular blade that will create a very precise um, incision in the cornea. Sometimes we go all the way through, as you saw there with a the gush of fluid, uh, and then we'll just use scissors to completely remove that. So now this is that open sky time that I was telling you about. This is the most crucial time of the surgery. We want to get the new cornea on there that's already been pre-prepared and punched to the size that we want. Get it on there and get suturing as quick as we can. And, and once you have a few sutures on there, you can definitely breathe a little bit easier. And here, this is an interrupted suture pattern. 
where I play 16 interrupted sutures, and you're trying to place each of them at equal tension or as close as you can. No one's going to be perfect. There's going to be a little bit of, you know, inequality as far as tension distribution between the sutures, but you want to try to get those as equal as possible. And the goal of that is to try to reduce the astigmatism that you're inducing. Um, and, and, you know, that's a fairly straightforward case um, of, of post high drop scarring for keratoconus. Probably uh, the most common reason nowadays that we're doing penetrating keratoplasty. So here we have another video. So this is a little bit different case. This is someone that had a contact lens related ulcer. Uh, actually, this one's acanthamoeba um, that was quite severe and unfortunately uh, the cornea melted. So this patient actually has a fairly large hole in the cornea or a full thickness perforation and, and you can kind of appreciate that at the top of that photograph where you can see the iris a little bit more clearly as opposed to the rest of the picture. Well the reason you can see the iris so clearly is because there's a hole there. Um, so this patient needs um, more of a therapeutic corneal transplant to, to number one kind of save the eye. Um, not necessarily an optical transplant. The goal, at least for this surgery, is not to save this patient's vision, or, or, or I'm sorry, not to improve the patient's vision, but to, but to, but to save the eye. Um, so let's go ahead and get that video rolling. So this patient is going to require a pretty big transplant. So I'm measuring it out here, and this is going to end up being an 11 millimeter graft. So we don't have tree finds that are that big. So this is a handheld tree find. This is how uh, we used to do this, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and, and you just twist down and, and, and it, you don't go all the way through. You go as deep as you can. And then you use a blade to manually dissect all the way through the cornea and then use scissors. As, as you may notice, this is a little bit, um, bloodier of a surgery than the last one we showed you. And because this is infectious, the eyes inflamed, there's a lot of blood vessels that, that we're kind of cutting to, to get that cornea off. Now, we're, we're kind of, that cornea is kind of attached and, and scarred to the intraocular structure, so carefully I'm dissecting that away. It's stuck onto the iris. I'm hoping it's not stuck onto the crystalline lens, but after, you know, a, a little bit of patience, we, we get that off. And now we have kind of these fibrous inflammatory membranes that have grown on the iris surface, and, and here I'm carefully peeling it off. I'm taking it off the surface of the crystalline lens, being very careful not to, to disrupt the lens capsule and, 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 and kind of immediately create a cataract. So it looks like we've got everything cleaned up. Um, and, and now we'll put on this uh, donor cornea that is trephinated quite large. I think this is a 12 millimeter graft. You can even see that this donor, there's um, bits of sclera there that they were, they were actually suturing on as well. Um, and the concept here that once you get to this point is pretty much the same We're, you know, suturing the cornea here because it's a bigger graft. I actually use 24 sutures. So these are, this is 24 interrupted sutures. Um, again, the bigger the cornea, the more sutures you need to get this to hold in place. And the other reason I do so many is in really sick eyes like this, a lot of times these sutures, some of them get loose. So you want to have a few backups just in case if, 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 you know, three or four get loose, it's not the end of the world. You still have, you know, 20 more holding the cornea into place. So this is an example of, of more of a therapeutic graft, um, more of an eye saving procedure rather than a vision restoring procedure. And with a graft this size that this large, that is less common for us to have seen in the past, is there, does the proximity to proximity of the graft edge to basically the, you know, limbo vascular area, does that increase the chance of rejection? By a lot. Actually, there, there's a lot of problems when you do grafts this big. One, A, you're, you're so close to the limbal vasculature that you know, you're risking rejection right off the bat. But, but two, even worse than that is we've probably cut out the limbus. So this patient may not have any limbal stem cells and to get these corneas to epithelialize is very, very challenging to say the least. So these are cases that do not have good prognosis, but without surgery, the patient would have certainly lost the eye. 
So, you know, it, it's almost like a Hail Mary situation. We're going to do everything we can to try to, to, to save this. But, you know, there's a lot of counseling that goes in and a lot of informed consent that goes in beforehand kind of explaining to the patient that this this is not a great situation. And since the limbo area may, the integrity may be compromised, um, do you treat the patient any differently with your, you know, therapeutic treatment after the surgery to promote epithelial healing? Sometimes we'll, we have a low threshold to, to placing amniotic membrane, whether it's intraoperatively with sutured amniotic membrane or postoperatively with a self-retaining device, um, you know, Serum tears are sometimes helpful here. Um, sometimes, you know, we just hope for the, the tissue to conjunctivalize. So, you know, sometimes I don't even care if I have whole healthy corneal epithelium there. I just want something to grow over there to, to maintain the integrity of the eye. And then down the road, if I want to, if, if everything looks okay and we're going to attempt a second surgery, an optical transplant, maybe we can combine that with some sort of limbal stem cell procedure, or even do a keratoprosthesis where the patient doesn't need stem cells. Um, so really my goal here is just to get things stable, um, live to fight another day, basically. Ah, good to know. Let's move on to the next video then. All right, so this is a, this is a neat one. This is a patient that has a history of rheumatoid arthritis and has a very focal corneal perforation that you can see at the top portion of that cornea um, in, in, in the frame. And this patient had rheumatoid melt, had uh, the cornea thin and then eventually perforate, and, and now has a hole there. And there's a lot of ways we can manage holes in the cornea. If, if it's small, sometimes we can place um, some glue to, to kind of plug the hole. But this one's pretty big. Once you get over a millimeter or two, that's hard to glue. So sometimes what we'll do is what's called a corneal patch graft. Um, so... First thing we're doing is just kind of getting rid of um, some of the mucus and, and kind of measuring out how big the defect is. We've heaped up the corneal epithelium, and this is actually a, a, what's called a derm punch. This is what dermatologists use to do skin biopsies, but this is um, kind of a, a little three millimeter mini trephine. Um, so just gently back and forth, back and forth, kind of create a stencil that now I'm using a blade to kind of mechanically cut and, and remove that diseased portion of cornea. Um, and nice and easy here. So eventually we excise kind of that diseased cornea. Sometimes it comes out in, in little pieces, um, take chunks of it out here and there. And then once we have it all out, we put a tiny little corneal graft of the same size. So this is just a three millimeter graft and we're suturing it into place. And, and again, we'll use interrupted sutures here, but here we only need six. Or actually, here we did seven. Um, and I usually will do between five and seven um, in this situation. And essentially, we're just plugging the hole. Um, and, and eventually, you know, within, you know, six months or so, we'll start to remove these sutures. And, and you, you'll be surprised um, how astigmatically neutral this sort of surgery is. Um, and and it's, it's a nice little trick to, to use it if you have um, a perforation or a hole in the cornea that um, is, is too big to, to glue. Um, so now, as far as post-op care, you know, how do, I, how do I treat these patients afterwards? Well, um, they, they need steroids, and, and all patients need steroids after a transplant, and that is to prevent rejection. So I will start them on generally prenicillin acetate, uh, 1%, uh, four times a day for the first one to two months, and then Assuming things are healing up the way they should, I'll taper them uh, monthly, and then eventually I'll transition them to a, a lower uh, dose steroid like lodopredinol or fluoromethylone, usually with the, with the aim of keeping them on steroids long term, as long as the patient's interocular pressure can tolerate that. Um, for the first week or two, I do keep them on topical antibiotic drops. The key, though, is counseling after a full thickness transplant. These patients have to be counseled over and over again that they must, for the rest of their lives, avoid eye trauma at all costs. Blunt trauma to a eye that's had a full thickness corneal transplant can be devastating, even years afterwards. Um, and then the most important thing as far as the patient is concerned is how do we get them to see better and, and managing residual refractive error. So we talked a little bit about suture removal because all of us, even the best surgeons, are going to induce astigmatism with their sutures. Um, 
and we can remove sutures here and there, but we don't start that, um, at least in my hands, at least six months, if not nine months. So Clark, um, we're kind of doing something new here at Wills, and I want you to chime in a little bit about that and how we're getting our patients to, to see better. Absolutely. So, you know, we're used to obviously co-managing with surgeons, looking at topography, you know, and then it conventionally, right? And then deciding on selective suture removal to see how we can improve patients' uh, best corrective spectacle vision uh, and even their uncorrected vision. Um, but we all know that in <clears throat> a lot of cases and, you know, after penetrating corneal transplant, uh, certainly po also possibly after uh, DOLC that we're going to talk a little bit later, these anterior corneal contour changes that may also be associated or accompanied by residual refractive error. These patients, we know they can be managed really well uh, with additional contact lenses if, the, if they need to maximize their vision, right? Um, but you know, it used to be that we want to wait until the graph is, you know, really quiet and they're, you know, they, they've sort of after the critical period of, of worrying about rejection uh, and then, you know, finishing most of their medication prior to allowing patient to uh, to actually return to being able to fit in contact lenses. Well, we know that most of the time that's just not functional, right? That patients can don't have a year or two to put aside um, and then do nothing until their you know vision recovers. But that is what we used to tell patients to do. So we're taking more of a you know human approach, if you would, uh, with our patients here at Will's Eye, um, where we work with a patient, make sure they understand that they have to be extremely compliant with their postoperative uh, therapy therapeutic regimen so that we can get them to a stage hopefully earlier, potentially when they're down to maybe BID uh, with their topical steroid because I don't want them to have to work around, you know, removing the lens and potentially, and then, then instill the, um, their medication. And most patients don't really weigh enough time prior to then, you know, inserting contact lenses back on their eyes. However, that does shave off a lot of time for our patients. Uh, as long as their, their recovery is on par as planned, um, their graft is, you know, quiet. A lot of times we are able to get patients back to so at least starting the refitting process uh, for uh, contact lenses uh you know, two to three months after their initial procedure, um, because most of the time they're down to the BID uh, with most of their medications. Uh, and so to our patients, that is very good news for them. Um, however, you know, we obviously also remember one of my criteria is that their graph needs to be quiet and without complication. So let's take a look at the different type of complication that we may be able to expect. Um, after the after the surgeon, uh, such as Buren, sends patients back to us, and typically you Buren would send patients back to the co referral um, um, doctor typically at about after, what about a month visit. When do you usually send your patients back? Yeah, you know I think it varies from surgeon to surgeon. Um, my personal um, kind of regimen is is it about a month. We want to kind of be out of the danger zone for a lot of the complications. Um, and, and this is a little bit more um, relevant when it comes to endothelial keratoplasty, which we'll talk about. But but still, e even in the early post-op stage, you know, I definitely, I, I, I feel like I need to see the patient, you know, post-op day one, because early complications like a flat anterior chamber um, because of a wound leak or, or iris, iris prolapse, those, those need to be de dealt with surgically immediately. I mean, there's, there's no other way around that. That just needs to be fixed. Um, so I, you know, I, I definitely like to see patients then. And then I, I want to make sure that the epithelium is healed in, you know, sometimes these patients have persistent epithelial defects, um, that, that, you know, can last a week or two or, or maybe longer, depending on the reason they needed a transplant. So I want that to kind of be resolved. And then once we get to that stage, um, um, I, I'm, I'm happy sending it over to uh, my optometrist to, to co-manage it with me. And then some of these, you know, later complications that, you know, I'll have you go through, um, we can kind of work together to, to navigate through those if they come up. Absolutely. I'm especially, you know, like astigmatism, uh, you know, refractive rehabilitation really is what we can do best for our patients. Um, and 
obviously also looking out to make sure that we're measuring the we're monitoring for IOP to make sure that there's no uh, increased um, pressure spike and that there's no given the fact that some of these patients most of these patients by then would be uh, out of their um, antibi topical antibiotic or at least would not be using the atopical antibiotic. It's always important to look out for infect signs of infections. Um, and like, you know, their uh, CME, uh, macular edema, very like, much like cataract surgery, the inflammation, want to make sure that if their vision is changing, it's uh, run a topography. And then if there's an OCT, if we could do that, just to make sure that there's no retinal pathology that we are missing. And um, also obviously make sure there's no Seidel signs so that even though we don't want pressure to go up too high, we also don't want the pressure to go down too low, um, just to make sure that there's no de wound dehiscence and, that there, uh, and make sure that there's no fluid leaking out uh, of the wound. I do want beer in your opinion on, because a lot of people correlate graft failure and graft rejection with regard to time. Most people tend to think that early on, if you have a hazy graft, it's rejection, and then after many, many years, it's typically a failure, but that's not always true, is it? No, that that's definitely uh, not always true. And, and you you don't want to think of, first of all, graft failure and graft rejection um, are, they're, they're, they're not the same. They're, they're kind of individual entities. Um, and it's not necessarily time, but it's basically etiology. So both of these are implying a cornea that is no longer clear, okay? And rejection is an immunologic phenomenon. It's your own body attacking this donor cornea. Um, and, and rejection can, can manifest in, in a variety of ways. Um, that first picture top left is showing us kind of epithelial or subepithelial rejection where you get these subepithelial infiltrates. And then these look very similar to someone with EKC after a bad case of viral conjunctivitis. Um, this is the lesser um, common form of graft rejection, and it's also typically the least severe form of graft rejection. What we worry about most, though, is endothelial rejection. Um, this is more common and potentially is more detrimental to the graft. So what we're looking for are um, early signs of this, which would be keratic precipitates, which you see in the top right corner. And if the projection or if the rejection um, continues to progress, then we can see what's called a rejection line or a cotodose line. And that's depicted nicely in that bottom left picture, which is basically endothelial rejection marching along the cornea and leaving an edematous cornea in its wake. And, and oftentimes you, you have to look for anterior chamber cells and if the cornea, if the rejection goes uncontrolled and, and essentially all of the endothelium has been affected, then you would have a diffusely edematous uh, graft. Now, as far as treating this, um, it, it depends on, on what type of rejection that you have. So if you have, you know, mild subepithelial or, or epithelial rejection, typically what I do is I increase the patient's steroid dose to four times the current dose. So let's say they are down to one time a day on their Predforte. I will have them increase it to four times a day until this resolves and then gradually taper back down, um, back to, to maybe twice a day or maybe even go back to once a day again after a while. My preference also, if I may interject, is to, in case they are tapered down, patients are being tapered down to a softer steroid, for example, like an FML for whatever reason, um, I potentially like to put them back into a more potent steroid, like maybe a Durazole. Yeah, exactly. Just just increase that, that potency. And, and especially in the case of endothelial rejection. So this is a more severe form of rejection with KPs and edema like we showed there. And in this situation, you know, we, we break out the big guns. So we'll, we'll either do Predforte every hour or, or Durazole every two hours. Um, and then a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll hit them from all different angles. So, you know, sometimes I'll give subconjunctival steroids, whether it's dexamethasone or Kenalog. And sometimes I'll even put patients on to oral steroids because we're going to try to do everything we can to save this graft because if we don't and, and the cornea becomes edematous, well, then that is a form of graft failure. So you see the two do kind of overlap. So rejection can lead to failure. Um, we call that secondary failure, and that can be late failure of a graft. So that's one reason a graft can fail. The second reason a graft can fail is just attrition. 
okay? Not necessarily a rejection, but we do know endothelial cells diminish over the course of time. And we always tell our patients that, you know, these transplants are meant to last forever. Maybe they have a 20-year shelf life, maybe more, maybe less. Um, you know, here at Wills, uh, we had a very famous corneal surgeon by the name of Peter Labson who started the cornea service here decades ago. And I'm still seeing transplants of his that he did 40 years ago. Um, they look beautiful. They look crystal clear. So, you know, it, it, that goes to show you sometimes they can last a while. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, they don't. And then you just don't have enough endothelial cells and, and the cornea fails. That's, that's kind of late failure. You can have early failure too. Um, and that's usually something related to the cornea itself. It just wasn't a good cornea or um, some sort of issue during the surgery. And, and in, in, in early failure, what happens is the cornea never clears. So oftentimes what you'll see after a transplant is, is the cornea, it's hazy. It's not crystal clear from day one. It's hazy. But over the course of a few weeks, it clears up to look quite nicely. But if a cornea doesn't clear, then we would call that primary graft failure. So failure doesn't necessarily mean rejection. Rejection is an immune attack on the cornea. Failure is just the cornea not being clear. And that can be for a variety of reasons that happen early on or much, much later in the course of the patient's post-operative care. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And before we go to the next slide, are you more concerned about, given the fact that we're moder monitoring IOP um, and you know, uh, significant rise in IOP is also not good for the health of the graph, are you a little bit more concerned about uh, potentially pushing up the IOP with subconjunctival depot or steroid versus oral steroid? Um, you know what? If, if the IOP goes up, um, I, I, I feel like, you know, we can treat that with drops usually, okay? If, you know, sometimes it becomes way out of control, but, but even if it's subconjunctival, you can cut out that depot of steroids and, and, and eliminate that. But if the cornea fails, that's it. The patient needs another surgery. So, you know, yeah, of course, I, I definitely get those concerns, but sometimes you just have to do a risk-benefit analysis and then decide what's best. Perfect. And we know that obviously, you know, luckily keratoconus is one that um, we do the most commonly with penetrating uh, keratoplasty. It also is one that has the highest amount of the best outcome and the best prognosis. Uh, Fuchs dystrophy, something that we see very often, also has very good outcome. And if you go down the list, your pemphigoid patient really has the worst. Can you tell us a little bit about why these pemphigoid patients have such poor prognoses? Yeah, you know, you're exactly pemphigoid patients. Patients do not do well with, with transplants, and that's for a lot of reasons. One, it's an inflammatory condition. These eyes are very inflamed. Often there's neovascularization everywhere. So the risk of rejection right there goes up. Number two, these patients have um, a very poor ocular surface. You know, they have almost a complete aqueous tear deficiency. Their meibomian glands are, are very abnormal. So you know, they have a very high risk of that corneal epithelium on the graft breaking down. And then three, they have abnormal ocular adnexa. There's symblepharon, scarring, trachiasis. All of these are very bad prognostic factors for a corneal transplant. And now these pemphigoid patients have all, the, all three of these. So it's the trifecta. And then the success rate is, is very, very low, unfortunately. Good to know. Um, and so obviously we're very familiar with the strength and weakness of penetrating corneoplasty. It's a, you know, from the surgeon's point of view, it's a more straightforward surgery, a little bit less time consuming compared to the other more complicated techniques that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but it does remove all, all tissues, sometimes even healthy tissues. And that could be a weakness of doing a uh, penetrating corneal transplant. Plus, Biren had discussed about the, the, um, the, uh, the danger involved with the, um, no matter how brief it is, with the open sky time. And so that obviously then, if you're looking at other surgical technique, you kind of, you are able to bypass that. Um, so, and such, one such technique would be your, uh, your dulk or your deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, I've often thought that this can, you know, with, luckily with the contact lens advancement now, you know, patients, especially keratoconus patients are getting very good outcome. 
But even prior to that, I thought, you know, the anterior keratoplasty, such as DULC, is really underutilized for a lot of patients. But obviously, it's not easy to perform, and you, you know, sometimes may not be able to uh, really, re you know, remove down as deep as you want, and you could have issue with interface haze um, that may take a long time to go away, and patient may be on steroids be if they have interface interface haze uh, between the graft, the anterior graft, and the um, or the uh, and the donor tissue, they may have to stay on steroid for a lot longer than you initially expected. Um, but we less we worry less about rejection because you, the risk there's no risk of endothelial rejection still with other layers but not with endothelium. Uh, and again, it's not an intraocular surgery in that there's no open sky time. I like to I have Beer and Rage through one of the videos for us that is combining cataract surgery with DULC. Yeah, so here's a patient of mine that had um, you know keratoconus and a visually significant cataract. Um, unfortunately couldn't tolerate a contact lens and without contact lenses um, had very poor vision so we decided to do surgery here um, you know I won't show the cataract portion of the case this was pretty much standard fake emulsification so that that's completed right there so now we're going to do the dulk and, and we start out the same way so we, we take our tree fine and, and we trephinate Partial thickness, it's very key to be partial thickness because, again, we do not want to perforate decimase membrane and the endothelium at any point during the case. This is not an interocular procedure. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to separate decimase membrane from the overlying stroma. And the way we do that nowadays is with air. It's called the big bubble technique. Um, you get a much cleaner interface, and essentially what we're doing is we're putting in a cannula and injecting air, as you'll see right here in just a second. And what this air is going to do is take the path of least resistance, which is between the stroma and decimase membrane, and, and essentially cleave that layer. Um, so now very carefully, we're going to remove overlying stroma. And you can tell that decimase membrane has been ruptured because we have air bubbles inside the eye. And the air bubbles are not coming out. So. Um, essentially what we'll do then is take a donor cornea where decimase membrane and endothelium have been removed and suture it into place. And the suture pattern is very similar to um, penetrating keratoplasty. I use 16 sutures. We still have kind of the same issues with suture removal and titrating suture tension and induced astigmatism. Um, but like uh, Clark mentioned, the, the, the main benefit to doing this sort of surgery is there is one no open sky time so there's no chance for open sky complications and two the patient keeps their own endothelium so there's no risk of endothelial rejection um, and these patients are often younger patients um, you know for example keratoconus and it's nice to, to let them keep their endothelium for the rest of their lives absolutely and so another type of uh, a sort of layered keratoplasty technique has to do with the the newer the trend of moving into your DSEC and DMAC, and as most people, as um, most of us know, that is your endothelial graft. And so the indication would obviously be for people with posterior corneal pathology, such as listed here in the slide. And again, the advantage, no open sky, because it's layer specific, so it's not full thickness penetrating. So you have stronger wound, and obviously slightly less risk of a rejection, because although you could have endothelial rejection, but not from other layers. Uh, again, it's technically a little bit more challenging than doing a full thickness, uh, but you do have the uh, advantage, like I said before, with no open sky time, so a little safer for patients, no communication between internal and external environment. Um, there may be the concern of uh, pupillary block, and so in patient need to lay flat uh, or stay in a supine position post-op for a period of time, a little bit longer for DMAC, a little bit shorter for DSEC. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, patient selection using those criteria that I just mentioned. Basically, for me, the, the difference between DSEC and DMEC graft is that DSEC, as you can see, has a red line here. So DSEC graft contains some um, stroma tissue from your donor, whereas DMAC is thinner and it doesn't have um, stroma tissue from the donor. So you have better vision and, and uh, reduced refractive shift, meaning they have better visual outcome and a quicker recovery, but they do have to stay in that supine position for a longer period of time. Um, so that's something that we uh, will have to consider when selecting patients. Biren, can you tell us a little bit about your patient criteria, selection criteria? 
Yeah, so at, at this point, the way I kind of decide what patient should get a DSEC and what patient should get a DMEC is anyone who is a good DMEC candidate should get a DMEC. Um, just because I feel like with true layer for layer replacement of the cornea, it's all of those things that you mentioned, you know, quicker visual recovery, less risk of rejection, better quality vision. Um, so if anyone, in my opinion, that can get a DMEC should get a DMEC. Um, so who is not a good candidate for DMEC? Who really shouldn't get one and who is better off with the DSEC? So there's a few groups of patients here. One would be a patient with a tube or a trabeculectomy. And, and kind of why, why, why is that the case? So DMEC, again, it's just SMA's membrane and endothelium. It's very flimsy. It's difficult to work with. And sometimes it's hard to get it to attach. That's the most difficult part of this surgery. That's the biggest challenge. And the way we get these grafts to attach is to put in a, a, a or at least me personally, put in a bubble of gas into the eye that's supposed to stay in the eye for, for five to seven days. When you have a tube or a trab in the eye, you have now um, um, basically a pathway um, for that gas or air to escape and leave the eye much more prematurely than you'd like. Um, the second group of patients that I don't like to do DMEC in is someone that's had a vitrectomy. And, and the reason for that is, and, and we'll show you videos of this in a, in a couple minutes here, is in order to get this DMEC graft to, to get into the right position, uh, we have to flatten the anterior chamber. And without vitreous behind the iris lens diaphragm pushing things forward, it's very difficult to get that chamber to flatten and in turn very difficult to get that DMEC scroll to, to open up. Um, the next couple are ACIOL, aphakic, it's, it's kind of referencing the unicameral eye. And, and it's all about trying to keep that air bubble or gas bubble in apposition to the cornea. When you don't have that lens is diaphragm there, the lens can, or I'm sorry, the air bubble can, can migrate posteriorly. Other reasons why, you know, if you have a very poor view and you can't see into the eye, it is technically more difficult to do DMEC. And if you can't see well enough, then maybe you shouldn't do it. These patients, like Clark mentioned, have to lay flat for five days. DSEC patients lay flat for about 24 to 48 hours. DMEC patients for five days, again, because it is more difficult to get that cornea to stick on. So if a patient can't do that or refuses to do that, then they're not a good candidate for DMEC. And then finally, if we can't rebubble them. These patients often need to be rebubbled in the office, meaning more air has to be put in or more gas has to be put in. And if, you know, you know, they, they can't do that, they can't position at the slit lamp or, or at the operating scope, then they may not be good DSEC candidates. Um, going back just one second. So who are good DMEC candidates? Again, anybody, but if you're learning how to do this, you know, um, for surgeons and, and, you know, briefly, you know, you want patients with light colored irises and then you ask why it's, it's easier to see inside of the eye against a light iris. Um, Fuchs patients are, are, are good, good patients, patients that are already pseudophagic. Um, and then patients um, that, that, you know, have an intact posterior capsule. And then there's a the question of premium IOLs. So what I mean by that is, let's say a patient had a multifocal lens put in a cataract surgery, and, and maybe the Fuchs dystrophy was missed, or maybe it got worse. Um, if you can truly replace that disease decimase with new decimase, um, that gives the patient the best chance of still seeing well with the DMEC, where if you had a DSEC and you had that kind of extra stroma there, sometimes the quality of vision or, or quality of the optics is degraded, and these patients may not do well with that premium lens, so they may need a lens exchange as well. So if we're trying to let our patients keep their premium lens, then, then I think DMEC, you, you should definitely try to do that. So let's talk a little bit about the surgeries. So as far as DSEC goes, you know, we, we went over this um, already, but basically we're going to remove decimase membrane and endothelium and insert a donor graft that has both decimase and endothelium, but also has a little bit of stroma. And that stroma is what allows that graft to, uh, to, to stick on a little bit easier. It just makes it easier to work with in the eye. Um, and then the, the chance of sticking on is better. Now, once you get it into the eye, you have to get it to stick on to the, the host stroma. So the way we do that is we use air. So we fill the anterior chamber with air, 
pushing that donor cornea up against the host cornea and basically surface tension takes over and as the endothelial pump starts to function um, that cornea sticks on. Patients lay flat for 24 to 48 hours. Like I said we do put air into the eye but you got to be careful not to put too much air in because too much air will lead to pupillary block. So here's an example of a DSEC. So here's a, this one um, is a little bit different because this patient had a DSEC already and that DSEC failed um, for unknown reasons. So this goes to show you that the, the surgery is repeatable. So here I am and I'm actually peeling away that DSEC, that old DSEC, and it comes off pretty easily. Um, and you can see it's swollen and edematous and that, that, that's a lot thicker then a DSEC graft should be, but that indicates that that graft has failed. Now once that graft has been completely freed up from the overlying stroma, we just go in with forceps and pull it out of the eye. Um, next we're preparing the donor graft. This has been pre-cut by the eye bank for us and we're separating that posterior stroma and decimase membrane from the overlying anterior stroma and loading it onto, uh, this is what's called a boost and glide. There are a lot of different ways to deliver the donor cornea in. I prefer to use this technique where I load it onto this glide, reach across the eye with forceps, and then pull it into the eye, making sure that the endothelium is directed uh, down or posteriorly. So it's pulled into the eye, and you can see right there that it kind of just opens up for us. Once we get it in position, we'll take a cannula of air, inflate the anterior chamber with air, Again, this tamponades that donor cornea up against the host, and here I'm just kind of nudging it into place. The wound has already been sealed at this point with three 10 nylon sutures. Um, and then prior to leaving the operating room, we'll, we'll release a little bit of air um, to, to, to prevent that patient from going into pupillary block. So that, that's a good example of DSEC. Now DMEC, um, like we talked about, is just, is again, removing decimase and endothelium but just replacing it with a graft of decimase and endothelium only. So again, donor, or I'm sorry, layer for layer replacement. There is no stroma. And when this goes in, it, it's not, it doesn't have as much substance. So what happens is the graft folds up and then, and then basically it's inserted into the eye. And what we have to do is we have to unfold it, position it. And then I like to use SF6 gas to tamponade this because SF6 gas lasts longer. That'll last about five to seven days, so we'll have our patients lay flat for five to seven days. Um, and um, the advantage of DMAC uh, versus disadvantage, I feel like, again, Bjorn had done such a good job at touching up on this, but uh, it's worth repeating that the difference is obviously with the newer DMAC technique, even though it's harder to, it's more complicated. Uh, it does offer patients faster visual recovery. Uh, remember, they do have to be flat on their back for a little bit longer because of the FS6 gas bubble. Um, but, you know, if they could, if they don't have back issues and neck issues, they could do that they, in return. They get better visual outcome quicker um, and also less rejection. Uh, refract, refractive outcome is better, so also less change in their refraction. Um, now, Bjorn, I do have a question for you. So, Number one, since these are specially prepared tissue uh, with both DMEC and DSEC, do, is your preference preparing yourself? Do you have the eye bank prepare for it? And since you, number two, you specifically mentioned about cell loss during surgery for DMEC, is there more of a concern about endothelial cell loss during DMEC versus DSEC? Yeah, so to your first question, you know, um, what's really been a game changer here in the United States is um, the eye bank's ability to prepare this tissue for us. Early on in the game, surgeons would have to essentially strip decimase membrane off the cornea themselves, um, and that resulted in a low um, adaptation rate um, and, and, and kind of increased surgical time and, and kind of wasted tissue. And now that the eye bank is doing that for us, the vast majority of U.S.-based surgeons get their tissue prepared and sent by the eye bank. Interesting enough, um, overseas, for example, in Europe, even some of the most famous DMEC surgeons, some of the pioneers of surgery, are, are still preparing the tissues themselves, probably because their eye banks haven't um, kind of um, adopted that yet, although um, we are seeing some commercial eye banks take business overseas. And, and, and my guess is, even in Europe, we'll be seeing you know, much more adaptation of, of eye bank prepared tissue. Now, as far as endothelial cell loss, 
and you'll see a photograph or you'll see this in the next video but you know it, sometimes uh, DMEX surgery it, it requires tapping and fluid waves and a lot of manipulation of the graft to get it to open up and get it in the right spot and sometimes all those maneuvers especially if if they're quite extensive can result in endothelial cell loss however once you get past that initial learning curve and you get efficient at this surgery um, a lot of times we can get these grafts to unfold within you know a minute or so with with minimal damage to the endothelium that's very interesting let's take a look at a couple of videos before we close this lecture then all right so this is DMEX surgery for Fuchs dystrophy so what we're doing here is we're we're stripping Decimase membrane this is an instrument called the reverse Sinsky hook and essentially what we're doing is uh, we're, we're breaking uh, attachments of Decimase membrane 360 degrees and then um, once that's done here what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially peel off this portion of Decimase membrane. Typically I like to remove the central 8 millimeters um, and that's because I like to use a graft that's 7.75 millimeters so we like to have a little gutter because what we don't want is um, overlap between host decimase and, and donor decimase because that does increase the risk of detachments in that area. So just kind of wrapping up, removing um, that you know disease uh, decimase membrane and endothelium. It's it's kind of being uh, um, bunched up in the center of the eye there. And here I'm going in with forceps and just removing that, and it comes out in a nice sheet as you see right there. Next. We're going to inject the, the pre-prepared eye bank donor tissue. You can see it's scrolled up. It's stained with the stain called Tripan Blue so that I can see. Otherwise, without that stain, it's impossible to see. It's a purely transparent, very thin piece of tissue. Um, and once it's into the eye, we, we start what's called the dance, the DMEC dance. And what that is, it's a series of taps and chamber modulation with fluid puffs to try to get this graft to open up. And that opened up quite nicely just using a puff of fluid. And you can see that S there. That S is put on there by the eye bank um, to tell us when the graft is in the proper configuration. The S means that the stromal side is up and the endothelial side is down. So we have it flattened out. Now I'll use a series of tapping techniques using fluid waves and flattening the chamber here and there to get that graft to flatten out and, and then use some tapping techniques to, to center it because you want it perfectly centered. Once I have it in a good spot, I go behind it, put in my cannula, and inject um, my 20% SF6 gas, tamponading that graft up against the donor corn or up against the host. And you know, we'll ask the patient to 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 lay flat for five days. Um, and at the end of which, you know, they come back to the office and hopefully with a with an attached, well-positioned cornea. Um, Here's just a really quick video. Clark, can you can you see if anything's wrong here? Does anything look abnormal there to you? Uh, you know what's interesting is you can see the um, the marking on the on the uh, on the graph here that you've uh, uh, believe you're demonstrating to us that which side is uh, yeah. So the S is down. it was upside down. So the S was was upside down. So I went in there with a the cannula of, of of fluid and just used a puff of fluid flip that graft over so now it's right side up now that s is in the correct configuration so you can see how valuable having that s is because without that it becomes very difficult to tell we're going to nudge that cornea into place put some gas underneath there and again we've got a well attached cornea now as far as complications go the biggest thing with dsec and dmec is is graft dislocation um, in a DSEC graft, as you'll see here, you'll often see that the graft has slipped, and then you'll see a cleft between the donor cornea and the host cornea. Um, and, and oftentimes these grafts have to be repositioned, and more air has to be placed into the eye. And when you look at a dislocation in a DMEC cornea, it's a little bit different. Um, you, because the graft is so thin, you don't really see... Um, the displacement of the graft. Basically what you'll see is patchy areas of corneal edema and it's those areas of patchy edema where the graft is focally detached. So often you don't see a full detachment, you just see partial detachments. And, and when you look at the slip beam, you can't even see, as you did in the DMEC, a cleft between the graft and the donor cornea. Essentially um, that, that donor cornea is, is, is invisible. And, and when it heals up, um, 
to the to the to the unsuspecting eye, sometimes you can't even see the graph there, which is the greatest thing about DMEC. Um, you know, these graphs can reject. The risk of rejection is lower with you know DMEC than it is with ESEC than it is with PK, and and you know we do have to be on the lookout for pupillary block. Um, so you know when we put air or gas in the eye, we just have to make sure that we have enough, um, but not too much where the pressure goes up in the eye. So in the interest of time, um, you know, I think we're going to end right there. Clark, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to give this talk. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. I can't believe we finished everything under the time limit. So hopefully we'll see you at our next lecture. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, and we are back. And let me uh, see if Steve and Dad are still around. Guys, are you there? I'm here. How you doing? Excellent. Good show. Back in the back in the saddle. Excellent. So yeah, so that was a really fun uh, presentation with uh, Clark and Biron, and uh, I think it shows sort of the breadth of what we're doing with CEY, right? So having the MD and OD. Uh, sort of coming together and uh, I really like this the back and forth that they had in that particular show yep so, so Steve how was your how was your course uh, speakers is excellent I mean I, I'm kidding uh, it went well <laughs> it's, um, uh, luckily uh, my subject um, is timely but has is not out of date even though it's a couple months old so um, uh, I, I think it's uh, done well, and I, I hopped into Mark Freeberg's second hour just to listen to it again, and um, just as good as always. So um, yeah, everything's working well. Um, sometimes we have problems with sound quality. That's not a problem. Speakers are there. Uh, and like we found last time, because the attendance is so high given the COVID virus and the amount of attendees we have, there's a lot of interaction. Mark said was, Mark Freeberg was inundated with uh, questions and really good questions, and I think the speakers like um, having people interact with them. So, um, done well. I had uh, some actually good compliments at the end of mine. Um, so, uh, compliments? That well, that's good. My topic is very great. It's hard to ask questions, but uh, I think they got the idea, and everybody wants um, uh, to be immortal and for me to develop some sort of way of uh, making telomerase uh, uh, not shorten our chromosomes. But that's, that's a subject for another day. Um, yep. How is the attendance? How, how many people in, in classes? In my room, there was about 180. And when I looked around, uh, Mark always has the most. Now it's in between, so there's um, about 540 people in the conference, but they'll go into the room. So 
Um, we last yesterday we had about 800, and today it looks like we'll get about the same more amount as the West Coast comes online. Yep. So um, That's right. I mean, lectures are. Uh, I've pretty much heard every single lecture, and there's not one uh, bad apple in the bunch. And I want to uh, listen to uh, Dr. Resnick and Dr. Houses um, to see uh, the new content. So. Um, yeah, it's it's funny when you hear yourself the third time. You, you actually you, you feel like you can sing it. You remember what you said uh, uh, specifically, um, and I, like we discussed. So if anybody's listening to this, uh, I'll, some of our lectures are great. Uh, there's a lecture by a PhD in um, biochemistry who's uh, doing a, on COVID, and it's a great lecture. But it's about a month or two um, overdue, and we're going to allow them to reprocess it and uh, make it more timely. So some things in the eye care field are, are so rapidly moving in this day and age that they want to um, update their uh, uh, lectures, even the ones that are going to be uh, shown again. So uh, for your audience, they, it, it's not going to be the same old stuff that's from a few months ago. If, if something needs to be updated, it will be, um, which is great. And the speakers want to do that, so it's no problem. Yep. All right. Are the, P, are the PhDs gentle? Are, are they talking? So ODs can understand them, or are they more yeah. more scientific, where it gets to be difficult to follow? He, he gets scientific in his slides, but presents it very well verbally so that people understand it. And his lecture, he, he lectures, in, and as you're um, highlighting it, Adam, uh, two boxes to the left is his uh, partner in crime at the uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, Anthony Ledger. Right. Uh, uh, just next in. Um, you're going up. Anyway, both of them are PhDs, and both of them uh, talk um, in ways that people who are smart either um, have no idea how to lecture or can lecture really well to any audience. They're the latter, so they're able to convey the information. And the COVID stuff was great. It's just he's talking about stuff in March and April, and now we have stuff in May, June, and July because uh, uh, the whole um, uh, playing field has changed or it continues to evolve with COVID virus. And who knows, by December, we might be talking about a vaccine. We might be talking about taking rocket ships to the moon to save the virus. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so uh, why don't we then just, uh, you know, just briefly run down the conference here a little bit and just talk for a few seconds. And then uh, we might show, you know, uh, Steve, I was telling Paul, we might actually show uh, Dr. Resnick and Hauser's new lecture right here in the live stream, right? I have the movie. Um, and for people who haven't registered for the conference yet, they may as well get a sneak peek at it and maybe that'll inspire them to actually register and, and get credit for it. Um, but before we do that, let's just uh, talk a little bit more about the conference. So for those who are unaware that CUIR, you know, passed a record, I guess it was maybe a month ago already, where we became the largest uh, CE conference in eye care. So if you look, Vision Expo West last year drew 3,200 ODs, and that was really the last very large live conference. Um, and so we've had about 5,000 ODs come through so far and more all the time. In fact, Steve, you, you mentioned this morning as we were sitting here, more people are registering, um, which is kind of amazing. Every second. <laughs> that carrot, 5,000 needs two carrots because it's well above that now at this point in time. And who knows what's going to be. By the end of the year, we might um, accomplish the goal by having half the ODs in the United States um, uh, attend the conference, but that's for another day. Yeah, that would, that would be great. But, you know, for, for right now, you know, we've, I never thought the conference would have this many people. Um, so I'm really grateful for everyone who's turned out uh, so far. And again, we're going to be coming back live for those who have not seen the conference, uh, you know, who haven't heard the news. I know this is going to come as a shock to people who registered for this thing all the way back in, in uh, November. Um, we're doing it again, over and over again, so you can come back and watch the shows you haven't seen yet. Uh, you know, obviously we have a lot to choose from. I think when all is said and done, we're probably going to have over 70, 70 plus credits, right? Uh, that people can choose yep. from. We're, we're pretty much there already. I, I, I put 63 or 64 in the marketing materials because I really have no idea. I haven't actually gone back and, gonna... and counted. It's at least that many. <laughs> and also just to remember anybody who, t who paid for the conference in November gets all the rest of the conferences for free. Yep. So, um, uh, it's not just they can come back, they can come back and, it's our uh, it's our pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like people sometimes they, they, they ask me, like, really? I can come back? I don't have to register again? No, don't register again. Uh, remember that your login that you got way back when still works. So if you come back, you can still use it over and over and over again, just like Groundhog Day. Um, so my question is, I, don't, I hate to sound piggy, 
but we're over well over 5,000. However, we're talking about 44,000 ODs who need relicensure. What are the other 39,000 doing? Well, you take the 3,000 out of Florida to begin, which is a sore spot <laughs> to start. Um, some states don't have that many requirements, and some people have gotten them someplace else, or their heads are in the sand. Even when we were doing this a couple of years ago, and we were charging uh, this fee or even a lot less, um, our attendance was a lot less, and, and now it's becoming more well-known. I think people are, are signing up for it. But you're right. Um, uh, I have no explanation other than people um, have their heads in the sand. Yeah, I mean, I think I, yeah. I think some people now too are trying to get a you know with these onesies and twosies. Um, if you have a state that has a small, a very small requirement, you know, you could easily get away with doing that, right? If the requirement for you to to take is just tiny, so why not? Uh, but if you if you're at a state where you need twenty credits, thirty credits, I, I don't know. I don't know what people are doing. Um, yeah. It would be challenging. It could be since it's 2020 that people who attended SECO and got 100 credits there, I'm kidding, they got some. At least SECO was not affected by the virus at that point, but now um, all the live things. I think going forward, uh, whether it be our platform, which you know, you know I feel is the best, or others that are going to come online, people are going to start doing more if the virus is still in effect uh, uh, for Vision Expo, for the Academy meeting, for next year's Vision Expo East. Uh, but I think it's going to be the new paradigm, and hopefully the states will loosen up completely at that point. They, they're even going to have to do one or two things. It's just the math because there's no live conferences. Either they have to uh, eliminate the need or reduce the need for CE or allow people to take online CE as their requirement. So one of those two things ha has to budge or um, it's impossible to maintain your license. Yeah. My feeling is we're going to see another push of people here probably in October at our October conference that what's going to happen right. is in August – or maybe even August, what will happen is the bigger conferences will announce that they're just going virtual um, when, when they decide that Las Vegas is uninhabitable. <laughs> um, then at that point, then I think people are going to make the decision to start getting more, more online. Okay. There's a Midwest conference that's in Ohio, I think. I forgot the name of it already. Yeah, so there's, there's uh, regional there's, conferences there's, like East-West oh. there, but again, those conferences... Whether they happen or not, I think by that point, I think the, the real decision point is going to be Academy and Expo West, right? Because a lot of people rely yeah. on those to get a huge number of their credits each year. Academy has how many? You know, over 100 maybe? Um, yeah. And so if that disappears, then you're going to have real problems. And it's funny, actually, we have some speakers at CUR who contacted me. They're like, hey, you know, I'm obviously giving a talk here. Can I stick around and take all the lectures? And we're like, sure. And like, yeah, thank you. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before they, these lecturers are people who are professional speakers, right? They're usually on the road, they're at CE conferences all the time. So for them, picking up the needed hours is no big deal. But now people are contacting me saying, oh gosh, you know, I have nowhere to go. So that's kind of funny. It's funny you mention that, Adam. I go in all the rooms, you know, and I check the list of people in there to see, number one, if I know anybody, number two, if the speaker's there. And I'm seeing names at our lecturers. After their lecture, they hang around and they take the credit. So one of the perks of lecturing for us out there is the fact that you can get your C wire credits for free. And quite a few, and I didn't see them at last one, so I, I noticed the same thing uh, visually. Um, I won't mention any names, but uh, I'd say, well, at least half are doing it. They come in before, they leave afterwards, and, yep. and why not? They're trapped in the house anyway on a Saturday and Sunday. Yep. Yep, yep. So I have a feeling, you know, as, as time wears on in the fall, we're going to see another surge of people realizing that, oh, gosh, I really can't go anywhere else to get my credits, so let me start doing it online. Um, well, I don't know how it was in New York, Paul. You probably could tell me, but in New Jersey, we have um, local meetings of the societies where uh, you get 40 or 50 ODs signing up or coming every single month, and you'd be able to get 16 to 20 credits, and you kind of counted on that. It was a way to... Uh, top local counties, uh, they're not happening now because you're not going to get 40, 50 people in a room at a, at a country club or whatever. So it's, it's not only the national, um, Adam, it's the very local ones that are not taking place. And then there's the regional ones statewide that certainly aren't taking place. And then the national ones just add to it. Right. Yeah. And, and of course, the, the local ones, the, if it's ophthalmology sponsored, they always throw in a meal. And that. <laughs> That brings out the ODs for the free meal, so uh, so there you go. Wait a second. We, we met a Jumpy for Golf Club, and we got not a free meal, but it was part of your registration fee, which was very, very reasonable, and it was good food, actually. 
So um, I don't know about New York. I mean, you, you're probably cheaper than us. But we we gave them a free meal and uh, and wine and beer. Oh, okay. Oh, really? <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, I'm still of the era where you didn't have to take CE uh, in New York <laughs> State for a lot of years, and most optometrists didn't show up anywhere. Uh, the the yeah. New York Academy of Optometry was one of the few venues where you got some lectures, and they did it where the uh, but basically there was not, not a free meal thrown in, but you you got a meal at the hotel. Uh, but those, those were the days uh, before CE was needed. In the early 80s, um, when I started to practice, um, even then you needed a 60 credits in New Jersey of CE. Now, what they did is if you're a new graduate, you didn't have to take it for the first two years because you obviously just out of school. Then it was scaled up, I think it was 30 the third year, and then it went up to the full amount by the fourth or fifth year. Uh, but that was, you were practicing then, and you were still down to the show then, so you must have. Uh, New York must have been a little bit um, uh, more lax. Yeah, well, you know, the, I remember the, the, the New, York, uh, New York Academy, um, you, you spoke to the Academy at your own risk because it was like a Wild West show. After the speaker was done, all the big guns would stand up there and start shooting them down. You know, the, it was a, a very interesting yeah. type of uh, intellectual discourse, but mainly... The academy people in New York State were the educators. Mm. There were very few non-educators that, that belonged to New York State because you could not get into the academy if you had a downstairs location. If you practiced wow. in the store, forget about it. It, it didn't happen. So all the professors were there. Hmm. All right, guys. Well, well, let's let's quickly I, instead of talking about the old days, I want to remind people who are here. <laughs> today okay. <laughs> in 2020 um, that they can't be in two places at once. So uh, this is a, a quick reminder. When you go to a class, pick a class and stick in it uh, for, for the, the hour that you're going to be there uh, so that you'll get credit for it. So very important. Don't just kind of run from room to room to room because it's not going to help um, and the, the system won't actually let you get credit for it. So just quick reminder, uh, stay in the class to get your credit. Um, so, because the thing's watching you, so don't leave early. Make sure you enter your tracker number at the at the end. Uh, there's a, a box. People will explain it to you when you walk into the classroom. You'll actually see it there. It's very easy to do. Once you do it once, you'll have the procedure down. And again, there's no quizzes for live credit at this point. So um, it makes and, it makes and also easier. remember to, to give us give us a critique what you thought of the meeting. Right at the end of each lecture, there's a, a link for a survey. Feel free to fill it out uh, and tell us. We're getting a lot of data now this year because we made the survey super short and easy to do, but there's a place where you can also write in freeform text, and people are. Uh, if you liked something or you hated something, and don't be shy about it. The results are anonymous. We don't actually tie your name to any of the surveys, so I have no idea unless you tell me who's, who's responding. So feel free to be as you know honest as you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so what else? And again, I you know, we just want to thank our sponsors one more time so you can see all the names up there. Go into the exhibit hall and check them out. Um, they all have discounts, as Paul mentioned before. Many are probably willing to deal, right? We, I, I mentioned all the special deals that they have going on. I don't want to run through it again right now because there's so many of them. Um, but I think a lot of these companies are very eager uh, to start you know, moving the metal, as they say, again. Um, so feel free to go on in and, and talk to them. They're, you know, most of these companies are, are very willing to work with you to try to get stuff going. It's interesting, the number of low uh, interest rate deals we've seen here, or 0% interest, or no payments you know, until next January. Um, so yep. I, I think they're trying to really help you, you know, as we recover here and get open again. Um, so it would be kind of nice. You know, you'll have you know, five or six months to actually use the instrument before you have to pay for it in some cases. But the same things were happening back in 2008 um, when um, the economy was tanking. They had zero interest rates at that point, but interest rates were not that low. Now, I guess they can incorporate whatever financing they get from the bank into the cost of the equipment and, and eat the interest. But it's, uh, it's great for the ODs. Um, I remember I bought an Optos. You were with me, Adam. Yep. Um, must have been about eight years ago. Yep. And I could calculate my payment. It was the amount of months divided by the cost because the interest rate was zero then. 
Yep. So um, take advantage of it now. I, I don't know if they're going to go up, but uh, certainly. And now, now you're right. You can negotiate perhaps with them because nothing's going to happen in July and August. There's going to be no conferences. It's the summertime. People are going on vacation in their backyards. And so um, they're probably hot to sell stuff at this point, and uh, they might have some inventory they have to get rid of, especially the higher tech, bigger companies that can. Well, I think everything the smaller ones might be more nimble, uh, nimble in trying to get uh, product or at least samples, whether, whether it be from La Rivera or some other companies that um, have smaller um, items. Right. Well, what's, so interesting, what's interesting to me, too, I just put up Conan's thing up here, you know, talking about the deferred payments, right? There's so many companies we see now where they'll do that for six months, defer the payments right through January, uh, as well as having no interest. So, you know, it gives you some real lead time to actually try to generate some revenue with whatever instrument it is that you're buying, um, whether it's like, you know. And I, yep. and I guess it can juggle with playing with taxes and start depreciating the equipment. Oh, yeah. So the, the question is, how do you depreciate if you don't pay in advance? And you just, you just have to um, take delivery. If you took it to July 1st, but made no payment, it doesn't matter. You you have a bill. You own the equipment. Or you, you leased it with a dollar buyback. So like you say, if somebody wants a little bit of math, you can buy a piece of equipment July 1st, take delivery then, um, deduct the whole piece of equipment from your taxes, and, and also see the patients generate income from that during that time period, but never pay a dime until, let's say, January 1st. So you're, you're correct. Yeah. It's called... Uh, 179 election, I believe. Well, what about, so I have up on the screen Neuralens. This is an interesting case, right? Because they have no payments until January 1st, 2020. So I guess you're you're buying the device. You're not making any payments on it. Uh, obviously, you make your money back on this through the uh, product that, that it generates, right? It generates a prescription and you get custom eyewear from it. So Steve, if you were, yeah. if, if you were you know, gonna acquire this, you know, let's say you were back running the show at your practice, how do you think this would work for you? You'd have basically from July until January to start generating revenue on it. If you market it correctly and, and you have to train your staff, but you take it in right now, um, again, you own the equipment, even though there's no payments due. It's the same thing on a lease of a car or whatever. Um, and you start uh, educating your staff, uh, soliciting to patients. Uh, direct marketing is great now with emails to your whole uh, database, et cetera. And during that time, you could generate thousands of dollars a month and not make a payment, as well as deduct the uh, equipment on the 179 election. So the optometry uh, students coming out of school learn this. They're not good businessmen uh, per se, but you learn over time that uh, one of the things that you have to analyze is your return on investment. So something like this that you're pointing out where there's no payments till January 1st, forget about no interest, um, is just they're giving you six months of making, and you can do some math. It might take two or three years before you even have to worry about uh, the break-even point with the tax savings, uh, the income generated for the six months that you didn't pay anything. So uh, this is a great deal. Yep. All right. Cool. So how about, guys, since it's 10 o'clock? We, by the way, we have an interview later today. I know it's, you're shocked, right? But uh, Laura Perryman wants Ooh. to come. Laura Perryman is going to talk to us at 1230. Um, she wants to say hi. Her lecture's today. Sure. So I'm like, sure, why not? So... Uh, you, you mean 12.30 Pacific time? Oh, 12.30 Pacific time, excuse me, yes. I, I, 3, I, 3, 3.30. 3, 3.30 Eastern 3, 30. time. Is, yes, she's on Pacific right. time, too, so when we talk to each other, we, we talk Pacific all the time. We, <laughs> yeah, but our audience is we, yeah, on the Yeah, I know, our I, I audience is on the East Coast, right? So, um, but anyway, so she'll be here uh, at 3.30 or 12.30, um, and uh, we'll go from there. But for now, um, do you guys want to play uh, Dr. Resnick and Hauser's new... Uh, show, give people a sneak I'd preview. Of it. Okay, absolutely. Sure, maybe I'll content. even watch it. Okay, there you go. So I'm going to get it running. It's you know it's obviously COVID approved, so it's about 45 minutes long, um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And and everyone, let me know what you think of it. So here it is, the the debut of uh, this, and this lecture is in C wire. Uh, it's going on today. Uh, so if you really want credit for it, what you need to do is not watch it here, but watch it in C wire itself. Sign up for the conference what, login. What time, is, what time is it for credits? Ah, good question. See, you think I'd know the I answer. Believe, I think it's 4 o'clock, but don't hold me to it. Yeah, so. 4 o'clock Eastern. Okay, so there's still plenty of time to sign up. Yep, so here's a sneak peek. Good luck, and uh, we will see you guys uh, in about an hour. So here it is. Bye-bye, okay, guys. 
Hi everyone, welcome to our talk on acquired blepharoptosis. We thank CE Wire for the opportunity to present on this uncommonly discussed topic. I'm here today with my co-presenter, Dr. Whitney Hauser. I'll be starting off the discussion by reviewing normal lid anatomy, the changes in structure and function which lead to blepharoptosis, and an overview of the etiology and classification. Dr. Hauser is then going to take us through the clinical workup and conclude with an overview of current treatment and management options. These are our disclosures. Let's start by just reviewing eyelid structure and function. If you'll recall, the closure of the eyelids is facilitated by the circumferential orbicularis oculi muscle, which is innervated by the facial or seventh cranial nerve. The elevators of the upper eyelid are the levator palpebrae superioris and Mueller's muscle. The levator is the main upper eyelid elevator and is innervated by the ocular mo motor or third cranial nerve. It originates from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone and becomes fan-shaped and it extends through the aponeurosis as it enters the eyelid. It penetrates the orbital septum and extends into the upper lid, fanning out across the entire length and inserts on the anterior aspect of the tarsal plate. Mueller's muscle is a smooth muscle. It arises from the undersurface of the levator, just posterior to the fornix, and inserts into the superior tarsus. Mueller's muscle is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. The muscle is responsible for the over-elevation of the eyelid, such as when a patient becomes excited or feel fearful, and if the patient is fatigued or inattentive, it can lead to mild ptosis. So how do we define ptosis? Ptosis is an abnormal, low-lying or drooping upper eyelid margin with the eye in primary gaze. It's a common disorder. There are millions of individuals affected in the U.S. and worldwide. Severity is typically assessed based on the amount of measurable eyelid droop. And Dr. House is going to go into this uh, in more detail a little bit later on. But just as an overview, if there is a droop of 1 to 2 millimeters, it generally leads to limited visual impairment, 2 to 4 millimeters with mild to medium visual impairment, and more than 4 millimeters with significant visual impairment. Blepharoptosis can be unilateral or bilateral, and based on the age of onset, we categorize it as either congenital or acquired. Acquired is typically associated with aging. So mechanically, ptosis is linked to the dysfunction of the muscles responsible for eyelid elevation. Loss of tonus in either of them will result in ptosis. Because the superior palpebral levator is the main retractor of the upper eyelid, deficiency in its function produces a more significant ptosis. The levator receives its innervation from the superior division of the third cranial nerve. Denervation of Mueller's muscle, on the other hand, will only cause a mild ptosis of about 1 to 2 millimeters. So what about epidemiology? How prevalent is this and in what populations? According to the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, eyelid surgery was fifth among the top plastic surgical procedures in the U.S. in 2018 at over 110,000 procedures. It is the most common surgical procedure in the 65 plus age group. This slide looks at the result of a retrospective chart review study on all patients referred for ptosis to the Oculoplastics Division at the University of Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary between 2007 and 2010. The final etiology for each patient's ptosis was determined based on history, standard eyelid measurements, and ancillary testing. And then they categorized it as aponeurotic, neurogenic, myogenic, traumatic, or congenital. And the demographics, including median age and sex, were analyzed for patients in each category as well. The ptosis um, clinical findings that they used were measurements of marginal reflex distance, levator function, palpebral fissure, and they used ancillary testing. For instance, Single fiber electromyography and acetylcholine receptor antibody testing was used to help in diagnosing myasthenia gravis. 
neuroimaging was used in cranial nerve 3 palsy, and Horner syndrome was tested for pharmacologically and then further investigated with imaging. And they concluded that a significant portion um, or proportion of patients referred with ptosis had more serious conditions such as neurogenic or myogenic ptosis. Thus, we as clinicians have to maintain a high degree of suspicion and thoroughly evaluate all patients with ptosis. We want to properly assess for underlying systemic conditions, and we're going to talk more about that shortly. But just keep in mind that the congenital group had the youngest median age at 10 and a half years, and the aponeurotic group had the oldest median age at 62 years. So how does ptosis impact patients' lives? I think we're all familiar with patients who come in and express dissatisfaction with cosmesis, um, but there are other things that patients will uh, experience as well. And while cosmesis may be the primary concern for some individuals with ptosis, more advanced cases are associated with visual field disruption, eyelid strain, altered head position in an effort to compensate, and headaches due to forehead and scalp muscle strain, and all of this can decrease a patient's quality of life. I know in my practice, a lot of times patients will come in just complaining that their eyelids feel really heavy, and they are actually aware of decreased visual function. So let's talk now about the causes of blepharotosis, and we're going to start by looking at congenital versus acquired. Congenital blepharoptosis is typically caused by developmental myopathy of the levator muscle. Acquired, on the other hand, is most often caused by stretching of the levator or disinsertion of the muscle complex from its insertion on the anterior to superior tarsal plate. But it can also be caused by reduced nervous input to the muscles that elevate the eyelid, and we call that neurogenic injury, which is traumatic, excess skin or heaviness of the eyelid, which is mechanical, and then there are certain cases, they're not as common, they're quite rare, where there's actually primary muscle dysfunction, such as in certain forms of muscular dystrophy, uh, which we call myotonic dystrophy or myogenic blepharoptosis. So an overview of aponeuroticosis clinically, how do these patients present? You'll see a reduced MRD1, which we call margin to reflex distance. You will see a high upper eyelid crease. There will be near normal levator function, and there will be decreased palpebral fissure in down gaze. So as the patient looks down, the palpebral fissure actually reduces at a higher rate than somebody who does not have levator dysfunction. In myogenic and congenital ptosis, you'll see a weaker absent eyelid crease. You'll see poor levator function and again, eyelid lag on down gaze. So this is just a schematic um, on how to break down congenital versus acquired. You'll see that congenital will define as occurring or diagnosed at birth to about a year, and then acquired um, from a year on. And in both categories, we can further subdivide them into isolated and non-isolated. So let's first talk about congenital ptosis. It's ptosis that's present as, at birth, as we said, or within the first year of life, and it's most commonly isolated, which means it's not associated with other ocular findings. In about 75% of the cases, it's unilateral. The majority of congenital ptosis is due to myogenic descent, dysgenesis of the levator muscle. It most often does not affect vision, but in severe cases, the drooping eyelid may occlude all or part of the pupil and may interfere with vision, resulting in amblyopia. Congenital ptosis may occur through autosomal dominant inheritance. So when we see a child with um, ptosis, we want to be sure we are finding any underlying cause. It may be a good idea to question the parents about other relatives having been born with a lid problem, and certainly we want to address it to prevent any potential amblyopic changes. To briefly review other possible causes of um, isolated congenital ptosis. There's something called synkinetic ptosis, which many of us will remember as Marcus Gunn jaw winking syndrome. 
And if you recall, that's a rare congenital ptosis, and it's due to an aberrant, aberrant innervation of the levator muscle by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So what happens is there's a brisk upper eyelid retraction when the person is chewing, smiling, or sucking, and often the parent will notice this right after birth when they're feeding the child. In aponeurotic ptosis, that's a congenital defect results from a failure of the aponeurosis to insert on the anterior surface of the tarsus from birth, and it can follow a forceps delivery, and the skin may remain, the skin crease may remain normal or high, depending on where the aponeurosis is affected. The levator function is generally good, and there is no lid lag on down gaze. And to review just a few of the causes of non-isolated congenital ptosis, that may be due to close embryological development of the levator and the superior rectus muscles. Congenital ptosis may be associated with superior rectus weakness. And then there is a congenital form of Horner's syndrome which can occur in infancy, which also presents, just like in adulthood, with ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and progressive heterochromia. Again, the lighter colored iris will be ipsilateral to the affected side, and the lesion may occur anywhere along the oculosympathetic pathway. So in these patients, it's important to evaluate for possible etiologies, such as congenital varicella, tumors of the neck and mediastinum, and vascular lesions of the internal carotids or subclavian artery. And then there's congenital third cranial nerve palsy, which may be partial or complete, and it may present with uh, ptosis together with other signs, such as the inability to depress, elevate, or adduct the eye, and the pupil may, may be dilated. So let's focus now on acquired blepharitosis, which is the main subject of our talk from this point on. Acquired blepharoptosis is typically associated with aging. A study of 400 patients in the UK found that blepharoptosis was present in over 11% of adults age 50 and old, older. And if we extrapolate this to the United States population, this prevalence corresponds to an estimated 13 million patients age 50 plus in 2020. Other known risk factors, either temporary or permanent, include ocular surgery, and this can include glaucoma surgery, cataract surgery, corneal strabismus, which can lead to temporary or permanent blepharoptosis. Contact lens wear, wearing hard or soft contact lenses, has been found to increase the incidence versus no contact lens wear, and one potential mechanism would be levato aponeurosis dehiscence due to the method of hard contact lens removal. And then, of course, we always have to be suspicious for underlying disease, <clears throat> such as myasthenia gravis or diabetes. <clears throat> as previ previously discussed, you know, similar to congenital ptosis, acquired ptosis may be categorized as isolated or non-isolated. The most common cause of isolated acquired ptosis is aponeurotic. It's most common in adults. The abnormality is in the levator. There is a dehiscence, disinsertion, or stretching. It can occur in younger patients as well. In younger patients, as mentioned, repeated manipulation of the upper eyelid during contact lens wear, and this can occur in both hard and soft lens wearers, may cause disinsertion of the levator. It occurs frequently after ocular surgery and following trauma. There are some other causes, though, and that can include eyelid trauma from an infection or allergy, blepharochalasis, pregnancy, chronic use of topical steroids, and frequent lid rubbing. Mechanical ptosis is caused by excess weight of the upper lid. There are a multitude of causes that can easily be dis distinguished on physical exam. A few common causes are edema, inflammation, tumors, chalasia, dermoid cysts, neurofibromas, and amyloid deposits. And scarring from inflammation, surgery, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or ocular pemphigoid can also lead to mechanical ptosis. Always perform orbital imaging in patients with an underlying mass or infiltrative lesion.
Acquired traumatic ptosis can develop as the result of any trauma to the orbit. Traumatic ptosis can be neurogenic, aponeurotic, myogenic, or mechanical in nature. Iatrogenic causes account for roughly 50% of traumatic blepharitis. And traumatic ptosis has been reported to account for 11.2% of blepharoptosis in a tertiary care oculoplastic setting. And there was a study that showed 4% to 12% after cataract surgery procedures. And there's about 10 to 12% after trabeculectomy alone and combined trabeculectomy phacoemulsification. The causes can include disinsertion of the levator muscle or damage to the levator tendon with scar formation. Alternatively, cranial nerve 3 damage can also sustain damage leading to the ptosis. In severe cases that result in significant damage to the levator, patients may require multiple surgeries with a poor probability of restoring natural eyelid anatomy. Patients who are at increased risk for cranial nerve 3 involvement Includes those, include those with head trauma injuries, post-traumatic cavernous sinus thrombosis, orbital apex fractures, and nerve compression by foreign bodies. Patients with CN3 damage will typically resolve on their own with time and should be observed, observed for spontaneous recovery over a period of three to six months before considering surgical intervention. As we mentioned, rigid lens-induced eyelid ptosis is a well-established condition. It's thought to be caused by years of mechanical traction from pulling the lids while removing the lens. Patients can typically resume wear of their lenses two to six weeks after surgery and are instructed to use a plunger. Some patients, however, may best be suited for a soft lens refit. An update in the contact lens parameters may be necessary after surgery due to the change in eyelid and lens dynamics, so you want to warn patients that their lenses may sit differently. They may have more problems wearing their lens, even if the lens is in exactly the same positions, and patients may feel drier and have more trouble wearing their lenses after surgery. Investigators compared the rate of hard lens wearers lens users in ptosis cases with that in a control group and then estimated the odds ratio. So the study you see here included all patients aged between 30 to 60 years who were seen with aponeurotic ptosis. And it was, ptosis was defined as a margin reflex distance of both eyes that was less than or equal to 1.5 millimeters. And the controls were subjects with an MRD of both eyes that was more than or equal to 3 millimeters. And the, the control subjects were selected from an age-matched group of female hospital employees. And they concluded that the pathogenesis was, induced ptosis is aponeurogenic and is similar to the involutional changes that are associated with attenuation or disinsertion of the aponeurosis from its distal insertion in the eyelid. As we discussed earlier, before treating blepharoptosis, it's important to conduct a differential diagnosis to identify any potentially serious underlying cause. Because in some cases, ptosis can be a sign of more serious cause, a focused neurological exam should be carried out on patients. And serious conditions masquerading as blepharoptosis can include Horner's and myasthenia gravis. If Horner's syndrome is suspected, pharmacological testing with eye drops such as hydroxyamphetamine um, and iapidine and imaging may be an important part of detecting the underlying cause. Myasthenia gravis is a unilateral or bilateral ptosis with upper eyelid position variability that is often accompanied by diplopia and or strabismus. And those with myasthenia gravis could also have respiratory compromise or a concurrent thymoma. A history of intermittent diplopia and worsening symptoms throughout the day suggesting fatigability should increase our suspicion for myasthenia gravis. And in 85% of patients with myasthenia, the initial symptoms were either ptosis or diplopia. 
The gold standard for diagnosis is serologic confirmation of autoantibodies to the acetylcholine receptors, as well as electrophysiologic studies. Um, so there are bedside tests such as edrophonium and prostigmine that result in temporary elevation of the totic eyelid. Also, cooling the effective eyelid with an ice pack for two minutes may also result in temporary reversal of the ptosis. The sensitivity of edrophonium testing and ice pack testing is roughly 80% for each test. Treatment with cholinesterase inhibitor medication often improves the ptosis, and surgery may be considered when medical therapy fails. Other non-isolated neurogenic conditions include chronic external ophthalmoplegia and ocular motor or third nerve palsy. Chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia is characterized by symmetric bilateral ptosis and ophthalmoparesis, and the patients are usually in their 30s. A family history showing a maternal inheritance pattern, imaging studies to rule out other possible causes, and a muscle biopsy can aid in diagnosing this. It's a mitochondrial disease. Because, because CPEO may be associated with Kern-Sayre syndrome, these patients often warrant additional workup for cardiac conduction defects and pigmentary retinopathy. Another cause of myogenic ptosis can be medication-induced, typically steroid or tenofovir. These have been described in the literature and, stre and stresses the importance of reviewing a patient's medication. Ocular motor nerve palsy is characterized by ptosis accompanied by ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, and poorly reactive dilated pupil, and can be a result of ischemic injury or aneurysm. CN3 palsy may necessitate imaging to rule out a compressive etiology. So let's just take a look at a couple of cases here. The upper image shows CN3 palsy. So just recall that the ocular motor nerve innervates the medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus, and inferior oblique. It also innervates the levator palpebrae and carries sympathetic innervation from the edinger westphal nucleus. So dysfunction can result from ischemia, infection, compression, trauma, and demyelating disease such as multiple sclerosis. And patients may present with any combination of ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, and a poorly reactive dilated pupil. The ptosis may actually be profound. So when seeing a patient with um, CN3 palsies, you have to differentiate between complete and incomplete. Um, in other words, pupil sparing and pupil involved. Pupil sparing CN3 palsy is commonly due to ischemic injury in patients with vascular risk factors such as hypertension or diabetes. In older patients, typically older than age 55, giant cell arteritis needs to be considered. Pupil involving third nerve palsy often indicates a, comp a compressive etiology because the parasympathetic fibers supplying the pupil travel on the outer, more easily compressed portion of the nerve. And these should be attributed to compression from a posterior communicating artery aneurysm until proven otherwise. So therefore, they warrant urgent investigation. You want to send these patients out right away for computed tomography angiography or magnetic resonance angiography. The lower image shows Horner syndrome with a classic triad including unilateral ptosis, ipsilateral meiosis, and anhydrosis. And since Mueller's mus muscle only contributes to one to two millimeters of lid retraction, the associated ptosis is mild. The syndrome results from damage anywhere along the sympathetic pathway, which can be divided by first-order neurons. That would be hypothalamus to spinal cord, second-order neurons, which is the spinal cord to the superior cervical ganglion, and the third-order neuron, which is the superior cervical ganglion to the orbit. So it's important to determine which order neuron is involved because Horner syndrome secondary to involvement of the first or second-order neurons may be caused by underlying malignancy. The diagnosis of Horner's syndrome is confirmed if a apraclonidine drop testing results in reversal of anisocoria. 
and then you use hydroxyamphetamine drop testing to localize the level of dysfunction. The drop will result in pupillary dilation if the dysfunction is at the level of the first or second order neurons, while no dilation will occur if the third neur order neuron is affected. So now Dr. Hauser will conclude this section on differential diagnosis by talking about pseudoptosis, and then she'll take us through the clinical uh, evaluation of ptosis patients and talk about current therapies. Dr. Hauser. Now, what is our differential diagnosis for pseudoptosis? Pseudoptosis, again, you're having that upper lid droop and the absence of pathology of the upper eyelids. So what are our options here? Our causes can be dermatoshelasis, brow ptosis, superior sulcus deformity, microophthalmus, and hemifacial spasm. What we're going to do next is take each of those piece by piece and kind of unravel them a little bit and figure out which one of these may be impacting our patients. First, let's look at dermatoshelasis. Dermatoshelasis is redundant or sagging eyelid skin. Depending on what your practice is or where your practice is, odds are you're seeing this almost every day. The patient population that I primarily work with is patients, generally speaking, 50 and up. I see dermatoshelasis all day, every day. So it's an important thing to identify in our examination. Manual lifting allows for assessment of that positioning of the under eyelid skin. And the reason that's important is, and we'll find out later as we look at brow ptosis, it can really be a differentiating factor between true dermatoshelasis and more of a brow ptosis. Now, the prevalence of this in individuals over the age of 45 is about 16% and it affects males more than females. Now, why are we seeing these changes? We're seeing this because we're living longer, and the longer we live, the more chronic problems that we have and more involutional eye problems that are identified. Now, with dermatoshelasis, there can be a couple causes to that. It can be the traction, due to the contraction of the orbicularis muscle over time, but there's also a second part, and it's the second part that really is, is not a friend to any of us, and that's gravity. So gravity can also play a role in it. So we're looking at traction and gravity uh, to play a role in dermatoshelasis. And eventually we're gonna see a change or a loss of that quality and quantity of elastic tissue in the skin that causes those lids to kind of droop. All these factors ultimately are gonna result in a lowering, particularly of the lateral one third of the eyebrow and that excess skin kind of weighting it down on that lateral corner of the upper eyelid. So the thing about dermatoshelasis, not unlike what I said about ptosis in the beginning, is dermatoshelasis has a cosmetic concern to the patients. The patients have those droopy eyelids and that, that dull appearance. However, they also can be subject to ocular irritation, and sometimes this goes unnoticed uh, clinically. So why do they have ocular irritation? It can be secondary to chronic blepharitis. They can also have dry eye issues. And sometimes misdirected lashes can also cause problems for the patient. Additionally, dermatoshelasis can cause a reduction in both superior and temporal field of vision and quality of vision changes as well. So there can be definite visual impacts both from how the patient sees and how the patient feels. Now, it's fairly predictable that you're going to see as the margin reflex distance measured in millimeters decreases, you're going to see an increase in the percentage of superior visual field loss. But this study proves that uh, point for us. So as you can see here, as the lid goes lower and lower, you see an increase in the percentage visual field loss. Now, what this study doesn't say, but other studies have found, is that you can also have a decrease in contrast sensitivity with some of these patients who have dermatoshelasis. And there have actually been reports of significant improvement in contrast sensitivity of patients undergoing blepharoplasty surgery for dermatoshelasis. So it actually can improve the quality of that patient's vision. Now, why does that happen? The proposed explanation is that that redundant or heavy skin that overlays the eye actually blocks some of the light entering the eye and can cause some level of diffraction. So having a surgical opportunity to go in and resolve that, it's not just an aesthetics component. It's not even just a visual field potential improvement, 
but the patient may actually have better quality of vision as well. Now, I mentioned brow ptosis a little bit. We're going to talk about some of the etiologies of that and then how you can evaluate for it clinically to see if your patient is suffering from a brow ptosis or perhaps dermatoschelasis. So as you see here, there's several different etiologies. Number one, involutional changes. Number two, secondary to weakness of paralysis of frontalis. Now, what does that mean for us? You know, this could be patients who have Bell's palsy, maybe an acoustic neuroma, surgical trauma, it could be a birth trauma, or it can even be congenital. Now, I've had a couple patients that have fallen in this particular category. I've had a patient with an acoustic neuroma and one with surgical trauma who's ultimately had a brow ptosis due to those uh, two factors. The other possibilities there under the secondary uh, weakness of paralysis is uh, myotonic dystrophy. You can also have uh, myasthenia gravis, a lot of different options. You also may have patients who have brow ptosis associated with neoplasm, as you can see here, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell, uh, and so forth. Now, how do we do that differential diagnosis testing? This is, you know, really easy test to do in clinic, uh, requires no special equipment, but it's really valuable. And perhaps some of you are already utilizing this, but as you can see here, we have a patient uh, on the left, this is the same individual, but patient's image on the left is this natural lid posture. And you can see the, the brows look a little lower. Normal brow uh, is gonna sit above the superior orbital rim. So we do see that little bit of lowering of the brow. Again, male brows tend to be lower than female brows typically. Uh, but what we see in this, the second image, the image to the right, you have to kind of take a peek right up at the edge of the top of that image where you can see some fingertips that are in there. What we have here is the, is the patient's brow is manually being lifted. You're seeing it elevated. So it, maybe that front talus isn't fully engaged. And when we manually lift it and stabilize, you can see that there's a resolution of what appears to be an acquired ptosis. So we don't even have a frank uh, dermatoschelasis in this patient. If you look at it at just face value in that image on the right, one may interpret that as a dermatoschelasis. However, with elevation of that brow, you can definitely see that it's not exactly so much about those heavy sagging lids as it is the brows not really fully engaged and lifting the brows as they should. Now with superior sulcus deformity, now this is not something that I personally see a lot of in clinical practice, primarily because this is gonna be a, a cosmetic problem in an anophthalmia patient. So as you can see here, our patient, uh, the, the left eye is, uh, posture has more of a, an inophthalmos is pointing downwards. And part of that can be because a lot of these patients are subject to orbital floor, floor fracture. They've had fracture and this has been corrected. This is their now their posture or, or from a prosthetic. And as you can see, there's a different exposure of the lid. So she's got a heavy kind of hooded lid over on the right eye. The left eye you can see has more of a totic type posture. So not something, again, that I've seen a lot of clinically, but it's definitely something that you may encounter. Uh, and it can also have that displacement because there's just changes in the volume of bone and orbital fat. Um, Micro-ophthalmists, again, as I already identify, many of my patients that I see are in that uh, older patient population, 50 and up. And I don't see a lot of pediatric patients like you see here, but just taking a look at this uh, patient's reflex, you can see that the MRD1 or that reference distance or reflex distance in the left eye is going to have us is going to be smaller than it is in the right. So measuring from the reflex to the lid margin, we're seeing what appears to be uh, an atosis, but may not necessarily be identified as that. As we look at the etiology of microophthalmos. Frankly, the, the precise etiology of it really is unknown. Um, however, there are some factors that may play a role, and many of those tend to be environmental or hereditary factors. So what would those be? It could be the maternal age, if the mom is over 40 at the time of birth, multiple births, low birth weight, and gestational age. 
and it could be gestational acquired infections, which I'll go through here in just a moment, some of those specifics or exposures and deficiencies. So if you have a patient with microophthalmos, uh, you definitely want to get a good birth history and pregnancy history from the mom to see kind of what might have been risk factors for this particular child. And, you know, what some of the gestational and acquired infections are, there's several of them. Uh, most commonly, you're going to see uh, risk factors like rubella, toxoplasmosis, and varicella. You may also see cytomegalovirus as a risk factor, parvo B19. Even influenza virus, which is definitely of all those that I've listed so far, probably the most common that we would expect someone to be exposed to, and Coxsackie A9. In terms of the deficiencies or exposures the mother may have encountered during pregnancy, vitamin A deficiency, fever, hyperthermia, uh, exposure to x-rays, solvent misuse, and exposure to other drugs like thalidomide and warfarin, as well as alcohol. So again, getting a good case history in these patients is really important to have better understanding perhaps the origins of their microophthalmia. Hemifacial spasm. Now, hemifacial spasm, and we're going to kind of go through this as it relates to our, our image there on the right. But first of all, a little bit about the, the patients that are most at risk. So more frequently in middle-aged women or elderly women, uh, more commonly amongst an Asian patient population. And, you know, really what happens first is the first symptoms tends to be an intermittent lid twitch that can ultimately lead to a forced closure. So this is above and beyond our typical myokymia that patients experience. So patient comes in with a lid twitch, we hear this all the time, and they say, you know, this started, frankly, it can be really alarming to a patient when they experience myokymia, and we're usually recommending things like lower your stress level, rest more, uh, decrease your caffeine consumption. However, for hemifacial spasm, it's really taking it to a whole new level. So again, you get that forced lid closure, and you can even see that spreading of the, uh, of the uh, spasm into the lower face. And you, as you can see here in our, our image, the patient's mouth is drawn to one side. This can be related to nerve injury or tumor. However, many of them are without known apparent cause. So you may not know the, the etiology of this, and uh, which can be really tough for the patient because then sometimes it's harder to know when this could resolve. Now, as we look at assessing acquired blepharitosis, so from a clinical perspective, how do we not only identify our acquired blepharitosis, but how do we make quantitative and qualitative assessments of this? Now, one of my favorite tests for this is the marginal reflex distance, or MRD1, and we've talked a little bit about that already, but just to kind of circle back and, and hit on that one more time, as you can see here in the illustration, MRD1 measures from the corneal reflex to the upper lid margin. Now, MRD2 measures from the corneal reflex down to the lower lid margin, but in assessing acquired blepharitosis, we're going to be focusing on MRD1. Now that marginal reflex distance, again, is really important because it's giving greater precision than measuring strict total fissure height. I know a lot of clinicians like to measure just fissure height, but you're really getting a, again, more clear assessment by measuring that MRD1. Additionally, in my own clinical practice, I'll use visual field testing, and we're gonna go through those various types here in just a minute. Uh, I have not leaned as much on levator function and the eyelid crease height, which is used in superior sulcus deformity evaluation. With the levator function, what you're doing is assessing by firmly pressing on the brow and measuring the distance moved by the upper lid margin when the patient shifts from downward gaze to upward gaze. So just food for thought about how you might wanna incorporate this differently into your practice as you're evaluating a patient uh, with acquired blepharitosis. As I mentioned, some different visual field types. We're pretty familiar with all of these, Goldman visual field, Humphrey visual field, and LPFT. However, you know, many of us in clinic are using the, the Humphrey visual field type of, of analyzer. It's, it's sort of a, a mainstay, if you will, of clinical care. One of the things that I would say in terms of a ptosis patient, I might potentially rely on a Goldman visual field in a few cases 
if a patient has some mobility issues, if they have trouble concentrating, uh, you know, some of my elderly patients, and, and these folks are ones that are going to be more subject to that acquired blood protosis, they may need that little bit of extra time to get the precise measurements that we want. So, you know, I might kind of go towards a, a Goldman visual field for that subset. So all of these work for, for measuring what we need to do in terms of superior field, but they do it a little bit differently. Again, Goldman being our kinetic perimetry versus our static perimetry with our HVF and LPFT. Now, what about severity? You know, as you look at these illustrations here, the first one you might look at and say, no big deal, right? One to two millimeter droop, assuming there's no underlying systemic issue and, and perhaps this is a function or cosmetic concern, that's not too big of a deal, right? It looks, it looks like a pretty normally positioned eye. Now, certainly I think patients uh, may be more aware of that one to two millimeter droop. It may pop out to them a little bit more than it does to us clinically. Even though there's limited visual impairment, patients starting to get that little bit of awareness raised when they look in the mirror. As we transition now to a two to four millimeter droop, now we're in that mild to moderate category. Patients definitely gonna have some awareness of it. We're going to be noticing it clinically because now we're getting some coverage from the pupil. Uh, so not all the light is going in the way it should be. And now that's when we're going to have to start that discussion. What are we going to do? Is this something that we need to do more about? Is this going to, patient going to become a referral to oculoplastics? It's almost a, a point of discussion and negotiation and really kind of feeling where that patient is living in terms of their motivations. Now as we go into that four millimeter greater uh, droop, we're seeing significant visual impairment. We can see half the pupil is now covered by the lid. Not only is that going to be a functional concern, it's also going to be a pretty significant cosmetic concern for the patient. At that point, I think all parties on board are going to be on board to make that referral to oculoplastics and get further evaluation and consideration for a blepharoplasty treatment or some type of repair. So we do see our, our discussions kind of change with patients as we see the, the worsening or s severity of blepharitosis. So what are our current options for treatment? Now, I did talk a little bit about surgery as we're looking at those greater than four millimeter people with more of a severe acquired blepharitosis. So surgery is an option. The pro, the pro of that always is going to be improved function and hopefully improve quality of life. Now, the con is, is that not all patients are good candidates and there are complications. Now, the complications that are listed here, bleeding, scarring, and infection, those are things that are almost ubiquitous across surgery. So these patients, you know, the risks, benefits, and alternatives need to be discussed with them before that referral is made. Now, if we look at different options, off-label medication or use of apraclonidine is another approach. The good news there is we're going to see an increase in that upper lid elevation, so we're going to see a change in posture. The con is some unwanted side effects may go along with that, like pupil dilation. So consider that you're almost trading one asymmetry for another if you're using a medication like that. So what you might notice is, again, elevation to a, a norm, normal posture for the lid, but now having that dilated pupil in that one eye is also not going to look perfectly, quote, normal. The patient may also be somewhat uh, increased risk for uh, contact dermatitis with the use of apraclonidine. Now, as we go into non-surgical options, mechanical intervention. These are probably my least favorite. Now, I don't mind mechanical intervention if I'm doing a, a visual field evaluation of someone who has a dermatosclerosis or a, a blepharitosis and whatnot, because we need that taped versus untaped visual field assessment. However, it's not a great long-term answer. Is this definitely a temporary solution? Patients, you know, if you're thinking about it from a functional perspective, we can elevate that lid, but from a a cosmetic or quality of life, but you're certainly doing your patient no favors by recommending, uh, you know, medical tape to elevate their eye, eyelid. It is a conservative approach for sure, uh, and it can be done pretty quickly. But at the same time, it's very temporary, and there are some associations with discomfort. So, what is the current standard of care for acquired blepharo? 
ptosis, it's going to be surgery. So as we look at our surgical intervention, you know, this is going to really address the pathology or insufficiency of several things, the uh, posterior lamella. And you can do that via the anterior or posterior approach. Now it depends. We have to have alignment again between what the patient's objectives are from a functional and cosmetic perspective and what the surgeon thinks that they can do. And that can be difficult. You know, the, the lids surgery is, is very tricky and I don't even mean from just a, a surgical perspective, but just the balance and making sure we get that alignment. So when we talked about the patients who have that really mild one to two millimeter uh, differential between their two lids, you know, that's an incredibly tricky surgery. It's hard to go in and make those little refinements. As we get into your more moderate to severe patients, there's definitely that option to, to make an improvement. However, ideally, a lot of the patients that we encounter would probably prefer something a little less invasive versus having a surgical experience. But currently, our, our standard of care is to, is to approach that from a surgical perspective. So I know I would like to thank you for your time today, and I'd like to thank Dr. Resnick for contributing as well. Uh, we appreciate your time. Hope that you've taken away some pearls for how you can evaluate acquired blepharitosis in your practice. And thank you so much for being a part of CE Wire. Alrighty, so that was Whitney and Sue Resnick. Alrighty, and let's get that out of the way. So we're back. Let me uh, see if Paul and Steve are back. Guys, are you there? Nope, not yet. All right, well, I'm back at least. So hope everyone enjoyed that. That was your sneak preview of uh, the TOSIS video that Whitney and um, Sue are, are doing at CWIRE. Let me actually show you. I can bring it up in the schedule to show you where we're at with all this. So right there, and you can see it is at 1 p.m. today, 1 p.m. Pacific, pardon me, <laughs> 4 Eastern. So if you'd like credit for that lecture, all you need to do is come to CWIRE2020.com, register for the conference, go into the room and then watch it there. There's no um, quiz or anything today uh, because Arbor rules have obviously changed. So come on in and uh, give it a look-see and I think it'll be a lot of fun. So there we go. The conference has been going well today. We know that there have been about a thousand people, I think, give or take, who have been in the classrooms uh, watching today. Uh, not a surprise that it's, you know, it's been pretty steady uh, since Arbo made their rule change allowing folks to do online CE the same as being there in person. Um, and I'd like to, while we're here, can uh, review a little bit and sort of thank everyone uh, for being part of the conference today. So if we uh, run this back, I can show you where we're at with the conference. So um, the reminder is that we're going to be back live again on August 22nd and 23rd, October 17th and 18th, and November 14th and 15th, and December 12th and 13th doing basically the same thing uh, all over again. Uh, so you don't have to feel rushed or pressured to take too many classes right now. So you can come on back then. If you're getting tired and don't feel like sitting through the rest, you obviously have all these other dates to do it. Um, the fact that there are four more dates is kind of interesting, right? Because we have four tracks running. If you look here, uh, you can get a sense of how many more classes will be available for you to do. Um, in theory, you could take just about all of them if you wanted to, all of them live, although there's no state that I know of where anybody needs that many credits. And... Adam, I'm back. Oh, hey, Steve. How's it going? Good, good, good. I was just complimenting Sue. I sent an email. Uh, great lecture. I can now watch the live one and heckle her because I know all the answers before. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, I... <laughs> Yeah, it was a good it was a good uh, talk, yeah. and and you know as I was mentioning to everyone, it's at one p.m. Uh, our time, four p.m. Eastern time. Um, so if people want to come back and get credit, what they just need to do is log into cwire2020.com, watch, um, and again, there's no quiz at this point, just a test of the fact that you were there, and you're you're fine. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a good lecture. Well, add to your 64 credits not needing them, um, 
some every state has different calendars. It could be calendar years. My particular state, it's April 30th. Some might be different. So they might end their, um, let's say, biennial or yearly thing in um, the end of August. So they could take some now and then roll over into the new biennial with new requirements and take it in the October and December one. So, uh, and it's all the same fee, the one-time fee of uh, the 159. Or, uh, well, uh, let's just say it's one-time fee. Yep. Um, so uh, it does work well for certain calendar years. Uh, we ran this from um, February through uh, <laughs> December, so it's pretty much everybody's calendar year if they did roll over. Yeah, that's true. I never even really thought about that, but that is true. So, um, the, unfortunately, yeah. the thing about the February dates was that's online interactive credit, not live. And people have asked me, well, I took it in February. How come that doesn't count as live? And unfortunately, the answer is because Arbo says so. Um, anything on the April, May, and June events, this is all counted as live. The February event is online interactive. And in some states, it makes no difference. In some states, it does. So. I apologize if you can't get live credit for those courses. You know, we have so many classes, though. Come on back and take other ones um, if those don't work for you. If they would have done a little um, earlier testing, though, of the virus, February might have counted, but uh, that's water under the bridge because yep. I think it was already here by then. Yeah. It was yeah. safe. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about it, um, so it's just the way it is. So. But, you know, fortunately, we have all these dates planned, so I would imagine that there are some that, that people could make no matter what. So, um, you know. Some people, one person wrote me that um, he attended all the lectures, but one or two of them he wanted to see again. Didn't realize he could see it on demand. Only thought he can come live, and he's watching a couple of lectures now just to see what he missed the first time, so it's kind of neat. And also... Um, uh, one of the lecturers, Mark Freeberg, um, he now had better questions because he went and watched his lecture, went back and practiced about OCT2, which is a, a higher level when uh, what you could do your OCT with. And now he had better questions because he had seen the lecture, went back and practiced and thought about it. So really, it, it, sometimes it behooves somebody to come back and watch something again when the live speaker is there because you don't get these live people all the time uh, as, at your service. Yep, absolutely. All right, so it's coming up on the uh, 11 o'clock hour here in Portland and uh, I guess 2 o'clock out east. So let's uh, see what's going on here. So, so it looks like uh, we've got a few, a few favorites here. Um, critical concepts for critical corneas. Um, and then Craig Thomas is back uh, with Stuck on You, which if you haven't seen that one is a pretty humorous talk. Um, and future keratoconus management. So again, more um, interesting stuff about you know where things are going with keratoconus. You know, with cross-linking, this is the disease that heretofore people had to wait a long time to treat. Now you know you can get people in super early uh, because you can actually do some some therapeutic intervention at least. So pretty cool stuff. Um, and then General Lyrely will talk about beauty basics. And so I have a, a sense that uh, most people don't know the, much about cosmetics, at least not no men. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so it kind of behooves people to show up for this lecture, especially if they know that they don't know what they're doing, um, because Jen gives a really good overview uh, of cosmetics and, and how it relates to the ocular surface. So cool stuff. One of the most well-received lecturers for both, uh, mostly the women that we have to say, but men also, because it's stuff that you don't learn, and uh, it, it's very well-received and information that uh, they're appreciative to have. So yep. good lecture. Yeah, I realized how little I actually knew about cosmetics and makeup when I had to get all, you know, done up for one of these video shoots um, at one of the trade shows. And then after it was all done, I had the stuff all over my face. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, that's really interesting. So some people do this every day because when I, I, you know, finally went back up to my hotel room at the end of the day, I could start feeling it in my eyes. I'm like, this, this doesn't feel right. Um, so these are challenges, I guess, that women face all the time that we men are, are invisible to a lot of the time. Interested watching people on TV when they're being interviewed now for Zoom, whether it be um, a scientist, an MD, or whatever, they don't have any makeup on, and they have shiny faces, and uh, they don't look as good as they normally look when they're being prepped in the studio. So it's a whole new world, especially with high-definition TV. Yeah, it's very, very unforgiving. That's why I smear uh, oil all over my camera lens here, right? <laughs> yep. I think I look good on audio. I have a good face for radio. Uh... <laughs> All right. Well, so I guess we have a little bit. We're going to be talking to hopefully Laura Perryman in about 90 minutes or maybe less. What time did she say? 1230, I think she said. 
So, uh, so three thirty. So three thirty your time. So she'll be back. Um, but in the interim, what I what I wanted to do was show people since we have a little bit of time right now. Um, Craig Thomas had a really great lecture on uh, ERG, um, and so Steve, I know this is something that you implemented in your practice a long time ago, but remarkably, mm -hmm. the vast majority of practices uh, don't test this at all. Um, you know, that, that was always one of my big surprises, by the way, after doing this now for so many years. Do you know that there are still, I, I want to say it's like half the practices, maybe more, don't even have an OCT, um, which many people would consider a sort of you know, the baseline equipment that you'd like to have in a, in a full scope office, but a lot of people still don't. So something like ERG is even probably more exotic to people at this point. We had the same conversation though 10 years ago about um, let's say topographers and mm -hmm. visual fields 15, 20 years ago. It's amazing how um, I, I, what you're talking about, I, I couldn't practice without an OCT. Right. Uh, the ERG the EP machine, of course, it, it, it helps, and I probably could get by without it, but it becomes part of a daily routine. But you're correct. Uh, a lot of slow adapters, and uh, I don't want to, um, you know, isolate commercial versus uh, uh, professional because, uh, for example, Kerry Gelb is in a commercial environment and has more bells and whistles than I'll ever have, <laughs> including that uh, machine. And they're on an Iris, an Iris, mm -hmm. uh, the one that went out of business. Yeah, I need this, yep. Um, so you're correct, uh, and I, I just you can't treat glaucoma without it. It's like in, it's like in the old days treating glaucoma with uh, with um, touching the eyes to feel their their pressure. So um, <laughs> right. I guess they either don't or whatever. There's a very I think optometry has a much wider uh, let's say practice uh, profile than ophthalmology and general medicine, and people do what they're comfortable with. I'm not gonna. Uh, judge them, but uh, certainly things like an OCT is important. What well, Craig's going to talk about. And by the way, Craig is great. If if you don't buy uh, use something like his after Craig talks about it, then you're never going to use it. <laughs> right. So in, in particular, in his talk, which I just want to show to people now, um, it's uh, all about this RET eval device. So this is an, a handheld ERG, which is crazy, right? If you look at this thing and its size, and you, I'll put it up on the screen so you can get a sense of how small it really is. The technology has become so small and compact. Uh, and easy to use versus the the old, old school devices. It's really amazing. Um, but he's going to talk about ERG in general. Um, you know why this might be a useful thing to have in your office, and then talk a little bit more specifically about codes you can use and so forth, and how one actually bills for this. Um, so uh, why don't we turn that on? And uh, when we get back, we'll have uh, Laura on the line. How does that sound? Sounds good. All Be right. back. I'm going to make sure that everybody's there. All right. See you in a bye bit. Bye. Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. And, and really, thank you so much for being here tonight. You know, I know that things have been kind of crazy, you know, across the country and across the world over the last couple of weeks. So it's really kind of nice to be able to, to come back on here into a space uh, that we're all sort of comfortable with, right? We've been doing this for a lot of years and, and it feels nice to actually get back on the air here with all of you tonight um, and try to get a, a sense of normalcy. Um, back again. And I wanted to particularly thank, before we get started, I wanted to thank Conan Medical. You know, as you all know, Conan is a small business. They're, they're based out here on the West Coast in, in California. Um, and as this all has been going on, they've adjusted their operations. So they're, they're still operating open for business and to continue to support their customers. And, and they're one of the organizations behind this webinar tonight, uh, along with LKC, the manufacturers of the, the RET eval. And, and I just want to thank them for going ahead with this tonight. You know, the, the thought is, well, do you, do, you, do you do a show like this tonight? The, the world is, is just so topsy-turvy right now. Do we go ahead and do it? Um, and the fact that they decided to go ahead with it is, is really gratifying to me because, again, it, it speaks to a sense of normalcy that we're trying to give everyone here tonight. And just one other minor thing, just, you know, not to be too Pollyanna, but as I'm sitting here in my home office where I've actually been trapped for the last week, <laughs> haven't left the house, looking across my desk, and I see on the wall behind me my grandfather's medals from World War I up on the wall. And every time I look at it, I sort of think about what was going through his head back then during the war when the world must have seemed like it was falling apart um, and then to be shortly followed you know, by the, the Spanish flu. Um, so even though I'm sure back then it felt like the world was falling apart, obviously things still continued and it was just a temporary blip. So no matter how crazy things are, just remember it's all a temporary blip and we're gonna get past it. 
Um, and that's why, you know, having shows like this are, are so, so important and fun. So thanks everyone for being here. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, let me just give you the ground rules. On the right side of the screen, you'll see a box that says questions. Uh, if you type a question in there, uh, at the end of the show, once the presentation's over, uh, I'll verbally ask our speaker tonight um, the questions, and then we'll have a little back and forth and a Q&A. So feel free to ask whatever you want in that question box. So with all that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. So Dr. Craig Thomas, I think is well known to, to just about everyone who's here tonight. Um, he's a private practitioner. He's been in practice uh, for over 30 years in Dallas. And what's really special about Craig is that he keeps on the cutting edge for his patients. He always keeps up with the latest science and the latest technologies that are made available. And tonight, he's gonna to talk to us all about how he's added ERG and VEP testing uh, to his practice and how you can do it too. We're gonna to discuss the clinical aspects and even some of the practice management aspects of it. So with that said, why don't I turn it over to Craig? So Craig, thanks so much for being here uh, tonight. You're welcome, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, you know. Everybody that's a, a regular uh, poster or, or lurker on OD Wire, you know, probably has heard me and and all the good and bad that that goes with hearing me. Uh, sometimes good clinical, sometimes good political, sometimes bad political. Uh, but I always circle back, no matter how bad our our disagreements are on the website, that we all are optometrists. I've said that a hundred times over the past ten years, uh, and just like when people are against us when we have fights with ophthalmology and and all of our our other uh, uh adversaries we're all in it together uh that's why i've always i always said optometrists are my friends i said uh when i'm attacked when my livelihood is in jeopardy uh when my profession is being challenged when my my, my integrity my credibility is being being challenged for no reason uh the people that are standing next to me are optometrists and it's always been that way I've been practicing 36 years. Uh, and it's always been that way. And it's probably, hopefully, always going to be that way. Uh, so we're all in this weird time together. It is pretty weird. I got to tell you, I've never seen anything like this in 36 years. Uh, we are under sh uh, a shelter in place here in Dallas, Texas. And we started sheltering in place uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, everybody knows that I stay pretty busy. Uh, I saw three patients today, uh, urgent patients, essential care. I think that's the term. Uh, I saw seven yesterday. I have two scheduled for tomorrow, and we're closing Friday. Uh, so I mean, to to go from you know slamming and bamming and and all of the stuff that I'm I used to do all, every day and have fun, and to what we've got right now, it's quite a change. And and uh, I guess there's only the only solace is I'm not alone. So, so I, I want to welcome everybody here because we we are in this together. And and the, the concept I'd like to have going forward, trying to be positive, because I am positive. Uh, you know, in my 36 years, even though I've never seen anything like this, I don't expect this to last. And I base that on my 36 years. Uh, you know, my experience counts for something, and, and I don't think this is going to last. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be a month or two, maybe, I'm hoping. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a week or two. Uh, you know, we're all looking for a long, dry spell is what I'm afraid of. Uh, you know, we all have different situations and we can deal with it differently. Uh, you know, most of us are going to get through it okay. A few of us may not, but, you know, we'll come out on the end. You know, I don't know, happier or stronger or any of that stuff, but we'll come out on the end and, and we'll get back to seeing patients. And, and we're going to be practicing optometrists just like we all were two or three weeks ago. Uh, this is not going to last. Uh, what, I, what I'd like everybody to try to concentrate on is is how are we going to practice once we all start practicing again? You know, there's people listening tonight that are not practicing just like me. Okay, I'm not going to practice for two or three weeks. Okay, it's fine. Uh, if I don't, if I can't practice for a month, I'm not going to be happy about it. Uh, you know, but I don't, I can't control it. But I'm going to be practicing again, uh, and, and I'm going to be practicing this summer. You know, I mean, I'm going to be practicing. Uh, so, so what I'd like to do is, you know, as we go forward. And we're talking about how do you want to practice on the other side? How, you know, how do you want to practice post outbreak? Uh, do you want to try to differentiate yourself? Do you want to try to be special? Do you want to get ultra competitive? Do you want to try to take advantage of, of guys and ladies that have uh, been wounded by this? I mean, I, I don't want to be mercenary, uh, but, you know, they're just like the restaurants and everything else. There'll be a few people that may not survive this ordeal. Uh, and those patients are going to have to go somewhere. 
uh, and they may be looking for someone with some advanced technology. Uh, and, and you know, I'm telling you, it might make a difference. So let's get into it, okay? Let's let's talk about going with the electrodiagnostic flow after we get out of this outbreak, okay? <laughs> so we put signs on the door. We posted new hours. We're open nine to four now instead of crack of dawn till till nightfall. And so we call it the outbreak hours. That's we so we we kind of our outbreak hours. So we're going to get out of this outbreak and go with the electrodiagnostic flow. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to primarily talk about some electroretinography. And I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've been lecturing on electroretinography since 2011. Uh, I was the first optometrist in the state of Texas to perform any electrodiagnostic procedures. Me and my buddy Joe Deloach had to get Medicare to turn the code on and get it approved for optometrists. So I, I'm pretty familiar and intimate and experienced with all kind of electrodiagnostic stuff uh, being performed by optometrists, and in particular in the state of Texas. Uh, so I was, you know, I'm, I'm the alpha. Uh, so I know what I'm talking about, and I've been doing it a long time. Uh, you know, the, in the beginning when we started talking about about uh, uh, electrodiagnostics, and I would I would always start my lectures uh, with this kind of joke. Y'all know I'm kind of funny sometimes, and I would I would say, you know, I am now a clinical neurophysiologist. You know, and I would strut around and, and poke my chest out and kind of, you know, you know how it could be. And I was like, yeah, yeah my mom was so proud of me. She's, she's got an optometrist and a clinical neurophysiologist all in one. And she's so proud. And, and when you start performing this testing in your optometric practice, in addition to being an optometrist, you're going to turn yourself into a clinical neurophysiologist. And what you're trying to do is the things you see on the slide. I'm not going to read slides to you. Y'all can read while I'm talking. You see the two things, what, what we're doing here with the ERG. It's getting a loss of retinal function and trying to differentiate or distinguish between retinal and optic nerve lesions. That's the big thing. And, and the big thing on the newer technologies that we're getting ready to talk about, like this handheld read, read eval device, is all the different protocols, the different test protocols that you can do with this very small device, uh, different than the earlier first generation. I consider this technology second generation technology. That, that's how I look at it. So this is what I'm talking about. This thing is so cool. Uh, I've had mine for about three years. I gotta tell you, I mean, I, you know, I, I, y'all know how I am. Again, I hate to say it, but I, I'm like a kid at Toys R Us. I've got every machine that you could get, every, everything that'll generate a code, I've got it in here. I, I, I'm on my third electrodiagnostic device. Okay, this thing is the bomb. Uh, you see how cool it looks. It, you know, it's this real small, portable, handheld. You go from room to room with it. It is really, really slick, really slick. So it's called Red Eval. And, and I'm gonna go back real fast. So you see the Red Eval. And, and when I first started doing electrodiagnostic stuff, you know, back in 2011, 2012, we were doing mostly PERGs, the pattern electroretinogram, primarily for uh, glaucoma indications, glaucoma suspects, stuff like that. Uh, and, and so the, the PERG was the, the primary ERG that we used to do, or that I used to do. Uh, and, and this light adapted, these flicker and flash ERGs, that was not something that I was into in the beginning of my electrodiagnostic journey. As the technologies evolved and we're into second generation technology, uh, now you've got stuff with more, more testing protocols. So again, you've got multiple ERG protocols and some VEP stuff. We'll talk about it just a little bit. This is, this is mostly an ERG kind of presentation, but this handheld device will do both tests. It'll do an ERG and a VEP, one back to back without unhooking them or new electrodes or anything. It is so cool. It is really slick. So let's keep going. So. The big thing now that the, the, the most, there's two big things, I, you know, I don't know if one's bigger than the other. The first big thing is what's called the photopic negative response. That's kind of a new thing. It's, it's new in the literature. It's been out, the, the information talking about this has been out, in, you know, three, four, five years. Uh, you know, I started looking at stuff back in 2010, 2011, 2012, and I don't remember seeing this, this photopic negative response thing until just a few years ago. And you see my, my reference article is dated 2018. I always try to keep, keep current with stuff. I mean, these are the ICEF articles, the protocols. I mean, this is modern, real science. It's not just me making it up. It's not Conan trying to sell machines. You know, this is from the, from the guys that make up all the rules. So, the, so this photopic negative response is a, a new thing where it provides information about the, the innermost retinal layers, the, the function of the innermost retinal layers, the ganglion cells and their axons. So we're going to, you know, you got to kind of get that, that 
term in your head, photopic negative response, okay? Now, in addition to that photopic negative response, uh, the, 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 more, the more traditional, if you could say traditional, about a device that's only a few years old, but the, the, the initial testing that we did mostly with this device was these flicker tests and, and these flash ERGs. Uh, and you see an example of what the output looks like here. Uh, this is just one of my patients. Uh, I, I took the name off. You see, this is a pretty normal looking one. Everything is color coded. You know, green is good, red is bad, yellow is suspicious. Uh, so even without, you know, I, I can't give you a lesson really on interpretation in this short time frame, but you see everything is green. Uh, so without knowing what you're looking at, hey, green is good, red is bad. Uh, so this is a relatively normal uh, ERG waveform. Uh, on this particular patient. So I just wanted to show you what a normal one looked like. And you guys, again, can see the little bullets off to the side. You know, when we're doing a test like this, I want to get information about these cone bipolar cells. Uh, you know, in, you go back, that's why I put this slide up here, you know, a little bit of, of retinal anatomy and neuroanatomy kind of coming into play, all the, the, the layers of the retina forming these retinal cortical pathways going through the visual pathways of the brain back to the visual cortex. You gotta, you gotta feel that neuroanatomy a little tiny bit for all this stuff to kind of fold in and make sense. So I just wanted to give that little review there. Uh, you know, and we all had a, an electrodiagnostic class. Uh, I don't, you know, this is a nationwide lecture, so I can't harp on going to U of H, but anybody that went to University of Houston, you know, we were down there in the dungeon with Dr. Walters, you know, hooking up people and sticking contacts in their eyes with wires in them and taking three hours to do a test. It was outrageous. It was, it was, it was comical. Uh, and and I, while we were doing it, it nobody, it was, it was so ridiculous that while we were learning about electrodiagnostic technology, everybody looked at each other and realized that we would never be doing this again for the rest of our lives. And then once we got out of this room, once we got out of the dungeon at U of H, we would never touch a piece of electrodiagnostic technology again. And that's exactly what happened until 2011. I got out of school in 1983. Okay, so so this we we've moved up a notch here. So let me I digress. Let's keep going. So you see what the what the the flicker and the flash uh, testing is based on, and and the parts of the retina uh, that you're evaluating with this test. So that kind of just a hopefully a refresher for those of us that remember all of our electrodiagnostics. So again, another. Uh, just a picture of the device being used. So again, the thing is, uh, the thing, the device, the device is called the RET eval. You see it there. Uh, it's made by this company called LKC. Uh, they seem to know what they're doing. It's real lightweight. It's not heavy. Uh, it's got a real short test time. Uh, from the time that, that, that you start washing the lady's face with a lid scrub and putting the little electro strips on there and holding a thing up and saying, look at the light, uh, until you're finished and putting it up on my computer screen, it's like five minutes. I, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, you know, I I, I kind of would tell people 10 minutes start to finish, but 10 minutes is, is five minutes to me talking uh, and then five minutes of the technician doing the work. Uh, so the test time is five minutes, you know, kind of start to finish, just get the thing set up and telling the patient what's going on. You know, you might have a 10 minute run, but but actually the technician time doing it and, and, and displaying the info, it's five minutes. Uh, there's absolutely no discomfort. And you see the little electrode strip there, uh, you know, without me being doing any kind of comparative analysis, uh, these just, just suffice it to say, these strips are less expensive than competitive strips. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. So this thing's not real expensive to use. Uh, so this is what it looks like when it's being used real quick, real easy. Okay, so now let's keep going. Let's, let's get into the, to, to some meat and potatoes here. Okay, so let's talk about some, some cases. You know, the best way to learn to me it's just talking about real patients being treated by a real optometrist that's practicing modern optometry and still and working in 2020. Okay, that's the best information. So that's what you get ready to get. So this guy here is, and, and this is, you know, with new stuff. So I'll talk about this new device. You know, it's new, new if you don't have one. I mean, I've had mine three years. Uh, you know, so I'm talking about this new device. So to, to introduce it and kind of show you what it does and, and what it's capable of, it's, I think it's best to just use a demonstration case as opposed to some case where you got to really figure stuff out and, and you're, you're you know, really scratching your head and got to have the patient come back three or four times to make a decision. Okay, we're not going to do none of that. So this is, a, this is a demonstration case. This is like we're in fifth grade and you're the science fair judge. And somebody made a volcano out of vinegar and baking soda. Okay, okay, we demonstrate a, a known physical property. Okay, that's what that's not. We're not really experimenting. So this ain't no experiment. I'm just going to show you 
how everything blends together and how it works and the value of it, you know, why you would want to do it and what does it add to the mix? You know, why, why, why would you be adding ERG technology to your practice? Okay, the, the, let me show you why. So, so this guy here, this is one of our regular guys. I got a thousand of them. They just keep coming in. I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, so this guy comes in and he's 61 years old now. I saw him two weeks ago. Uh, you'll see the printouts in a moment. So I saw this guy, he comes in for, for uh, regular, I think it was a six month glaucoma check. I couldn't remember. Uh, but I saw him two weeks ago and, and uh, we had already started talking, me and, and Adam Farkas about doing this webinar. And I always, I never want to repeat stuff. I always want to use new stuff, no matter what. Every presentation is different. So as soon as he said, hey, man, let's do this webinar. Okay, I'm thinking, okay, he's telling me Monday, let's do the webinar. So on Tuesday, I'm like, okay, what patient can I find to do the webinar on? I don't want any, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get some fresh, fresh fresh blood. So this guy was like the first, the first guy there after I decided to do the webinar. And of course, he was perfect. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. So you got a 61-year-old guy. He's, he was, he's 61 now. I first saw this guy eight years ago. So he was 53 then. He's like a minus six. Uh, he works at UPS and he wears contacts. You know, he's, he's he unloads the trucks and all that stuff. He doesn't like wearing glasses. And when he came in for his first visit uh, back eight years ago, his pressures were 18 in the right eye and 31 in the left. Um, and for any of us listening tonight, that would be sufficient to, to raise some level of suspicion, <coughs> excuse me, and you would think that the guy either is developing glaucoma or has glaucoma. Excuse me. So that's certainly what I thought. And, and I, you know, I mean, y'all know me. I mean, you know, I, I never met a glaucoma I didn't like. So I'm thinking this guy glau has glaucoma. And I performed a series of, of diagnostic tests. Uh, and I determined that he actually did indeed have glaucoma. Uh, we don't have the time for me to review all that stuff and, and go back to the beginning eight years ago and start flashing stuff. But I did want to show you a couple of things. Uh, here's a, 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 an OCT retinal image of this patient in 2016. So this is several years after I had initiated treatment. Uh, he was kind of spotty with his compliance. You know, I'd, he'd come in, you know, pressure would be 22, 23 in that, that bad left eye. You know, and, and I'd had him as high as 37, 38 sometimes uh, when he wouldn't use his drops. So this is what he looked like uh, in 2016. Kind of interesting on this OCT printout, and this will all blend in together in here in just a moment. Uh, you can see, you know, kind of the, this is a, a Cirrus 400 OCT. Uh, I bought it new. I mean, it's a really cool machine. I mean, I like it. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, it's wrapped up in bubble wrap in my garage right now. But last year, when this, and when this guy came in, when this guy came in in 2016, that was my primary OCT. And, and I made all my decisions based on it, and I had no problem with it. Uh, you can see the deep cups. You can see the statistical analysis. Uh, you know, this guy has glaucoma. Okay, so you see what it looks like there in 2016. So he comes back. He's a good patient. He comes every six months, pretty much. So when he comes back, uh, I've got this brand new, that brand, I've had it now two years. Uh, I've got this, this OptiView, uh, AngioView, the, the OCTA with the angiography, and it is superior technology. It is simply superior. Uh, I circled the date here so we can see that I am discussing current patients with current information and current technology. So this guy was here on March the 10th. That's when I obtained this scan. It's two weeks ago. It's two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, you see the statistical analysis. It doesn't look terrible. It's not like he's going blind. Uh, this is a combination printout where you get the optic nerve head analysis, retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. You get your Tisnet curve profile over here. And you've got a ganglion cell uh, analysis, not the full deal. Uh, I'm just trying to save space and not have three or four slides. But you see this little, little tongue of atrophy kind of scooting in on, on the ganglion cell analysis complex uh, printout. That's kind of kind of interesting and look how it's symmetrical. So here, uh, you know, we've got an OCT from, you know, almost four years ago. Uh, here you've got an OCT from two weeks ago. Uh, to me, you know, pretty symmetrical on the ganglion cell and you know, pretty, the, the left eye is showing a little bit more damage on the nerve fiber right here. You see it's in the red code. So, you know, it, it's showing that the left eye is a little tiny bit worse, but not a big difference, not, not a whole lot. And remember, when I first saw this guy, 
excuse me, he had extreme asymmetry. You know, like one eye's 18, the other eye's 31. Okay, I mean that's extreme asymmetry. To me, a 99.5% ch chance of having glaucoma when you present like that. And clearly, you know, the, the the condition is starting in the left eye before it crosses over and goes to the right eye. So I've got my my OCT scans on this guy. And I'm an optometrist. I'm a regular optometrist. I'm just like everybody listening. Okay, the next test, almost always, is going to be a threshold visual field. You know, when you've got a patient that, that you either think has glaucoma or, or that you know has glaucoma. So, again, I, I, I did a visual field on the guy. You see the date up here at the top, 3-10-2020. So, it's all done on the same day. Uh, you, you see the visual field, the left eye. He's actually on his mean deviation. is still showing a positive, although somewhat decreased reliability. I mean, I, you could, I could see he's not going blind. Uh, it seems like he kind of snapped to attention here when he did the left eye, uh, much more reliable. But you see on the left eye, uh, you've got your glaucoma hemifield test uh, showing within normal limits. So again, no severe damage. But here, your mean deviation, this minus 0.41 decibels compared to here, a plus number, I would say that that's clinically significant asymmetry where one eye is a positive number on the mean deviation and the decibels in the others are negative. It's not a big difference, but it's different. And, and, it, and it correlates with the initial presentation with the left eye having a much, much higher uh, intraocular pressure. So again, I already know this guy has glaucoma. Uh, you know, I'm performing diagnostic testing on him not to see if he has glaucoma, I'm trying to see, is it changing? Is it getting worse? Are, is the, are we under good control? Are we under borderline control? Or is the glaucoma uncontrolled? And I need to make a decision and change his treatment program. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm gathering information to try to see, is this patient's glaucoma under good control, borderline control, or uncontrolled? I've got to make that differentiation and that assessment. And I use these tests to make that decision and, and I, in an ideal situation, and fortunately, this is an ideal situation, I've got previous test results to compare to where I could make an accurate and informed assessment. Yes, this guy's staying the same. Yes, this guy's getting better. Yes, this guy's getting worse. And I would blend all these test results to make that decision. So this visual field is essentially like the one that he did the year before. So based on the visual field test, <clears throat> I'd say that, that his glaucoma is under good control. So I keep going, and this was kind of weird. Uh, you know, I went ahead, once I decided to use this patient as my, my example on the presentation, you know, I told my staff, I said, all right, get, get, get all the diagnostic tests on what every piece of information we can gather. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily uh, need to make decisions with it. I, want to, I just kind of want to see what this guy's like. Uh, and I did a test that I had not done on him before because I didn't need the information to make a decision on him when he came in with the, with the 18 and the 31. And so I decided to check the guy's color vision and these are the results. And so again, I, once I make the decision to, to order some diagnostic testing, I usually you know, exit the building and let my staff take over. And then I come back in where they're finished and all the stuff is flashed up on a big flat screen. And so I walked in the room and I looked at these color vision test results and I turned to my patient. I said, hey man, are you colorblind? He goes, yeah, I can't see a lick. I said, yeah, you can't, you got nothing. He says, oh, man, it's been like that my whole life. I said, why do you tell me that? He says, you never asked me. I said, I've been seeing you for eight years. You never told me you were colorblind. He said, you never asked me. I said, okay, that's my bad. Okay, won't happen again. My bad. Uh, so this is what it looks like when your glaucoma patient has a congenital red cream color vision abnormality. You see how it's almost identical in each eye. This is not some kind of acquired defect. I've seen a thousand of those. This is what it looks like when the guy's born with the, the traditional color vision deficiency that we all learn about in school, uh, where it's like, you know, 6.5 or 7% of, of all white males. Well, it's like 3.2% of black males and like 3.1% of, of Asian males. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, those are the numbers. So every once in a while, you're not going to be able to use color vision in, in your decision making. Uh, and this was an example of that. So I kept going. And of course, since we're talking about ERG testing, uh, I said, hey, uh, you know, I certainly want to get an ERG on this patient. Let me see what, what his retinal function looks like. Uh, and this is his, his test that was done again on March 10th, 2020. Uh, this is almost a perfect teaching ERG because you see 
the right eye is perfectly normal. And again, I'm not going to go through the interpretation that we, we could do that on the next seminar or, or, or webinar. Uh, but again, green is good. So all the waveform shape is normal. The, the, the peak time and amplitudes are normal. The photopic negative response measures down here are all normal. So the, the ERG response, the photopic negative response on this patient's right eye is normal you see clearly the left eye is abnormal and it's abnormal in two or three different ways and it only takes one way to be abnormal but it's abnormal in two or three different ways. yeah the first thing is the shape of the waveform and and the shape of the waveform this is called waveform perturbation so it's disturbed he ain't happy this waveform ain't happy he's not happy he's perturbed and so you got waveform perturbation compared to the normal waveform shape that you would have in a person with a normal photopic negative response, like it, like it looks like here. So you got waveform per perturbation. And the first thing here, the, the peak time, or what's called implicit time, you can go either way, uh, the, the peak time is, is not in the range. All these numbers is abnormal. It's, it's just not normal, okay? Uh, so here you have clinically significant asymmetry. And on this particular patient, it's not for everybody, everybody's different, but on this particular patient, which is why I used him, everything matches. So you see how the eye that should have more damage, because when I saw this guy eight years ago and the pressure was 18 in the right eye and 31 in the left, okay, the glaucoma started in the left eye. The left eye should have more damage. Okay, you could see a little tiny bit of it on the visual field, just a little tiny bit. Uh, you can't see none of it on the color vision because because he doesn't have any color vision. You can't really see it on the OCTs. You know, not really. You can't, you know, here the, the left eye doesn't look a lot. The, the right eye looks worse on this one, okay, if anything. Uh, here the left eye is a little worse, but only by a few microns on that inferior uh, section. Uh, you know, the visual field, I mean, it, you know, it's a little tiny bit different. Uh, but on this guy, the ERG is like night and day. The, the ERG is the most sensitive test on this particular guy if you're trying to see is one eye better than the other and maybe if one eye is changing. You know, to now I know that this right eye is perfect. If I see any change on this right eye going forward, I know that my glaucoma is out of control. That is the correct term. My glaucoma is uncontrolled and I would need to get more aggressive with the treatment. So I, I will use, not can use, I will use the ERG test results on this patient going forward to make medical decisions. I'm not doing it to make money. I'm doing it to make decisions. You see how valuable it is and how I could get so much information here. Ordinarily, I'd get a lot of information there. Okay, on this guy, I couldn't get any information there. I got to get it another way. I could be dependent on this visual field test, but it's got low reliability. Uh, I, got, I got the best OCT in the world, and it's telling me that the eyes are almost the same. Okay, you know, I, I, I gotta, I can't go with just one test. I gotta look at three, four, five different things and blend it all together to make a decision. That's the best way to practice to me. And when you do it like that, this is what it looks like. So, you know, we, how, you do, how do you report this stuff? Again, you know, I'm not reporting this tomorrow because I got two patients scheduled, but in two months, this guy's coming back, okay? <laughs> and, and we all got to get this thing up and running two months from now or six weeks from now, or eight weeks from now, whatever, okay, it's coming back. And, and when it comes back, this is how you do it. So, you know, this is this is this guy's visit. And, and again, I, I'm not trying to uh, you know, boast or brag or this or that. I, this, I just want to show you how I do it, okay? The people still don't understand. I give lectures pretty regular, uh, whether it's clinical lectures, practice management lectures, billing and coding lectures. I did two consultations this month before the virus broke out. And and I, I'll go to an office where the guy's making $2 million a year and, and the, the, the billing and coding clerk will come up to me and because they always say, Craig, I want you to talk to my, my insurance my insurance person. I goes, yeah, sure. And, and like two minutes into the conversation, every time, every time, it's like, well, okay, now I, I know we can't do this with this and, and I know we can't do that with that. And, and I know I could do a OCT if I stand on my head and it's Monday morning and then I could do a color vision on Tuesday afternoon if it's dark early. And they start going through all these rules and, and these modifiers that don't matter. I'm like, what are you talking about? Stop it, okay? Stop it. And I, I mean, the most common thing I say when I go visit these offices and talk to the insurance person is I say, stop it, 
okay? Everybody's fixated on what we can't do and this don't go with that and this doesn't mix with that. I'm like, stop it, okay? That we can do whatever we want. <laughs> I'm getting ready to show you. Almost always, we can do whatever we want. Uh, anytime you want, for whatever reason you want, as long as it's reasonable and medically necessary. And we should stop with the scare stuff on the billing and coding and just do what needs to be done to figure out what's wrong with the patient. You know, this is what I did for this guy's visit. You see the visit. You see the numbers, okay? The only thing that's of any, <coughs> excuse me, significance, y'all got me excited. The only thing that any significance on here is that on occasion, and it's primarily some of the Medicare carriers, but, you know, just to be aware of it, I just put it here as an educational tidbit. You know, on occasion, you'll have some of these uh, insurance carriers where they will state clearly that they do not want you to use electroretinography or VEP testing, any electrodiagnostic stuff, in the diagnosis and treatment of patients with glaucoma. Uh, it's a lot of room for abuse. Guys have messed it up, doing a thousand scans a, a, a year. You know, so so the insurance companies got tired of paying for it, and they put a bunch of rules on it the past two three years. And so they say, hey, you know, you don't need to use an ERG to determine if a guy has glaucoma. All right, well, if that particular insurance company says that, and some do, some don't, you have to check your own local rules. This is a, a nationwide, you know, presentation. But I I, I went ahead and <coughs> excuse me, I checked the uh, Texas's rules, and in Texas, you would do it like this, where if they say, you know, if you look up the LCD for, for electroretinography, and if it says, hey, we don't want you to use this stuff for glaucoma, okay, then don't. Uh, but if it says, hey, glaucoma to optic atrophy is on the covered diagnosis list, which is always is, uh, then, then that's the code that would be most appropriate. Because if you remember back at the beginning, the very first slide, what's the reason of an ERG? So you're trying to see, is there a loss of retinal function, number one, and if there's a loss of function, is the function primarily in the retina or is it primarily an optic nerve? So if you've got a person that can't see right or has got an abnormal OCT or whatever, some kind of optic atrophy, is it optic atrophy caused by glaucoma or is it optic atrophy caused by something else? You know, that's where you got to play doctor and figure that out. Uh, so, you know, this particular one, this is how you would report the service. Let's keep going. We're doing good. All right, number two. Here we are, number two, number two. I'm going to talk about some subclinical diabetic retinopathy. Y'all know that's a big thing with me. I've been talking about this for a couple of years. People are going to start learning eventually. I've got some people that's been learning, uh, you know, but but we got to keep going. And still people don't understand this stuff. It's like the, like the insurance clerks don't understand how to file optometric services and they're making it harder than it needs to be. Uh, we still got a bunch of optometrists not understanding this subclinical diabetic retinopathy thing. Okay, so we're gonna keep we're gonna talk about that. So what you got with the with the subclinical diabetic retinopathy is basically retinopathy you cannot see with an ophthalmoscope. That's the basic definition of it. Okay, so you look inside, you dilate them up, you're trying to see if there's something wrong with them, and you don't see nothing. They look fine. Okay, they look fine. So that's that's it. but they're not fine. There's something wrong with them. You just haven't looked the right way. Uh, so that's what's called subclinical diabetic retinopathy. Okay, and most importantly. Most importantly, for the, to the, the concept of this lecture, when this, when this happens, and, and, and people with diabetes, uh, when, you, when they get the diabetes, you get this, this relationship where the, the, you get neurodegeneration, and I can't really give a, a whole lecture on neurodegeneration. I'm supposed to be writing an article on it, but you get neurodegeneration that's caused by the diabetes, and, and neurodegeneration, like an example of that would be like people getting tingling in their fingers and toes. Where the, where the nerve endings, the peripheral nerve endings are all damaged and they get that, that tingling in their fingers and toes. Okay, that's, that's a clinical sign of, of neurodegeneration. Uh, so if you got peripheral neurodegeneration, you probably got you some central neurodegeneration up in your brain and your optic nerve and your retina. So they kind of go together. So I always kind of broach the subject with my patients like that. <clears throat> so anybody that's got tingling in their, in their fingers and toes because of their diabetes, man, they absolutely got some subclinical retinal neurodegeneration uh, whether they look normal or not, that's the I'm I'm working on that premise going forward. So let's let's jump into the subclinical diabetic retinopathy. So here's here's patient number two. There's another again, always my real patients. Uh, so this is a picture of this guy in 2016. Uh, so 58 year old black guy. He's diabetic. He, I, I'm sorry. He's a person with diabetes. I should. He, he is a person with diabetes. He is not diabetic. So he's a person with diabetes, and he treats it with oral meds. Uh, and he's a knucklehead. He don't, he's not even trying. I mean, this guy's big as a house. He's, he's got, you can put a beer can on his stomach. It's that kind of thing. 
Uh, so he probably weighed about 280, 285, maybe 5'11". You know, you know I, I said, are you exercising? He just laughed at me. I said, I'm serious. He said, no, I don't exercise. OK, all right, since you're serious. So he's, he's one of those kind of patients. I said, can you see? OK, he says, I see fine. Uh, you know, I'm here because my, my medical doctor makes me come once a year. You know, I'm like, OK, all right, <laughs> you know, I'll take care of you. So I had, uh, if you look at him, <clears throat> you see that in this 2016 picture, if you go way up here at the top, right above the macula, see the little three yellow dots, you know, the little tiny exudate. OK, so to me, he had some mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy that I detected with ophthalmoscopy back in 2016. And I took a picture of it. OK, y'all see it there. Now, what's most important on this guy, besides his fundus looking pretty normal, is that <clears throat> he had 20-25 best corrected vision. So I could not get him to 2020, and, and really not a good 2025. Uh, you know, and I didn't see any real corny opacity and lenticular loss of transparency. He looked fine, you know. So I'm thinking, hey, how come this guy can't see? So you know, you know how I practice optometry. I launch. I mean, I go head first. I mean, feet first, head first, both feet. Fist. I got a fist up. I am doing a functional vision assessment on this patient, and I'm going to figure out <clears throat> how come he can't see. Because it's because to me, a 60, a 58 year old man, he should have 20 20, unless I can explain otherwise. Okay, this ain't normal. It ain't close to being normal. Anybody says that's normal, they're crazy. Okay, it's not normal. So you got 20 25 minus vision in a person with clear media. Okay, they taught us in optometry school that wasn't normal. All right, so I don't think that's normal. So I'm gonna try to figure out how come that ain't normal, and I'm gonna run a bunch of tests on it. And I'm gonna do a refraction with a $200 retina scope, I'm gonna do some fields. I had the ret eval here back in 2017 so this wasn't a 2000 all this stuff is in 2017 where this uh th this first image was 2016. so you see this guy's uh, erg findings back in 2017. you got a real normal waveform uh you got normal implicit times this was a normal thing slight color vision defect uh some kind of you know goofy visual feels kind of non-specific so i told him hey you know I, I got some normal test results and some abnormal test results. Uh, I don't think we need to treat anything. There's no focal local treatment for this. We're not going to give you a shot. No anti VGF, no steroids, no no pred forte, no none of that. Okay, we, I, the the treatment is to get healthier. You big big person, you. And that's and that's what I tried to tell him. And again, he just he wasn't hearing it. He didn't want to hear it. And it was really frustrating. I remember the guy's funny. And I was like, hey, man, you know, you're killing yourself. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I, you know, my daddy died when he was 60. I'm already ahead of that. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's a bad attitude. Uh, so this guy was hard to, to try to, you know, motivate. Uh, but I, I did the best I could. So you see these little bullets here talking about this neurodegenerative uh, form of the disease. So when you get this, this retinal neurodegeneration, it's, it's a, a, a loss of the ganglion cell, the nerve fiber layer, the photoreceptors, and it's called <clears throat> RDN, retinal diabetic neuropathy, okay? You got it. That's a new thing, but it's not really new. It's been around about eight, nine years. So retinal diabetic neuropathy, that's, that's like when you got thing, the tingling in your fingers and your toes, except it's in your retina. So this is the workup I did on the guy back then. Now, <clears throat> let's fast forward. Okay, why are we talking about this guy? So here we are, same guy. This is last summer, so 2019. So you see, I took some nice pictures here. Uh, I took these pictures with that, uh, that uh, uh, Nexi robotic camera. You just hit a button and step away. It's step away from the vehicle. It's pretty cool. So you see, you know, pretty decent images. You see no obvious retinopathy. There's certainly no, no vasculopathy like microaneurysms, dot blot hemorrhages. Uh, you know, there's no vascular beating. There's, you don't see nothing. Uh, there's, there's no areas of obvious ischemia. Uh, you know, no areas of obvious edema. Uh, and, and the guy had the same best corrected 2025 minus acuity in each eye on this visit in 2019 last year. So this is what he looked like. And, and if this guy was in your office, I would submit that every optometrist listening here tonight would fill out the little forms that they make us fill out, and you would check off the very top box where it says no apparent retinopathy. That's what you would check off. You would say, you know, this little yellow thing here, I wouldn't call that nothing. Uh, so I'd say no apparent retinopathy. All right, so I know that this guy <clears throat> has some problems because he can't see clear, and I've already done a workup on him. So I know what's wrong with him. And again, this is a demonstration kind of thing. So here is what 
retinal diabetic neuropathy looks like on an OCT scan of the macula. And so you see the retina is too thin. The, 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 the mechanism is theorized that the, the retina is ischemic, so you got poor blood flow. Uh, as the old people would say, you got post circulation. They got post circulation. So the, the, the poor blood flow uh, just messes up the tissue, and the tissue starts to die. And as the tissue dies, it, it shrinks, it, it goes down. And so the retina is not as thick. And so what you see is retinal thinning, significant thinning of the nerve fiber layer. And on a Cirrus 400 OCT, it looks like this, and it looks like this, okay? Now, on this particular day last summer, this was before I wrapped up this bad boy in bubble wrap and put it in the garage. I actually had both OCTs sitting in the same room side by side, and I acquired images on this patient on the same day side by side. That's why I kind of used this guy, <clears throat> because I, I, you know, I, ordinarily I would use somebody I saw last week. But this guy, where I happened to have the OCT scans from two different technologies on the same day, I thought that was pretty cool. So here's what it looks like on that, that uh, OptoView, AngioView OCT. And so it's it, here, the, the thinning is represented by this dark purple. So these this this met is too thin. You see the shape is kind of okay. You've got some uh, vitreomacular adhesion right there. That's, you know, not clinically significant. So the foveal depression and everything is still there, you know, both eyes. So on, the, on a first glance, it would look like it's okay. Well, that's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that guy. But if you look at it real close, you can see like this hump is a little higher than that one. And, and same thing here. But the most important thing is just look at the numbers and the colors and, and the retina is too thin. So this is retinal diabetic neuropathy. The guy's retina is messed up because of his diabetes that he's had for 20 years that he won't take care of. Now, I've documented the retina is too thin. Since I, I went ahead and put this slide in here just for educational purposes, anybody that's getting ready to buy a new OCT, and I think you ought to buy OCT if you don't have one. If you got an old one, get a new one. Uh, this angiography is is the bomb. Okay, I mean it's like top of the line. You just you just can't imagine how how to how practicing optometry is different when you've got access to information like this at your fingertips when you're trying to figure out if somebody got something wrong with them. It's just it's just night and day. It, I just I can't really say it enough. Uh, so so here this is an OCT angiogram uh, of the guy, and again without giving angiography lessons. Uh, the, the, the blood perfusion is low. The tissue is, is not well perfused. Uh, this guy has subclinical diabetic retinopathy in a vascular mode in addition to his subclinical diabetic retinopathy in a neurodegenerative mode. He's got it both ways, even though he looks totally normal. See, he, he looks fine. He looks fine, okay? You would check off no apparent retinopathy. But this guy's retina is real thin, and he's losing his capillary network. Okay, lots of problems there. So he's got lots of structural damage. I wonder if he has any functional loss of vision associated with the structural damage that I just detected with my OCT scans. And on this particular patient, the answer is yes. <clears throat> and you see here, again, everything's in red. Uh, without an interpretation, you can see that it's not normal. The, the, the amplitude is low. The waveforms are, are, are very shallow. And for this guy in particular, where I've got, if we go back, go back to 2017, these test results are for this patient. So this is this patient's ERG scan in May of 2017. <clears throat> and here, and just again, just look at the, the height of the peaks, the shape of the waveform, the the number, the, the the implicit time 32 milliseconds. I think that one's 33 milliseconds. And then you fast forward to a guy whose retina looks exactly the same with ophthalmoscopy, and who's telling you as soon as you ask him that he ain't even trying to stay healthy. He's almost trying to kill himself. He just don't care. And two years later, look how much worse his retinal function is based on this ERG testing. It's incredible, and it's not that the machine is variable. I've had this thing three years. I've done over a thousand of them. The machine is repeatable. You know, it, it's repeatable. Uh, I've done enough of them to say it's repeatable. Uh, you know, most of the time on most people. Uh, I don't think that I did a good one two years ago, and then I did a bad one last summer. His stuff changed. So this ERG test picked up a decrease in visual function 
before the patient noticed it, before it manifested as decreased visual acuity. So this test in this patient is a more sensitive measure of visual function than visual acuity. I kept going like I always do. <clears throat> I did my color vision test and his color vision, and you see the little factoids there about people with diabetes and loss of color vision. Uh, it's really striking. Uh, it's almost a coronavirus kind of, kind of coverage. Uh, if you have diabetes, uh, if you have it long enough, man, it starts to affect your color vision. You just got to have technology sensitive enough to pick it up. You can't be doing no color plates or pulling out some dots with a D15 test. I mean, that's not going to show nothing. You got to have some modern, sophisticated, computer-assisted, cone contrast color vision testing to see if your patient has a loss of color vision in the early stages. Again, if, if, if we're waiting on a D15 or some plates to see if the patient's color vision is normal, it's like wiggling fingers trying to do computation fields as opposed to a threshold visual field test. Okay, they're both tests, but you know they're not the same. So this particular patient has a slight decrease uh, in, in color vision on the right eye. And interestingly, uh, if, if uh, you go back, you know, just I, I saw this when I was preparing it, and I thought it was kind of interesting. When I go back to his first workup, and this is his color vision on that right eye back in 2017, look how it's exactly the same. It almost looks exactly the same. So this test is repeatable. Uh, and his color vision didn't work, get worse. His visual acuity didn't get worse. His retinal appearance did not get worse. His ERG test results got worse because he's getting worse. Uh, and that's simply the first test that indicates it. And I told the guy, I said, hey, man, you're getting worse. You know, you got to wake up and act right or you're going to keep getting worse. And he says, I'll think about it. And I'm like, okay, I'll see you in six months. <laughs> you know, you can't make people do stuff. So what I did, you know, I, I, here's my decision making. Uh, I talked to him about the whole shebang, diet, exercise, medicine. I do nutritional supplementation for people with diabetes. We use the diabetes vision support formula vitamins to try to you know, strengthen the integrity of the blood vessel walls. I showed him all these pictures. You know, I got the big flat screen on the wall. I'm popping all this stuff up. I did the best I could, okay, best I could. And then I reported the services. Here's how I reported the services. So this guy. Uh, he, he, he had hurt his back or something. He was on Medicare. So, I, so he, you know, regular exam. You see the visual field, uh, OCT, color vision, electroretinography. Uh, I've had some people that would say, well, how come you didn't bill for fundus photography? Because the pictures were normal. There's nothing to take a picture of. Uh, so it's, it's not medically necessary to take a picture of a fundus that looks normal. Uh, so in this particular patient, the OCT was much more diagnostic uh, you know, 100 times more information and was the appropriate test to report. Again, there was no way to, to ethically or, or legally report fundus photography. Uh, you see the diagnosis codes uh, for a person that has retinal diabetic neuropathy, where the retina is messed up from diabetes, but it looks normal. OK, there's a code for that. It's called diabetic retinopathy unspecified, E11319. I mean, I use it all the time. Uh, it generates most of the testing. Uh, you know, you've got to kind of pick it up either with your OCT or doing functional tests, but that's the code. Uh, this particular, and you see how I had to change the code. Again, I changed the code so I could get paid, but I'm not breaking any rules. I'm not breaking the law. It's not unethical. So I looked up uh, the, the, our, our Medicare carrier here in Texas, Novitas. I looked up uh, the LCD, the local coverage determination for OCT retinal imaging. Well, because they don't understand the science, uh, they do not have unspecified diabetic retinopathy listed as a covered code. Uh, yeah, it's an oversight on their part. Maybe we'll fix it next year, but right now that code's not in there. Well, if you look at the OCT scans, clearly <clears throat> they demonstrate optic atrophy. It's not primary optic atrophy. Uh, like somebody born with a bad nerve. It's, it's all white when you look in there. So it's an acquired partial optic atrophy. And the code does not demand uh, what, that you determine the etiology. It just demands that you determine that there's optic atrophy. The OCT scan clearly showed there's optic atrophy, the, the loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer, the retinal thinning. So that code is appropriate, ethical, and, and the best code to use if you want to get paid and do it properly. Uh, the color vision. 
if the results are abnormal, uh, I always report the abnormality uh, where, where it's an acquired color vision deficiency. Uh, if it's if the results are normal, and you can report the test if the results are normal, I would simply use the unspecified diabetic retinopathy code, uh, like I did on the ERG test. And in this particular uh, carrier, Novitas, our carrier here in Texas, they have rules and regulations that govern the performance of ERG testing. And I looked them up today just to make sure. Uh, I, I knew it, but I wanted to make sure they hadn't changed it because they change them all the time. And as of today, the unspecified diabetic retinopathy is a covered diagnosis code that will generate an ERG uh, for our Medicare carrier here in Texas and probably most people's Medicare carriers too. Uh, for the people that uh, have their insurance clerks file claims, uh, you would append these modifiers uh, to these procedures since this is the one that generates the most dollars, but Medicare will do that for you automatically. If you don't do it, you'll still get paid. Everything will be the same. So this is how you would report this service or file this claim. You see, again, it's you can do what you want. You can mix and match, you can go here, you can go there, uh, you can do whatever you want. So let's keep going, we're almost done. So now, <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking all day. So I put this slide up here. <laughs> this is a, I've never done this before. This, I, I thought of this like four hours ago. Adam Farkas will tell you, I was, I was working on this thing at four o'clock and this popped in my head. And ordinarily, what you would do here when we're talking about this topic is you would say glaucoma suspect. He's a glaucoma suspect. She's a su he's, she's suspicious. I think she might have some glaucoma. <laughs> okay, the raging glaucoma is coming. So ordinarily, traditionally, most of the time, when we're talking about patients in this category, we're talking about glaucoma suspect. I think they got glaucoma. I kind of want to change that narrative a little bit. This just popped in my head. See what y'all think. I'm thinking now, I'm going to start off primarily I want to see if you are optic atrophy suspect, if you got some kind of optic atrophy. That's what I want to determine. I want to determine, does my patient have optic atrophy? Now, what I know from optometry school is that there's four or five different kinds of optic atrophy. You know, you got primary optic atrophy, consecutive optic atrophy, toxic optic atrophy. Uh, you got optic atrophy from, from myopic degeneration. And of course, uh, you've got optic atrophy from compressive lesions, pituitary tumors, uh, you know, the neoplasm kind of optic atrophy. And last but not least, you've got glaucomatous optic atrophy. So what I want to do is figure out, does my patient have optic atrophy? Yes or no. And if they got some optic atrophy, what kind is it? Is it the glaucomatous kind or is it another kind? And I'm going to run a bunch of tests to figure that out. So you know, think about it. You know, we, we, we've gone all these glaucoma lectures where they teach us, don't fixate on the pressure. Don't worry about the pressure. Glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. It is a neuropathy. Glaucomatous optic neuropathy is the term. If you look at the definition, got nothing to do with intraocular pressure. A skilled, modern, trained optometrist is supposed to be able to pick up an ophthalmoscope, look in the person's eye, examine the optic nerve head and make some basic assessment, does this person have optic atrophy, yes or no? That's what we're supposed to be able to do. Well, we all know that for most of us, the trigger is pressure when we're trying to figure out if somebody has glaucoma. But the more experienced I've got, and I'm real experienced, I got pretty good at looking at somebody's nerve and seeing if the thing looks normal or not. And if it don't look normal, I start ordering a bunch of tests. So, <coughs> excuse me, I don't need the pressure to be 25 to initiate a workup on a glaucoma suspect because there's almost no such thing. He's an optic atrophy suspect, and I'll figure out what kind of optic atrophy he is maybe on the second or third visit. Okay, that's the way I'm looking at it now. And I look at it like that a little bit because of the reporting of the services and trying to, to make a living, take care of my patients, acquire expensive advanced technology, and, and stay in the rules, okay? That's, you got to blend all that together. So a person that, you know, that we'll say glaucoma suspect just because we're used to saying it. So let's say you got a person that's a glaucoma suspect and you, and you make the assessment. Let's say it's, it's, a, it's not based on pressure. You just look in there and the nerve looks funny. And you say, hey, man, your nerve looks funny. Yeah, you, you might be getting glaucoma. Okay, I've done that in my career. I've done it more than once or twice. Uh, and you see the five pictures I put down here to play Jedi mind trick on you. Of course, 
every one of those optic nerve heads is glaucomatous and, and every one of those patients has glaucoma. Okay, and you see they all look different. So I just I just did that to mess with you. <laughs> okay, so here <clears throat> you would do your your exam. You see on the left hand margin the eye exam, the OCT, and so on. To me, that's a standard workup if I think someone has optic atrophy. Okay, now let's say, and I put this this if you see over here these these little asterisks, I put these on here. So to me, this is kind of a standard. I don't want to say cookbook, but this would be a common evaluation in my office for a person that I thought had optic atrophy or had glaucoma. Uh, you know, I'd kind of start with this most of the time. Now, if I could not make a decision on that first visit and I had to go to a second visit, this would be a typical or common second visit. And you see here, I've got these little asterisks. You, you may say, well, why does he have an asterisk there? So let's say that you, you did your exam, you determined that the nerve was funny looking. You did an OCT scan because the nerve was funny looking, and the OCT scan was a little bit off. The ganglion cell complex was off in the in the right eye. Uh, you did a visual field; it was normal. Uh, you did color vision; uh, it was normal. Uh, you did an ERG; it was normal. Okay, you got a funny looking nerve and a, and a and a funny scan, and everything else is okay. Okay, I might sit on that, come back in six months. You know, to me, he don't have glaucoma yet. Uh, the same patient, same test, I do my visual field, my visual field comes out abnormal. I uh, do the color vision, the color vision's okay. Uh, I do my ERG, the ERG is abnormal. So I got a funny looking nerve, a funny scan, uh, unequivocal, that's normal, this is abnormal. To me, if your ERG is abnormal, you got the right to repeat it when you come back for a second visit. If your visual field is abnormal, you got the right to repeat it when you come back for a second visit. If the ERG is abnormal and I'm repeating the ERG on the second visit, now I want a VEP to see what's going on because now I'm curious now. Now I don't know what's happening. So if this is good, I'm done. If that's good, I'm done. If that's good, I'm done. If these are off, I ain't even close to being done. So it's a whole different thing. And until I put this patient on glaucoma medicine, he don't have glaucoma. And, and what I'm putting in the record is partial optic atrophy. Glaucoma could be on my list of differential diagnosis, and maybe on the seven, second or third visit, I'll make that determination. But on the first visit or the second visit, that's optic atrophy. And, and I'll put this in here again for those doctors that are concerned about following the rules using electrodiagnostic testing in the examination and, and diagnosis and treatment of patients with glaucoma or patients that you are suspicious of having glaucoma. Just try to think of those patients as being suspicious for having optic atrophy and not glaucoma because it really is the same thing until you get to the end and you finish. Now, if the, if the patient comes in and the pressure's 35 in each eye, okay, it's probably glaucoma. But that's not normal. And most of the time, you got to work to figure this out. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that electroretinography, to me, has an important place in the evaluation of eye disease. I've tried to explain why and how over the past hour. You see why. Uh, it's part of the functional vision assessment. We're supposed to assess visual function. We're optometrists. That's what we do. I'm real good at it because I use all these machines, and I don't just depend on a person's visual acuity to make some decision on how good their visual function is. I, I do all this stuff, and I roll it together. And this ERG test, depending on the patient, can help me make the decision. Is my patient getting better? Is my patient getting worse? Or is my patient staying the same? And then I make decisions accordingly. As the preachers say, govern yourselves accordingly. So that's how I do it. This is how I've added ERG testing to my practice. The, the handheld device makes it so, so, so easy. And once we all start working again in a few weeks, man, if you want to differentiate your practice, you know, add this technology. If you've got first generation electrodiagnostics, man, upgrade to second generation. Uh, you know, I think I think the government's getting ready to hand us some loan money that we don't have to pay back. I'm gonna try to see if there's any machine I, I need right now. I'm getting ready to go get one of these don't pay back loans and I'm gonna give me some of that stuff. That's what I'm gonna do. So thanks everybody for listening. I know I've talked hard, my, my voice is kind of hoarse. I've been talking all day, uh, but I, I, I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed giving this information out. I'm glad you guys took the time to listen tonight. Uh, I think we're going to hang around for a couple of minutes. If anybody's got any questions, uh, Adam's going to facilitate and, and uh, I will stand by 
And for those guys that have to bug out or don't ask questions, I'll see you on OD Wire in the days coming forward. All right. Well, well, Craig, thank you so much for this. That was really great. And uh, we do have a few questions. So we have a few minutes here so we can uh, answer some of them. Um, the first question, which uh, and I don't know if you know off the top of your head, the approximate price of the Red Uh You know, I mean, they 17, 18,000, you know, approximate. It changes depending on show specials and whether you get more than one device or not if you if you buy like more than one thing if you get like a ready valve and a color vision testing unit uh then the price goes down i do know that uh but you know i'd start with around 17 16 17 18 thousand something like that i don't care about the price all i care about the return on investment uh the, the more appropriate question without me being disrespectful is how many tests do you need to do a month to pay for the machine uh, if you know, to me, if you do one or two patients a week, you're paying for the machine. Uh, you know, in, in, in a return on investment mode, I simply ask doctors, how many digital field tests did you do last year? Uh, you know, a busy doctor may say, I did 200. Uh, well, if you evaluated a patient's visual function 200 times with a threshold visual field, how many times could you evaluate the, the patient's visual function with an ERG? 200, 190, 180, 150? You know, those numbers are going to be similar if you understand how to do this stuff and how to, to get the maximum value out of your technology. So you wouldn't have a practice where you would do 200 visual field tests and 38 ERGs. If you did 200 visual field tests, you'd do 175 ERGs. Right. At the reimbursement rate that I just posted up on those slides, guys can put the pencil to it and see if that's a positive return on investment from a price point of view. So don't look at the dollars of acquisition you know, like the, the the dollar to buy the thing unless you're just going to buy it and write a check or put it on a credit card i always look at stuff the way i get my machines and i got a bunch of them okay i don't buy them i lease them and i just look at the payment man if, if the payment's 400 a month you know can i get 400 a month on this technology yes or no well you know for me usually the answer is yes because again especially with this one because the reimbursement's so high uh you know again one to two patients a week you know you're you're making money so the first goal is, can I get this technology and not lose money? If the answer is yes, I think you should get the technology. So that's a, that's a long answer on the price, but that's how I look at it. Right, and the, the uh, you were actually pretty close to the price. 17,250 is uh, the, the official answer that I'm getting right now uh, for the price of the device. Okay. And a uh, question here, billing and coding question. I know you love these. Um, so is the, ER, <laughs> is the ERG or VEP exclusionary? Is it exclusionary on the same day as an OCT or, or, or a dilated fundus exam, et cetera? Is it, is it exclusionary? That's an excellent question, and the answer is no. Uh, there's no bundles, uh, no exclusions. You can do a, an ERG at the VEP on the same day, and that's why I commented on that, because on occasion, it's not common, but, you know, maybe one out of 15 ERGs, I'll do an ERG at the VEP right back to back where I don't even unhook the patient. We just, you know, go right to it, because uh, I want the information. Uh, right. So, so you certainly can report them both on the same day, and there's no exclusions at all. Right. Interesting question. I don't know if this has happened to you or not. Question is: Have you ever missed diagnosing glaucoma without using uh, the ERG? <laughs> Say that again. Have you ever missed a glaucoma before, and then you use the ERG, and you're like, "Oh, okay, this is what's going on." Um, I don't know. A, I, I, I'd have to ponder that. I don't think so. Uh, usually me missing glaucoma is just missing it right at the beginning where I didn't recognize the, the appearance of the nerve head. And I've actually posted a case on that on OD wire where I, I admitted my culpability. Uh, so it's usually not, not running enough tests. It's usually just being, not being perceptive enough in the beginning to order the test. Once you, once I start ordering tests, I usually go A to Z. That, that's why I want to, I want people to see that. If you got four machines sitting down the hall, don't run two tests, run four tests, because you never know what the results are going to be, and you blend them all together. If I had five machines, I'd run five tests, okay, if I'm trying to figure it out. Now, once I know what's happening, I might not do that. So, you know, a guy that's under active management, I've seen him for seven, eight, ten years. Okay, I might not run five tests on him every time he comes in, because I already know what's happening. Uh, but in the beginning, or if the guy looks like he's changing, okay, I'm not going to do two things. I'm going to do four or five things. Right. Uh, quick question here again, another billing and coding, pretty popular topic tonight. Um, so uh, how do insurers cover 
um, this device. Uh, this person was commenting that he's heard that Medicare makes it a hassle. <laughs> so what's no. the current status on reimbursement? <clears throat> well, that, that the that's a good question, and the the the, the optometrist there unfortunately is is kind of drinking the the Kool Aid, where what happens unfortunately in our profession is things rumors things take on a life of their own. Somebody will go to some seminar, somebody will say something, somebody's on stage, some expert, something, and and they'll say something. And it might be right, it might be wrong. It might, but it'll get twisted or, or distorted by the time it gets back home. And once it passes down four or five people and gets to the billing clerk or the optometrist that didn't go to the meeting, you know, it's almost like, hey man, don't do that or your hand's gonna fall off. You know, you don't even think of doing that, you're going to jail. And we get we get to fixating on what we can't do and what you're not supposed to do in the negative. And it's it's just not like that. Now, I did make the reference, and again, the, 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 the question is, Medicare makes it a hassle, okay? Now, two or three years ago, uh, Medicare tried to stop paying claims for a minute because they were discriminating against optometrists, saying that we didn't have credentials to, to order and interpret the test. Well, we fixed that pretty fast, and that, and that was just nonsense coming from a bunch of medical doctors, and they just they took the bait and did it. <clears throat> so some optometrists had to go through that, uh, about two or three years ago, but that had nothing to do with the technology. That was just ophthalmologists hating on optometrists. That's all that was. Uh, so, so you can't count that. And then the only other thing, and and, and I'm positive I'm right. Uh, the only other thing is the thing I referenced, where uh, because of abuse, uh, because you had too many doctors doing too many tests for for not enough good reasons, uh, Medicare had to say, okay, you guys, y'all can't control yourselves. We're going to control it for you. Uh, so they put more rules in place. They, they put rules in place that were not there at the beginning. Uh, so since everybody went crazy with the glaucoma and the glaucoma suspects, I mean, I saw optometrists that did a thousand VEPs a year, you know, and I might do 180 and I'm busy, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, man, you did a thousand? Oh yeah, yeah, we do them all the time. I'm like, no, you can't do them all the time. You know, it's nonsense. So that so Medicare came in and they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to put, we're going to slow this down. And so two or three or four of the carriers uh, they all copied each other's language and they said, okay, we don't want you to use this technology to diagnose and treat glaucoma. Okay, they said it plain as day. All right, those are the rules. Uh, so you can't use it to diagnose and treat glaucoma. And, and they took all the glaucoma codes out of the covered diagnosis list. Now, what they did leave in, and they did it on purpose, they know what they're doing, they left the codes for glaucoma and optic atrophy in because you've got to be able to make a differentiation is my patient's retina and or optic nerve messed up from glaucoma or is it messed up from something else? You know, you got to have the right to do that. And so they're, they're giving you the right to do that where they still got the glaucoma and optic atrophy codes and those partial optic atrophy codes. Because again, we're looking for optic atrophy. We're not really looking for glaucoma. You see why it's important to have that distinction? You see now? That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So in the beginning, all you're trying to figure out, does the person have optic atrophy and is it messing up their vision? That's second or third. And, and then, <clears throat> excuse me. So in that beginning, that first visit, you know, when you do your OCT, you know, unless the pressure is outrageous, you know, and again, if the pressure is outrageous, then you got to go with that. But that's not the, the case most of the time. You know, it's not outrageous. You know, to me, 22 and, and 24 is not outrageous. That could be normal. So in the beginning, all you know is that the person has an abnormal OCT scan. Okay, that, that's all you know. So it's optic atrophy. You don't know if it's from glaucoma and you don't know if a pressure of 24 is producing glaucoma. You don't know none of that on the first visit. All you know is that the person's got a messed up nerve fiber layer or optic nerve or something that the OCT scan is showing. So when you do your electrodiagnostic testing, your ERG and or your VEP, the service that the, the, the code that generates that test, that generates the medical necessity, it's not any kind of glaucoma code, the H4O code, or any kind of glaucoma suspect code, which is also an H4O code. It's an optic nerve code. That's what the technology's for. Does the person have a defect from the optic nerve or the retina? And you use these two tests to try to figure it out, okay? That's, that's the deal. And, that, and now, once you figure it out, one, so, 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 let's say you go two or three visits, and then you make the decision, hey, this guy's got glaucoma, you know? When I saw him the first day, the pressure was 20. I saw him the second day, the pressure was 19. 
I saw the third day the pressure was 27. Okay, <laughs> he's got glaucoma. Okay, so once you make the decision that the guy's glaucoma that has glaucoma, then you know most of the time I'm not really using the test to to manage the glaucoma. Uh, I will as we go forward. Let's say the guy can't do a visual field or his other or like the one I showed where where the color vision won't help me at all. Okay, well then you know I got the right to use other tests. Uh, and I still got the right to see if the if the guy's changing from glaucoma or something else. So then I use that glaucoma to optic atrophy code uh, to generate the test, you know, as I'm into the the active management down the road. But sometimes you just got to let it go. You know, when the when the when the insurance company says we don't want you to use this to diagnose and treat glaucoma, then once you make the decision that the guy has glaucoma, then you may have to let it go. But you know, without sounding mercenary, uh, you know, I may have done two ERGs and a VEP to get to that point uh, to where I've generated three, four hundred dollars worth of, of electrodiagnostic fees uh, to help make my decision. OK, I'm good. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of patients. They'll come back. You know, I'll see them all in a couple of months and, and I'll take that four hundred dollars to go on to the next patient. And I don't worry about it. And I don't worry about I'm not going to make four hundred dollars next year. I don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I'll have some new technology or I'll just go to the next patient or the guy right. get drives or something. I don't worry about it. OK, right. And, and so just to be clear, then, do you, you don't do ERG on all glaucoma suspects that come into your chair? No, no. If you can make a decision without it, then you can make a decision without it. Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's you know, I'd say the number's 70% of my visual fields. So if I do 100 visual fields, I'll do 70 ERGs. So sometimes I can make the decision without the information. Okay. Right. You know, I, st I still go by the step by step. I'll start with a visual field because that's standard of care. And, you know, and if I, let's say that the, you know, if I did a visual field and, and one eye's got this humongous superior arcuate scotoma and the other eye does not, okay, I may be done. Okay, I, I may do two tests and call it a day. Okay, this guy's got moderate glaucoma, right eye, get on these drops. I'll see you in three weeks. You know, you know, and I, I'm, I'm done. You know, so it's not so. There's no, there's no everything on everybody. Everybody's different, but. I will say that last year between me and my two associates, we did over 500 ERG tests in this practice. So it's a test that we do often. Right. So uh, interesting uh, question here again, more billing and coding. Um, observation is that, you know, your patterns of billing and coding might be different from other people's, making you an outlier. Have you found that you've been audited uh, based on this? Yes. And how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am absolutely an outlier. Uh, me and many other uh, optometrists, uh, uh, we seem to know each other and run together because uh, we all go through the same stuff. Uh, I've lost count of the letters I've received from Blue Cross threatening me with removal from the panel because of the way I practice. And usually I just have to talk to someone that's reasonable and just tell them, hey, you know, we do more than sell glasses and contacts here. People with eye disease actually walk through the doors and this is what we do. And once they hear it properly it's usually it's it has been enough and they'd say okay fine uh but it's happened four or five times <laughs> they're the worst blue cross is the worst right it's, it's happened with aetna uh it's happened blue cross is the worst with that stuff right so um you know so other interesting questions here you mentioned you sometimes do erg and vep back to back don't you need to use two different hookup points between the two, one on the back of the head? Not with this device. See? Hmm. Ah, ah, no, no, back to back, boom, boom. <laughs> okay, I said it. I said it on purpose. You don't have to hook them up again. Okay, just hmm. just one, one right after the other. <laughs> right. How how long does it actually take to hook someone up? I I saw that picture of the first one you put up uh, early in the lecture with the. the... Uh, I mean. You know, you wipe their cheeks down with a lid scrub to get the oil off so you get the best contact. Uh, peel the little strips on uh, to give the patient instructions, which is basically look at the light, uh, hook the thing up with the little electrode clip, and go boom, boom. I mean, it's it's pretty quick, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that's uh, it. I, did, I did a 10 month old infant last week. Uh, it was that was really, it was really slick. It's uh, Man, it was kind of a sad case that I don't want to get too too deep. I know it's late, but this little 10 month old kid had a stroke and uh, and apparently is blind and has developed the, the pendular searching nystagmus. And he'd been to three eye doctors, you know, the pediatric ophthalmologist and one doctor said he was blind and one doctor said he could see color and shape and stuff. 
Uh, then he went to the, the low vision clinic here in Dallas and they evaluated them and the, the low vision optometrist said he had some vision. And so th they were just kind of just lost and confused. And they called my office three weeks ago and says, hey, can you do a VEP test on an infant? I go, sure, if he's breathing, we bring him in, you know, we'll give it a shot. And I said, what's going on? And I actually got on the phone. They told me what's happening. I'm like, yeah, yeah, bring it down. And so the the it was it was kind of, it was a little sad. Uh, you know, the mother was there. The grandmother was there. Uh, the other grandmother was on the phone during the whole exam. We were all talking together in the room. It was kind of kind of fun. Uh, and the, the kid was cool. He was a cool little kid, 10 months old. He's cute as a bug. But this kid was blind. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, I was shining a light. I was shining a floodlight at him. He didn't bat an eye. Uh, I was waving my hand in front of him. I mean, nothing, no blink, no no reaction, no nothing. It was spooky. I was like, hey, this is not good. I think this kid's blind. And he had a CT scan that showed a bunch of uh, visual cortex damage, and it looked like he had cortical blindness uh, from the stroke, you know, like total, like like no light perception. So <clears throat> we finally were able to get it. It took about, you know, I mean, I stayed in the room with him, you know, to kind of comfort the mother and, and you know, my staff member had never done a, a 10 month old infant. So I stayed in there with them while they did it. Uh, you know, and then it, we, we got one eye that was okay. Uh, you know, where we got kind of a waveform. I mean, it was hard, uh, but I asked the lady, you know, cause she, you know, it wasn't my regular patient, uh, my, my regular demographic. And when I looked on the computer, I saw that she lived about 50 miles away, maybe 60 up North. <clears throat> and, and I like, ma'am, you know, without, we sounded stupid, you know, uh, how'd you find me down here? I mean, you a long way from home. <laughs> you know, you drove past like 700 eye doctors to get here. She goes, well, I looked up VEP testing and your name came up first. I go, no way. She goes, way. <laughs> I go, really? She goes, yeah, it came up on your website that you do VEP testing. I go, yeah, well, we do. She says, well, you were the only one that came up on the search. So I decided it was worth driving down here. So here we are. I go, okay. And this kid had two vitreous hemorrhages from the stroke. And so I did an exam, B scans on both eyes and a VEP on this 10 month old baby. And, you know, and I'm not trying to talk about the money, but that was a good visit, you know, <laughs> I mean, that was a good visit, you know, and you, especially nowadays, you know, how did I, how did I open this lecture? Uh, you know, we got to get ready to start working again and <clears throat> you may have to go at it a different way. Uh, and adding this ERG and VEP testing, you know, it may help recover. Uh, I'm telling you, it makes a difference. <laughs> Right, right. So we're almost out of time, but I have a, a tidbit here, and I, I don't think I mentioned it before. So Conan is, uh, you mentioned those uh, low interest, no interest loans that the government might be giving out, but in lieu of that, um, uh, Conan actually says that they have a special right now, financing equipment with no payments and no interest for six months uh, wow. when you're ready to consider purchasing equipment again. So again, just to sort of keep that back in your mind, I think, you know, companies like Conan are, are trying to help get everyone back on track again. And that's unprecedented to me. Uh, six months without to spend any money. It's, it's going to take us a month, maybe six weeks, I think, to ramp back up. You know, there's hopefully there's guys listening, ladies listening, where they're not under the, you know, shelter in place or cease and desist and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's parts of the country that are still kind of sort of OK. And, you know, and if, if you're in that part of the country, I mean, just, you know, move forward. Uh, right. For those of us that are kind of stuck for a minute, it's, we're just going to be stuck for a minute. To me, if you got a bunch of money or your credit's good, Man, I would I would start buying stuff and fixing up the office and doing all kind of stuff and just getting ready. Uh, you know, people are they're not going anywhere. You know, it ain't like people are just falling off the earth. They're all going to be back. Uh, the only question is, are they going to be back in your practice or someplace else? Because because yep. to me the patterns are changing. People are getting used to doing different stuff. They're not going to the restaurants they used to go to. They, you know, they're going to start shopping online. You can't get no ERG test online. Okay, that's all. That's the last thing I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think that's actually a pretty good way to end. So, you know, if anyone has any more questions, this is all going to be up uh, on OD Wire. This archive will be up and we'll continue the conversation there. And by the way, there's also um, C wires coming up just in case uh, folks don't know. Um, C wire this year, uh, because of everything that's going on with the coronavirus, has now been approved by, by Arbo temporarily uh, to be the same as in-person live CE. So if you attend CUR, you can get up to 60 in-person live CE credits. Essentially, you can get your entire, uh, you know, your your entire cycle's worth of CE just from showing up at CUR. So um, just throwing it out there so everyone knows, uh, go to CUR2020.com. 
Um, and you'll learn more about it if you come back to ODWire and look at this archive as well. So, so Craig, thanks so much for being here, and thank and thank you everyone for showing up tonight. You know, there's a a really big crowd here tonight, and it's kind of nice actually, Craig, hearing your voice again and <laughs> getting back to normal. You know what I mean? That flower is so hoarse, man. I just got dry all day. <laughs> uh, well, well, thanks again, everyone, and uh, I guess we'll uh, see you all online. Okay. Good night. Okay, and that was Craig Thomas all about ERG testing, and we are back. Let me kill this and kill this, and hello everyone, back here with you, and let me see if Steve and Paul are around. Guys, are you there? Yeah, we're, we're all here. Excellent, excellent. I'm so, here, can you hear me? I can hear you, Steve. Got me? So we got Good. you. So, um, Excellent. Well, this was a, a, a fun hour, uh, Craig, talking about ERG. And uh, in a few seconds, at 12.30 Pacific time, we're going to have Laura Perryman here with us. Um, and uh, she's always fun to talk to. She's got a class today as well, I believe. Let me pull up the old schedule and take a look. Yep. It's always the easiest thing to do. There we go. So, 4 o'clock Eastern uh, one o'clock Pacific, and it's all going to be about the, the Dow to Healthy Beautiful Eyes exploring the dermatologic, aesthetic, and ophthalmologic aspects of ocular surface disease. Wow. Oh boy. It's really interesting. Um, I just attended, um, again, this uh, Jennifer Liley, Dr. Liley's lecture, mm -hmm. and you get the transcripts of the, um, of the uh, interaction via chat, I believe. Yep. It's it was by far pages and pages and pages, and obviously mostly females, a million questions about it. And this kind of segues into what uh, Laura's going to be speaking about. So it's a really interesting untapped subject in optometry and really ophthalmology also. So uh, uh, go to it, Laura. Cool. Yeah, so hopefully she'll uh, have some good stuff to talk to us about today. So while we're waiting, though, just to catch everyone up to speed. So uh, as a reminder, we're going to be back doing this all over again, right? This is the show that never ends, as they say. Um, <laughs> so for those who missed the announcement, um, we can put it on up here. So, you know, CE Wire is going to be back again live in August, October, November, and December. So if you missed any of these talks up until now, they will be back again. Uh, the greatest part is our speakers have agreed to come back and do this. They're are a few I'm still waiting to hear from, but, but most of them have agreed to do this again, um, and that's really gratifying. Uh, we tried to schedule those dates that so they wouldn't uh, conflict with uh, any others, except I know that November 14th and 15th is the Academy, Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, presumptively going to be in Las Vegas. I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. If I had to guess, I would say no. Yep. The easiest one was April and perhaps May. April, because everybody was locked at home, but as the country opens up, they're uh, disseminating all over if they're, or they're practicing at this point. So right. uh, now it's a little bit more challenging. Perhaps in October, November, December, it'll get cold enough. The virus will come back and they'll be locked down again. And then they'll be begging to come back. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 we'll see. Well, I mean, uh, what's, what's been interesting is as how big the conference has been. Even though we've repeated it now a number of times, we're still getting a lot of people coming and watching the live talks. Um, you know, we've had, how many do you think we're here today? Maybe a thousand total throughout the day? Oh, uh, yeah, we're monitoring it. Right now there's 697 in the rooms, but people come and go. The um, West Coast is just coming coming on board probably. So total probably a thousand today, a thousand yesterday, some of them, of course, being the same person. But, but it's just amazing because you have to realize that we've given this conference uh, three of the times, February uh, April and May, so people just want to get more credits and they want to listen to the content. Yep. Like I, like I mentioned before, I've had several people who have enough credits and they're just coming back to listen to the same lecture again just because they wanted to ask the, uh, the speaker some information that they couldn't ask the first time because they didn't know the subject matter. So pretty cool. Right. Yeah, it actually, it is kind of an interesting thing now, right? Because if you have seen the lectures before and you're coming back, this is your chance to like corner an expert, right? You've had time to think about it now over the past several months, uh, and now you know where, where you can actually pin down an expert on the topic just by coming back to the lecture and starting to chat with them. So I never really thought about it that way. <laughs> but they'll have them so many times that they, by December they might be charging them rent. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, well. And so while we're, we're, we're waiting for Laura, I'd like to also... Um, 
you know, thank uh, all the companies that have helped us, you know, put this thing together and keep it running. This has not been an inexpensive endeavor to run. Um, you know, usually we, we do this for, you know, uh, the live stuff we do once and then we duck out and just put it on demand for however long, a few months. But this has really become a marathon. Um, I thought for sure by now I would be on break and not doing anything for the summer, and that just hasn't been the case at all. <laughs> uh, but thank you to the sponsors, because without them, we probably couldn't keep, keep the lights on and keep everything going. Um, certainly, even planning a conference like this it takes, a, uh, you know, it takes a lot. I mean, not just in terms of time, but also in you know, nailing down all the speakers and getting the tech set up and everything else, and then you know, doing the marketing. Fortunately for us, one of the reasons we can keep things so cheap is because our marketing expenses are relatively low. Um, since we market just by word of mouth mostly. Yep. So, but anyway, thank you to the sponsors. We we really couldn't do it without them. And every year we seem to have people not drop out of the sponsorship and more come on board. So there must be a reason why they get uh, a lot of benefit out of it, especially uh, with the com uh, country not having live conferences. This is the only way they're going to get information out to the rank and file OD and MD. Yep. But as we mentioned before, I'm always surprised by companies or people who haven't heard of the conference, even though it's been around for five years now. I got contacted uh, last night, actually, by a company who wants to come on and become a sponsor. Um, and I think they were completely unaware that we've even been doing this. So probably, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's my fault, right? <laughs> but uh, it's, it's nice to see, at least, you know, the words getting out there. So, um, yeah. And we attack it by so many your large website probably has half the ODs in the country. My Facebook page has four or 5,000, and you say word of mouth, and yet people, they might listen, but they don't hear, and uh, then it's amazing how many more people are at this conference because live credits are not available. So I guess necessity is the mother of invention, and uh, the conference is more needed now, so we, we have a lot more um, uh, action and more attendees. Yep. Yeah. It we'll takes a while also for people to get comfortable with online education. Uh, I bet you some of the older practitioners just uh, say, hey, this is way too easy. It can't possibly work. There's going to be a problem. Mm. But I, I guess they're just amazed how problem-free it is. It just yes. it just has to show up. Because it's getting to be a younger population and they're much more familiar with uh, uh, technology, IT, and computers, that the support of the attendees is not quite as critical as it used to be. Um, everybody's getting more savvy with computers, but at the very beginning, I think our first show, uh, there was a, many support questions about how to get credits, how to do this, how to do that, how to reboot a computer, what browser to use. Now it's getting a lot more seamless. Yep, although what's fascinating to me about this is as I got a call from someone last night who wanted help, they were shocked that they could actually find someone on the other end of the phone. Um, you know, I think we've all become really accustomed these days to just doing support online and, and if, you know, and even that can be hard, right? If you've ever tried to contact Amazon, if you have a problem, you understand. Um, you know, we try to automate support processes as much as we can, but we know from experience doing this, you can't really do it with something like this. Uh, you need to have the personal touch still. And people were surprised actually when they look at their certificates and see that phone number. That's my phone number. That's my cell number. Um, so we, you know, encourage people if they are having problems to reach out and actually give us a call. Uh, so how many times have you I responded to somebody's email within seconds, and they were first of all we answered their question, and second of all they were pleased that they can't believe that we're not um, a big company that just um, waits till Tuesday morning to respond. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's you know what we're about here is trying to get back to people as fast as we can and, and try to solve the problem. Um, yep. Yeah. And another another thing that. Uh, I have to give some props to uh, Arbo. You know, Arbo takes a lot of flack a lot of the time, you know, the, the place where you, ent you know, enter your OE tracker and stuff. Uh, but they've actually done a really good job of trying to hold things together, um, especially now. It's been very difficult, right, with, with C being a real problem for people. Arbo's been great uh, about allowing the rules to be loosened a little bit um, and also work with providers to get those credits in. It's, it's not a small undertaking to actually account for all the credits that people are taking, get it into their system, um, and then have it go out to the states. And Arbo, you know, you think it's, again, a big organization, a fancy building, like in a place like downtown Chicago or something, but no, it is not. Uh, Arbo is, you know, run by just a few people. It's very small. As far as I can tell, a lot of their work is done virtually. And now I guess all of it's done virtually. So uh, they've done a really good job, uh, you know, during this time. <clears throat> 
you think about the man. It would be very interesting. It would be interesting to, to, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead Steve. I'm sorry. Let's say there's 50,000 ODs who need 20 credits per year. That's a million credits they have to process uh, every year. That is quite an undertaking for a small staff. Yeah, I mean, just from CEY or just the show that we did in May, I mentioned it yesterday that we processed and had to send to them two man years worth of credits if you added up all the hours. Um, that's crazy. It's a, it was a crazy number of CE hours that people took, and we had to make sure it was accurate. And so that's, again, and it takes a little while for them to actually input the things that we send over to them, too. Uh, but they were able to get it done, so props to them. Um, it's it's not easy. <laughs> Picturing a Rick Van Winkle type OD with an ophthalmoscope in his hand, sitting in front of the computer with a long beard, <laughs> two man years of C. Yep. <laughs> oh, and I think and I think Laura is here. So Laura, are you there? Let's see, Laura, are you muted? Dr. Perryman. Is your phone mood? <laughs> let's see. She says she's here, but I can't hear her. So let's. Uh... Oh, I see. So she's. There we go. Oh, there we go. There Hello. we go. There's oh. your mic. Woohoo. Hi, guys. How's it going? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it goes. Good. <laughs> I was listening to your wonderful conversation about virtual CE and that incredible opportunity and need and how you guys have um, you know kudos hats off to you for really put you know putting these programs together that make it accessible and help us meet those requirements in a really fun way that's actually saves everybody money and time so i i really really appreciate um your virtual platform and, and i gotta say i think you guys were the leaders in this like how long we've we been doing this now four years five years five years yeah yeah um, and it, it's been so fun every single year, and I learned so much in the process, and I'm so happy to be here again. Um, <clears throat> and I want to be a very guest when so I get invited back because I love your well, platform. Well, we we always love your lectures because <laughs> you know you're hilarious. Your title, like, um, so I put up I put up on the screen right now so everyone can see the different classes that are going on today. And if you look at your title, right, they're always eye catching. You always come up with something different and fun every year, and I have no idea how you do that because that would just drive me crazy <laughs> trying to to come up with stuff like that. <laughs> I I have a, a creative muse that has her own timeline, and she usually drops it on me in the middle of a, a run around the hill. Um, it's like, boom, there it is. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to run with that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So meanwhile, we haven't spoken. We haven't spoken to you since the world fell apart, I think. Is that right? It's been... I fear that is true. Yeah. So how have you been doing? What have you been doing? What have I been doing? Well, um, I've been learning a lot and working a lot. Mm -hmm. And I took it as an opportunity to finally create my ideal clinic. So I'm three weeks into my brand new independent practice, and it's so much fun. Mm. I've been uh, studying up on the dangers of beauty ingredients and beauty practices and dry eye. And I've learned even more since I put this lecture together for you guys. Back in the fall, I delivered a version of this lecture at Royal Hawaiian Eye. Hundreds of ophthalmologists there invited lecture to speak about this. Um, so I gave a version of this talk there in January, and then all travel stopped, like at the end of February. Right. No more meetings. Um, so it's uh, I've learned a lot since then. There's like incredible, incredible content. This is a really rich area that's. Um, Forgive the pun. I'm just scratching the surface. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good pun. Oh, <laughs> so <dessert. laughs> In the airport, uh, for a long time. You're at so many conferences, giving so many lectures. Uh, it's been tough, probably, for you uh, staying home and not doing uh, what you normally do. Well, it's the great pause has given me the time, bandwidth, and energy to go ahead and create my independent practice. So that's been awesome, um, and it's a lot of work and a lot of. Lots involved in setting up a practice, as I'm sure you know, but it's been so rewarding and I'm so happy. Um, and it just, it's created this whole other space where I can continue this cosmetics work and my clinical research and the way I read and assimilate the new publications and help deliver it in teachable formats. So it's, it's been, it's been, I've made some lemonade here, dudes. I mean, you get handed some COVID lemons, and what are you going to do? You're going to put on a mask, cut, squeeze, add water, sugar, and stuff. <laughs> there you go. And so, what, go. so as you've been, you know, 
formulating all this stuff and putting it all together, how like mechanistically have you been working on stuff? You know, I know we're down here in Portland, you're real close to us up in Seattle. What's it been like? Have you been able to like venture out at all or or not? Oh, not much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, not much. And I'm, you know, part of that is out of desire to protect my patients, right? So I limit my instant incidental exposures as much as possible um, so that I don't inadvertently become a carrier and expose my patients. So yeah, I'm kind of homebound. And as an extrovert, that's a little challenging. The rest of my family is a bit introverted and they're doing just fine <laughs> with all of this. <laughs> But me as the extrovert, I, I miss my friends. I miss seeing wonderful, lovely people like you. Um, and yeah, so we're just adapting, right? That's all you can do. I will say, I'm so impressed with our young people. The, um, the graduates in the year 2020, they got a little ripped off, right? Like the, all those rites of passage with prom and graduation, um, you know, college graduation, med school students, you know, optometry school students, they got a little ripped off with the pomp mm -hmm. and circumstance of graduating. But <clears throat> what I'm observing is a, 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 a resilience and a creative mindset that I don't think we've seen in several generations. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really excited for the next generation because of their ability to work around roadblocks um, in a way that's positive and creative. My daughter, for, for example, for one, totally on her own, 100% independently, create, saw the need for the vacuum that was created with no school. And she's like, well, how are these people going to continue to learn? And so what she did is she created, this is completely on her own, uh, a website called Seattle Students Helping Students. And it's a volunteer match program with um, upper high school students and any student in the Seattle area that needs tutoring. And so it's a one-to-one -one match program. She's matched over 200 families to um, do peer-to-peer -peer education oh. um, and tutoring. And it's been really cool and really rewarding. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think the young ones are very interested in their own education and there's people rising up to meet the needs left and right. And then I'm optimistic for our future. I really am. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. They always say that constraints are what uh, creates great artwork, right? It's if you if Correct. you're given if you're given free reign to do whatever you want, that typically is <clears> as <throat> good as being constrained in some way. So I agree with you. The students today really are facing unbelievable challenges, and I don't know how they're they're dealing with it. Actually, I mean, I have an 11 year old here, and sometimes I wonder. I look at him, and I'm like, Wow, do you realize like what you're going through is so bizarre? Or is this just normal to him? Like, <laughs> it is normal to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is normal to him. And yet they still have, you know, hopes and dreams and desires. And so if they want to connect with friends, they're going to figure out ways to do it, like in a way that's uh, safe. I'm also impressed with how much the young ones respect the viral precautions. Like yeah. I, I see some people like, you know, being a little too cavalier about it, but for the most part, at least in our area, I'm seeing kids be really respectful of it. So it's, um, they get it. They're smarter than we think. Yeah. I mean, in our area, it's weird. It's almost like the old people have a death wish and the kids are the ones who are actually <laughs> observing all the rules. I swear, you go out and you're like, oh my God. Like I see people at restaurants, they're not wearing masks. They're just like hanging out. I'm like, what are you people doing? Like you're just oh, asking that's for so it. That's so interesting. That's <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think they're I think they're a pretty open minded lot. Um, yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so so anyway, with your talk, I guess your talk is coming up, right? And you've you've done it now fifteen million times. So for you, this is going to be like clockwork. But um, with what Steve Steve mentioned something really interesting a few minutes ago. Uh, it's that people have now taken the same talk several times. They they come back to talk to the experts, right? So you uh -huh. have people at your lecture now who've seen you do this before but might have saved up questions and thought about stuff over the past several months Ooh, that might want to come back and just start chatting wow. in the chat box, which I thought was really interesting. Oh, that's so cool. Thanks for letting me know that. And I, I, I was kind of hoping that would happen and I can't wait to, to think higher about it because I mean, I think that's the whole nature of scientific inquiry, right? You have a question, you go out and you look for it, you study it and then you think you understand it, but then you end up generating a whole bunch more questions. And so that's perfect. That's the growth mindset 
that I'm looking for, that I try to foster and create with my lectures, the way I teach. Um, so that makes me extremely happy to hear that. Excellent. Yeah. So hopefully, anyway, hopefully we'll have some good interaction. I mean, Steve, you've been seeing a ton of it today, like even with Jen Lyerly's lecture, right? That just happened. You know, people have just been going back and forth. Hey, Laura. Um, I've got uh, Jen Lyerly's lecture, and um, there's pages and pages of chat. Um, <sighs> most emails, I have to say, but some mails chiming in. It was the most, um, let's say, queried uh, lecture by far. Because That's the awesome. That we just don't know, and yours is in the same kind of area. So, um, Expect a lot of interaction and good stuff. And I learned how to take off makeup and what's good for me. And, uh... <laughs> hey, you know, what you do in your own time, that's totally cool. Nobody's judging. <laughs> exactly. But um, it's funny, it's an area of ophthalmology and optometry that we don't really think about, but yet it's a day to day thing that people are concerned about. It's very, very important, uh, especially in this day and age when I was telling Adam, I'm seeing all these people on TV now doing their own makeup from their Zoom. Uh, and not doing a very good job of, of all the things, that whatever it might be, eye care or a general makeup. That's right. Help us. And if, if, by the way, if anybody hasn't heard Dr. Perryman lecture, it's not like listening to a regular lecture. Expect <laughs> a lot of music, a lot of uh, animation. It, <laughs> in this area, in our conferences also always. So uh, uh, Dr. Perryman is a little bit uh, interesting. And exciting. <laughs> well, Thank you for for that backhanded compliment. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's super funny. Production takes a lot longer. <laughs> and and to be fair, this year my music cues weren't as tight as they've been in the past. But if that seems to be a popular request, I will make sure to dovetail it in for next year. That's hilarious. You know, you I, want. I was, I was going to ask. I've already been thinking about what I want to talk about next year. Well, you know, I was going to even ask you for this one. You know, a <laughs> lot of people have seen it, but I was wondering, would you care if we looped your video in during the live stream? Uh, for people who haven't registered for CEWire yet, so the live stream, you know, this shtick that we're doing right now, right, this will actually go out into ODWire, uh, where people who haven't taken the conference, you know, what I've been doing today is playing previews, showing people some of the lectures from CEWire to try to get them inspired to come in and join. Would you care if we put your lecture out there so people could see it? I would be delighted. Great. Yeah, because yours is one of the most fun ones. So I think like, okay, why don't we, you know, we'll lead with what's really good. We'll put out the really great ones <laughs> and lure them in and then they can watch all the crap, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. Dry eyes, anything but dry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it fun. <laughs> yeah. We can't take ourselves too seriously. No, especially <laughs> now. I, th I think it's a terrible idea. Especially now. That's right. And, and you know, frankly, we can't pull it off anymore anywhere anyway with all this COVID hair and like, you know. Oh, my God. So, you know, I <laughs> the thought... The self-maintenance stuff suffered a little. <laughs> I mean, I thought about that today when we were coming on. I'm like, should I actually like make myself look decent or should I just like put on my fleece like I usually wear here and like my hair is like, I mean, look at it. I'm, I have, you know, COVID hair. It's like, I didn't... Who cares? I right? love I love your Pacific Northwest style. I mean, do you, man? It, yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> this is me, right? So, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm being I'm I'm letting letting it fly right here today. But you know, I, I figured, what the heck? I mean, why not? This is the time, right? I mean, I have instead of Paul next to me, I have a Totoro sitting here because that's all I could find because I'm not allowed to be around <laughs> human beings anymore. So, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think we should just uh, own it, like. Um, yeah, it's interesting. My makeup habits have changed quite a bit in COVID. You know, first of all, because, you know, I'm not seeing anybody outside the household. But <laughs> second of all, um, just, uh, you know, things are a little simpler, right? It's, uh, as you get older, there's more maintenance involved, but I'm okay with letting some of it go. Although, full disclosure, I did inject my own Botox. Really? It turned out really good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've sewn my own fingertip back on before, just for, like the tip. So yeah, I'm like, I'm not afraid of needles. Yeah, so Botox is, <laughs> is, is nothing. That's, yeah. Oh, it's nothing. <laughs> Hold still. <laughs> oh, you know, I did have a question oh, for you. So you're, you're a big proponent of IPL, right? Yes. So, so talk to us about that for a second. If we can just talk about, because oh, yeah. we have to put this into a clip show, right? So I got to ask you one clinical question. So uh, I know that- it I know on ODWire people have been going back and forth about IPL. You have people who are like, oh, I don't want to invest in this, it's too expensive, and oh, I don't know if my patients are going to do it, and, and will it make a difference? And then you get another crowd, they're like, yeah, you know, it's great for, for ocular issues, but you know what? People like the cosmetic stuff even more. <laughs> so <laughs> um, It's true. It's the only thing in your dry toolkit that makes you look better as well. Right. So bonus, gift yep. with purchase, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, so I, I know you're a huge proponent of it. So you know, in your office, is it something that people can easily implement if they decide to actually you know take the plunge and get a unit? Yeah. So that, I mean, that's such a great question. Um, I I wouldn't call myself a proponent as because um, I approached it from a, a clinical science curiosity point of view. Because you know, we all run into these we all run into this point in treating dry eye where it's like, ah, oh, there's just a not a lot, other, not a lot of other things in my toolkit. And so I needed more things because I would do all those things and the patient would get so far in their progress. And we're both looking at each other going, we need more. And so that led me to look for other things. And this is gosh, 10 years ago. Um, and so I started reading about the IPL science. I'm like, okay, now this is very intriguing because if we're talking about a technology that addresses benign vascular skin lesions, and I'm looking at my moving gland dysfunction and there's all these telangiectasias, and then I see Dr. Toyos's work, I'm like, aha, this is very interesting. And then when you start digging into the mechanism of action, you get the uh, uh, photobiomodulation. Um, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Photo coagulation, photosanitization. We got our paper published in January showing direct Demodex death with IPL. It's so nefariously satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save a spider all day long, but not that eight-legged bugger. <sighs> and then it's got the uh, photo rejuvenation capacity as well and photo immunomodulation. So there's this amazing body of work showing that you have a decrease in the activated T cells surrounding the meibomian glands on confocal microscopy with IPL series, a series of just three treatments on the lid. That study came out of uh, China in AJO 2017, I believe. I'll have to double check the year, 16, 17, I can't remember, 17? Mm -mm. Anyway, September 5th, I remember that part. Um, amazing paper, so they showed reduction in these um, T cell cytokines. I'm like, oh, that that now my data makes sense because I've been tracking my data in IPL and my MGD patients. And we saw this dramatic improvement in the osmolarity down into physiologic range, sometimes as early as after one treatment, this dramatic reduction in the brightness of the MMP9 band on the inflammatory test. Now I know that's FDA approved as a yes, no, but um, uh, Dr. Kading and um, Brzezik showed that you can do, you can actually use it as a semi-quantitative based on the brightness of the band. They submitted a paper or a poster, I think it was Arvo 2016, 17, something like this, um, where they did a dilution and they showed the brightness of the band correlates with a certain concentration of MMP9. And so we used that uh, as a way to look at the reduction in the MMP9 score. And it was highly statistically significant in our data series. So you get photoimmunomodulation, photosanitization of the bacteria and the bugs. Um, and that's one of the basis for the Shalasia management, which is very exciting. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that for a quick sec. Um, the photobiomodulation is very interesting. If you have meibomian glands that are just kind of shriveled on the vine, so to speak, maybe from Accutane, maybe from chemotherapy, maybe from something where they're just punk, um, you can actually stimulate the stem cells that meibomian gland stem cells, you can stimulate the cytochrome C within the mitochondria. If you remember from your biochemistry days, with IPL therapy. So it's like, oh, God, this really cool broad spectrum activity that addresses the six headed visto of MGD. That's, you know, six interrelated mechanisms of my mobile gland dysfunction. And IPL addresses five out of the six heads of the visto. Um, Shalasia management, an odd distinction, but I am the mother of um, using IPL for treating Shalasia without surgery and drugs. I pioneered that work, the mother of Shalasia. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we leverage all of those um, mechanistic capabilities in order to very effectively address acute and chronic Shalasia. And we have an IRB approved study that's underway right now. So I'll have some hard data for you coming. Lots of case series, but hard data is coming. Very cool. And, it's uh, so fun. I, I have Luminous's website. Luminous, by the way, is not a sponsor of this conference. I'm just purely interested in this. They should show. be. Let's get um, on them. Yeah, there you go. But <laughs> but I have a, I have their website up here right now, and I'm seeing the one thing alleviates abnormal blood vessels, so it causes apoptosis somehow in the blood vessels when you use it. That's the photocoagulation right. um, aspect. So the abnormal blood vessels are very very superficial, mm. and IPL energy is delivered very very superficially. So you're not going to get the normal vessels like the arcuate. Um, palpebral vessel and the angular artery and things like that. It doesn't go that deep. It just gets these superficial little guys. 
Um, so you'll see this lovely improvement, not only in the eyelid, those purplish veins that you can see on some MGD patients out external lids, just looking at them. Mm -hmm. And then under the slit lamp, you'll see this lovely reduction in the lid margin to lens ectasias. And then over the treatment series, you see this awesome improvement in the quality of the meibomian gland secretions. They turn from non-expressive to toothpastey, thick, turbid to clear. And this is shown in paper after paper after paper, the number of uh, meibomian glands yielding liquid secretions, MGYLS, uh, statistically improves with IPL treatment. And that's been shown in unilateral studies from New Zealand, uh, Dr. Craig, she's amazing. Um, bilateral studies. So it's when you start seeing the same things that happen in paper after paper, it's like, okay, there's really something here. There's uh, consistent improvements in staining, symptoms, telangiectasias, meibomian gland quality, um, lid edema, um, osmolarity. And you see these things again and again and again. So it's, it's just really a cool a cool approach to the problem. I'm very interested in IPL education and getting our colleagues skilled with this machine. Like to me, if you just run it cheek to cheek twice, that's like driving a Tesla to the grocery store. You are underutilizing that machine. Okay. <laughs> it's like you need to like punch it, Chewy, right? You can absolutely <laughs> use it to, right. to to get to where you need to go really quickly. And so I, I want to, you know, be heavily involved in educating our colleagues and on good practices. I have some YouTube videos up that I made um, under Dry Eye Master, my YouTube channel. And I've had a lot of good feedback from those. I need to just with a caveat of that I use a lot less gel now in my current practice. But um, yeah, I mean, there's just, a, it's a lot, it's a fun tool. And then everything else in our dry toolkit works better because you're using a unique way to address five of the six heads of the meibomian gland visto. Right. And, it's and not, then everything else just works better. And you mentioned that it's superficial too, so people shouldn't be afraid um, to use this. Because I know that there was some trepidation, like, you know, can I actually do this? Especially? Well, I was nervous too. I'm <laughs> like, I, I don't know about this. Like, I had it done myself. I'm like, geez, that's great. Yeah. Is my eye really protected? Um, and yes, the, the answer is yes. Um, but with a caveat, really important caveat, pause. This is a really important caveat. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have laser grade corneal shields right if you're going to treat on the eyelids full stop absolutely critical there are case reports of ipl energy creating iritis and pigment loss of the uh, posterior iris because of ipl energy inadvertently entering the eye wow. you have to protect the cornea and the iris now you'll still see light coming under the door as a patient when you have those shields in place, but the light is not going in where it's going to be absorbed by those critical structures. Right. Dr. Perryman, how much of the face do you have to do to kind of make it so that the, it's not so obvious that you've done the eye so they get the cosmetic effect <laughs> as an adjunct? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's an amazing question. So here, so the Perryman protocol that I came up with, it's a four-step protocol and I'm happy to share it with anybody who's interested. Um, the reason why I started doing the full face is because we know that rosacea is a local regional problem. It's not just the eyelids. Like you can start off as ocular rosacea, but you're going to eventually become facial rosacea, right? Um, so it's a local regional problem, not only from a dermatologic point of view, but an aesthetic point of view. And so we have to treat it local regionally. That's why I treat the whole face. And the other reason is I had this lovely plastic surgeon patient who came to see me and I said, do you need IPL? He's like, great, I'll have my technician do it in our office. I'm like, cool. Well, they just did the cheek to cheek protocol and he came back looking like a candy cane, red forehead, <laughs> red, red, red chin and white across the cheeks. I'm oh, like, God. okay, we really need to treat the whole thing. Uh. <laughs> so, and that's one of the aesthetic benefits of it. And you, you get this amazing uh, photo rejuvenation property as well women can wear less makeup because their complexion is so clear and, and uniform. You get rid of the, the solar reds and browns. So you get this more uniform palette. You can wear less makeup, which is less irritating to your ocular surface. So there, the layers of good in treating the whole face are significant. And there's finally some data coming out showing that if you take the time to treat on the eyelids with laser grade shields over the cornea, did I say that again? Laser grade shields over the cornea, <laughs> super important. <laughs> then you get a, a, uh, a better effect on the meibomian glands. 
So just the cheek to cheek protocol is just step two of our protocol. Um, and I think, you know, Dr. Toyos really is the father of IPL um, for ocular rosacea. It's very effective, um, but there, there's, there's more we can do with it. And so we should, I just wanna help everybody get off to good habits and good start. Right. And from a, a marketing perspective, then, if they follow your protocol, this seems like it would almost sell itself, right? Because you're not just treating the dry eye. It's like, and oh, by the way, you know, here's what we can do for your whole face. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I never lead with that. Right. Like, yeah. It's so that usually comes in when I talk about the risk benefit of the procedure. Like, you know, I can over treat, under treat, you need multiple treatments. Right. Super rare to get any kind of corneal abrasion, um, blistering. This is a sixth generation platform, very safe. I said, the main side effect is um, that you'll look, look look better. Right. <laughs> and they're like, oh. So yeah, I, as far as, I, I always cringe just a little at the word cell in eye care, because like, like, I'm not, as, I'm not I, I am there to guide that right. patient in selecting the best thing. Like sales is the last thing on my mind. I'm just well, there to facilitate and guide. I would imagine when people finally get to you, right, their dry eye is severe enough that they're pretty pretty willing to undergo these kinds of procedures anyway, right? Yes, and you'd be surprised at the um, at the uh, fund of knowledge that the general public has around IPL for dry eye and MGD. Hmm. Oh, and quick thing, just to stay on label in the United States, you're targeting the abnormal vessels. We do not have phase four FDA approval yet for IPL for dry eye and MGD. We do have FDA approval using IPL for dry and MGD in China, Australia, and the EU. Hmm. Those phase four label expansion studies have been completed in the US and they're currently in FDA review. So when you offer it, stay on label by talking about the rosacea until we have phase four label expansion for dry eye and MGD. Make sense? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do, do you have yeah, any yeah. do you have any sense of how long that's going to be, or is it just you know a morass where you have uh, like, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's going to change the non covered nature of the service. Um, you, you can get uh, rosacea paid for by insurance, quote unquote, with a laser. So that CPT code is for laser there's something called a V-beam, which dermatologists have. It is a single wavelength laser for addressing rosacea. No data on using it on the lids, and um, that one can get covered by insurance. But this is a broad beam light, and so it does not meet the CPT codes. So this is non-covered by insurance. Right. Yeah. Again, I, I would imagine though, you, you know, the, the patient population that you have, they're selecting themselves where that will probably matter a little bit less because you know, if your dry eye is so bad that they're seeking you out, um, you know, they're probably willing <laughs> to go for it. Right. Because, you know, Seattle's a terrible place to visit. And no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you think Only about in that. Only in January. You, you think Is about that. You're like, January in Portland. <laughs> right. You think like dry eye in Seattle. Like, does this even make sense to have a clinic? But no, you know, dry eye is everywhere, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed, and that, that speaks to the multifactorial nature of it. Now, with that said, my eyes feel amazing when I'm scuba diving. <laughs> now, <laughs> right. that's a moisture chamber, right? <laughs> my eyes feel amazing when I'm scuba diving. <laughs> but yeah, we, we all struggle. We have a lot of allergens here. There's the, you know, the age thing, the hormone thing, the computer use. Oh, my goodness, the computer use. Um, yeah, environmental issues, exposures, our skin care, the way we wash our face. All of those things come into play. Yep. All right. Well, it's one o'clock here in the Pacific time, and we can use that Pacific time because we're both here in Pacific time. We don't have to be slaves to the East anymore. So it's one, one o'clock. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. How you know we have I to do. express ourselves. <laughs> like it's so annoying. But no, it's one o'clock. So there you go. Um, but it's awesome. been, it's been great speaking are. with you. In your room, Laura. I'll just... Okay, I'll see you there. <laughs> looking forward to it. All right. Well, thanks okay. so much, Laura. And, uh, Thanks so much, guys. All right, we'll catch you later. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. She's great. Always great. Yep. All righty. So, yeah. So IPL. Uh, I didn't. I, yep. I didn't ask her about uh, how the dermatologists feel about this. Yeah. You know, they're, they're stepping in, into a, another turf, a very profit profitable term. Well, if you look at the and, at the page for the IPL company, so Luminous is the name of the, the IPL company. They are not a sponsor of CEY or so. 
<laughs> we we get nothing for this, but you can you can look here. Um, they sell to dermatology, right? Aesthetics are like you know front and center is one of the big things that they talk about. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Right. So, but optometrists shouldn't be afraid. We 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 all agree that the malpractice will cover the work. This is a fairly safe instrument. I mean, uh, if you do it right, as she was saying, you know, I, I saw a uh, an in-person lecture with her where I forgot where we were, somewhere <laughs> in one of the events, and she was talking about, yeah, so Steve, you were there, so she was talking about the, the, the covers, the eye covers, which really, really are important. I think that's probably the biggest problem that people have. If you want to talk about, um, you know, serious problems, that would be it, is if you don't cover the eyes. Yep. Uh, very safe, and I think it was her, uh, Art Epstein. It, it's funny, the environment. Now, Art's in Arizona where it's hot and dry, and she's in Washington where it's cool and wet, and yet they both do it. Uh, she didn't mention, but they do it also in tandem with Lipoflow at the same time um, for many patients. So they're really handling it uh, aggressively for the patients that's been recalcitrant, and uh, uh, they apparently do a good job. Uh, I wonder what she does if somebody's friend comes in and says, look, I'd like to have that treatment that made my friend look beautiful, and... And Dr. Perrin finds no dry, no nothing with her, uh, it's done. Well, certainly a plastic surgeon will do it. Oh, yeah, a plastic surgeon but, would do it in a heartbeat for sure. Um, yeah, that is a good question. I don't know. It's not a cheap procedure, which is, I guess, you know, gives some people pause. Um, so that's well, something, something well, to consider. Yeah, she's, she's in a big city, right? Uh, What's that? People have both had upper... three, three months, the six months, they have Botox for only cosmetic reasons. Sure. So this is kind of and, similar. Plus, yeah. people will spend three, four thousand dollars on cosmesis when they won't spend it on um, food. Sure, and and how many ladies don't do their nails every every couple of weeks? Well, yep, that's so. <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah, so you know people will be you know will pay for cosmetics that's for sure, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's an interesting procedure. I, I just more ODs I know have been looking at it, kicking the tires, but have it jumped. Do you even see that on ODY? I think people are a little scared um, for whatever reason. It depends yeah, on the okay. state. All states are very nebulous in their rulings. I think California just came on board. Uh, in New Jersey, it's nebulous, but people are doing it. So um, it's, it's kind of weird because a lot of our stuff is off-label. Um, mo many things we do are off-label. For example, even treating corneal ulcers with Desavance and Vigamox and Zymaxid, that's off-label. Um, doxycycline is off-label for the lids. As, I'm just talking about pharmaceuticals. Um, so a lot of things we do are off-label, but it's in the interest of the science of the field. You know the aspect I'm talking about, uh, Adam. So do things off-label as long as the science um, justifies it. Right. I mean, I guess as long as you can defend yourself in court, right? <laughs> so that's that's really what it comes down that's, to. If you had to defend yourself and you're on the stand, yep. you know, is the science behind you? That's Craig Steinberg's lecture. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let me just uh, see how things are going here. Look at the schedule one more time and, and we can wrap it up a little early today. I'll get another one of those videos going. I'm glad that Laura agreed, and I don't know if you guys agree with me too, to run her video outside of, of the conference, just like we did with Sue's. Um, to get people to, you know, take a look at it. Uh, it might inspire them to sign up. Sure. Yep. So, Especially well, in the... It could the be very... complain about marketing this... Uh... No, I mean, the, the lectures we can do, people obviously can't get Cope credit for. We can do whatever we want with the lectures, but if people watch outside of the CEY environment, then they can't get credit for it. They have to be signed up for CE Wire. They have to be using the CE Wire platform because only that platform will actually monitor what they're doing and uh, get entered into the OE tracker. So that's an important thing. You just can't sit here and watch stuff like on OD Wire or whatever. Um, I mean, you can, and you'll, you'll get a decent education out of it, but you can't get credit for it. Right. I just noticed that Kerry Gelb is doing a three hour marathon. Uh, two. It's two hours. Between five and. Is it, is it two hours? It's two hours. Because it's blank on the third one, so it's between five. It, it probably looks. It probably five, looks like it's three, but it's only two. It's yeah, it's two hours long. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, let me. I'll pull up the schedule again so people can see. It's it's two hours. Three would really I be pushing Dr. it. Gellis, Dr. Gellis did three hours consecutively on various aspects of keratoconus and 
uh, scleral lenses, etc. So he did things consecutively. But Kerry's is two hours. Yep. So yeah, you can see it up on the screen. Okay. I just put it there. It's a two hour long lecture. And then we're getting to the to the end, I guess, huh? Um, yep. Until Everybody's we, there. Uh, until next time. <laughs> again <Yep>. and again. <laughs> Um, so yeah, for next time though, since it is in August, we're going to have a little bit of a pause. We'll try to streamline the way people get their credits in the system. That's one, uh, sort from a development perspective, that's one thing we're doing uh, with that form and, and making it so that people won't have to fill it out. Um, you know, we're going to have a couple new classes probably by then as well, so that'll be fun. Uh, and maybe for the next time in August, we'll line up a real live stream show. We'll actually invite some folks in again instead of this one. We, we felt for this one though, it was just not worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sure. putting, putting people through the exercise again because they've, you know, we've been through it so many times now and, and, you know, I thought, at first I thought this was going to be the end, right? I thought this June show was going to be over and done. We'd have a big extravaganza and that would be it. Um, but that just didn't turn out to be the case just because Arbo changed Let's the rules again. Rules. Yep. So, so uh, if, if anyone wants to suggest who we have on as a guest, let us know. Yep, and certainly from our speaker list, you know, if you run down the list, if there's anybody here that you think would be good, we'll, we'll invite some of our, you know, usual suspects back as well, people who are entertaining to talk to them. Um, but we'll see, you know, we'll see next time what we're going to do. And, you know, it's, yep. it's going to be interesting because by the time we do this next conference in August, we're going to have real clarity as to what C looks like around the country for the rest of the year, right? Because I would imagine by the end of August, they're going to have to either say yes or no to Expo and Academy, so. Expo, I would think so, because you need a hotel room two weeks later. Yeah. Uh, and a plane flight, and then your practice closing down for a few days, yep. which is all the reason why these online courses work better. Uh, and certainly, like you said, uh, the Academy meeting, um, as well as we have a large one in, in our state called Therapy by the Sea, where you get four or 500 ODs down to Atlantic City, and that will be at exactly the same time, so it'll be interesting. Is that one canceled yet, or is that still on, on the schedule? It's still, it's, no, they, they expect it to be canceled, but they haven't canceled it yet because they have to you know, book the uh, convention center. I, I, that's one thing. I, I don't know if any convention centers are going to open for at least, well, I'm just going to guess. I'm going to say the summer of 21, if anything. It has to have a vaccine for a convention, I think, well, which is what you're saying. Yeah. It's I mean, actually easy. I mean, so, I'm, I, I mean you, I'm just visualizing what Expo looks like, like at the Sands in Vegas, right? Can you imagine walking... Uh, walking through that exhibit hall and and just the the hallways there to get to the place, just how narrow it is. I I don't know. <laughs> I, Imagine walking from the wind to uh, the next hotel with a mask on at 110 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But you know, Vegas is trying it right now. They're they're trying. Yeah, I'm getting letters. I'm sure you are too from all the casinos. You know, inviting you back. And it's like I don't know about this. <laughs> But they're backing off in terms of the amount of people and how they're doing it. They're being a little bit more conservative than when they were first opening up. So, uh, And Nevada is one of the states where things are spiking. And um, it's not spiking in the boondocks. I'm sure it's in Las Vegas and Reno as, sure. as the major culprits. Yep. So we'll see. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be an interesting world. All right. So I think what I want to do then to sort of close this out today is I'll put up one more of these movies and should I do the Friedberg one again about retinal detachment because that one was kind of cool um, and then to, yep. and then you know what we'll do is since we since we just got uh, Laura's permission maybe on ODWR I'll put up her video as well um, and you know try to to get people to uh, to come on in and sign up for CE wire because the on-demand lectures are still going to be going on from now until August uh, so you know yep. at least at least we have that so people can come in and watch those in the interim you know, sign up now, and then you'll have all those live, live courses, too, in the fall. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, okay. if you have any, any you know, uh, anything else to say, you know, sh I guess anybody out there, shoot me an email. You know where to find me. <laughs> you have my phone number, actually, so give me a call if there's anything going on with the conference that you need help with. So that's all from here, and uh, we will see you guys next time in August. Bye. Bye-bye, okay, all. Bye now. Hi, this is Dr. Mark Friedberg. I'm talking to you today from Red Bank, New Jersey, and I'll be discussing retinal detachments. I'll be talking to you about the symptoms and signs of retinal detachments. I'll be discussing the different types of retinal detachments, and I'll be discussing 
the features that distinguish retinal detachments from some of the conditions that look similar to retinal detachments. Um, I'll be talking about risk factors for detachments and basically how to manage everything related to retinal detachment. So for our first slide, um, I'd like to just state that there are basically three different types of retinal detachment. The first type is a regmatogenous retinal detachment. Um, these are the ones we're all familiar with. Patients with regmatogenous detachments have a retinal tear that led to the detachment or retinal tears that led to the detachment. Um, they need to be fixed fairly promptly, sometimes more emergently than others, depending on the type of retinal detachment. Um, they need surgery of some sort to fix them, and if you don't fix them, the patient will lose all their vision. These are the ones we're familiar with. These are the ones we don't want to miss. Regmatogenous detachments. Um, the second type of retinal detachment I'll be discussing uh, is known as an exudative retinal detachment. Exudative retinal detachments um, don't have tears in the retina and don't usually need surgery. Um, they can look similar to regmatogenous detachments and sometimes even the best experts can't distinguish the two. Um, they often have an underlying disorder that's responsible for the exudative detachment and the treatment is usually to fix the underlying exudative disorder. And finally, the third type of retinal detachment that we'll be discussing is known as a traction retinal detachment. This is when fibrous tissue grows onto the surface of the retina and pulls the retina off the wall of the eye. Um, you can see in this slide here, uh, we have fibrous tissue. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but maybe you get a pointer here. Um, there's fibrous tissue here. I'm putting little dots on it. Uh, and this tissue uh, is very thick and stronger than the retina. And basically, it's pulling the retina off of the wall of the eye. Um, the causes for this we'll get into a little bit later. So we'll start out, and, and by the way, you can have more than one type of retinal detachment at a time. You could have a combined uh, regmatogenous traction detachment, for example, where there's scar tissue, but the scar tissue pulled so hard it tore a hole in the retina or, or pulled a tear in the retina. And so you have a combination of regmatogenous and traction. And those are obviously more difficult to diagnose and deal with. So we're starting out with regmatogenous detachments. So first of all, what are the symptoms? And these, again, these are the regmatogenous are the ones we all, when we say retinal detachment, that's what we usually mean. If we just use the word retinal detachment, we're usually implying that it's a regmatogenous detachment. Um, and regmatogenous detachments often have symptoms. Usually patients will experience flashes of light. And, you know, a lot of patients are sent to me when they have flashes of light to examine their retina to make sure there's no tear. Um, the flashes of light associated with retinal tears and retinal detachments are generally quick zips of light. Um, they may be recurrent. So a patient will often say they, they see a quick quick zip of light off to the side of their vision, usually in their peripheral vision, it lasts a second or two and then they get another one. And they may get, you know, multiple, one after another, it may not even stop. But there's a small interruption between each one. Now let's contrast that with another cause of a flashing light, um, migraine. Migraines can cause flashes of light, but they're totally different. Migraines cause a jagged, um, C-shaped arc of light that goes non-stop for about 20 minutes and often interferes with the vision. So a, mig a migranous flash of light is usually a, a 5 to 60 minute episode. It's often described as a jagged, non-stop flickering light. Now patients don't always notice it the entire time it's taking place. So sometimes they only catch the last few minutes 
when it's way off to the side. They often think it's in one eye. Um, they'll say it's like the left eye if it's to the left side, but it's often in both eyes. They don't always notice it. But if they cover one eye after they've had one episode, they'll often see it's in both eyes. And again, this is jagged, flickering, five to 60 minutes nonstop and often interfering with the vision as opposed to a quick flash of light from the retinal tear, retinal detachment spectrum, um, which is off to the side, lasts a second or two, but they get multiple. And it's most notable in the dark when it's due to the vitreous detachment, retinal detachment spectrum. Another symptom these patients with regmatogenins experience is floaters. Um, floaters are not specific to retinal tears and detachments and vitreous detachment. Um, floaters are obviously lines, dots, webs. And the more floaters a patient has, the more concerned I am that there's going to be a tear detachment of the retina. Um, but you need to distinguish floaters, as I said, could be due to other things. And you've got to make sure the patient doesn't have uveitis as the cause of their floaters. Um, uveitis, if you, if you take the slip beam and you push the slit lamp, if you're looking at the lens, and then you move the slit lamp in closer to the eye, you'll see the vitreous. And if you make a small beam, you can often see if there's cells in the vitreous. Now, with the regmatogenous detachment, you may see vitreous pigment. But there shouldn't be a hundred floaters as you would see with uveitis. Um, it is confusing sometimes, but uveitis causes white blood cells. The cells you see from retinal detachment are either going to be brown or red, depending on whether it's hemorrhage or just pigment. And finally, the last and most concerning symptom the patients with regmatogenous detachments have is something in their peripheral vision. Patients will often describe a curtain or a shadow blocking the peripheral vision. Um, or part of it, and it doesn't have to be that. They just see something. They'll say to me, I see something off to the side or in the corner or a crescent or a, a ball or a balloon. Or They'll notice something in their peripheral vision. And so flashes of light, floaters, something obstructing the peripheral vision, um, are the symptoms of erygmatogenous detachment. Um, as far as the signs, or in other words, the things that we'll see when someone has it, um, you might see pigment in the vitreous. As I said, you have to push the slit lamp close to the – look at the lens and then push it closer to the eye, the slit lamp, so your beam is now focused in the vitreous. And if you see brown pigmented cells, that could be a sign of retinal detachment. Um, more – the other signs that you'll see, you should see a retinal tear if it's a regmatogenous detachment, but tears are sometimes hard to find. Um, they're best seen by scleral depression. Um, I find that all the other techniques, if you just look with the indirect ophthalmoscope, number one, you're not going to see 360 degrees of retina. Number two, the flap, the retinal tear, is sometimes the, the flap of the tear may settle back down to where it was, so you won't see the opening in the retina. But if you take a scleral depressor and push around the eyeball, the flap will pop up at you so you see the opening in the retina. So scleral depression is really the best way to see a retinal tear. Um, and um, often you'll see a, a, a reddish color at the base of a retinal flap um, consistent with the tear. The other indications, now obviously you can see tears and pigment when you don't have a retinal detachment. Um, the key to the retinal detachment is seeing that corrugated and if you look at this slide in the top right-hand corner, it has that corrugated. Those white lines are corrugations in the retina, and that's a very classic sign. When you see that, you've got to be worried about retinal detachment. The other thing about retinal detachment is you cannot see the retina ordinarily. So if we look to the left-hand side of this slide, let's say from the fovea left or from the fovea inferiorly, you don't see the retina. What you're looking at is you're seeing the background fundus behind the retina. You're seeing the pigment epithelium. You're seeing the choroid. Um, but you don't see the retina because the retina is transparent. It's clear. You can see the blood vessels in the retina, but you don't see the retina itself. But when you look to the upper right-hand corner of this slide, you can't see the fundus background. And the reason you can't see the fundus background is the retina becomes opaque when it's detached. So it's hard to see through it. So two of the classic signs 
of retinal detachment are number one, these corrugations, and number two, the opaqueness. You can't see through it. Now, obviously, there's going to be elevation of the blood vessels as well. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to appreciate that unless you're looking at 3D. Um, but that's one of the other things that you, you want to see with retinal detachment. Now, there are other signs that you can get. Uh, you can get an afferent pupillary defect particularly if the entire retina is detached, you'll often get an afropupillary defect. And that's not a great prognostic sign. Um, and also the intraocular pressure can be affected. Usually the pressure will be lower in a retinal detachment. Um, but in rare cases, the pressure can be elevated. So, you know, obviously these are nonspecific signs. Um, now when someone has a chronic regmatogenous detachment, um, the retina can appear a little more can appear a little differently, you'll sometimes get a demarcation line. And that would often be a pigmented line um, that separates the detached from the attached retina. And I'll show you one later on. Um, but the demarcation line is an indication that this retinal detachment has been present for months, if not longer. Um, and when it's a chronic retinal detachment, you'll often see white dots beneath the retina. Uh, you'll see large cysts within the retina. They're called macrocysts. So these are other findings that you can get. Um, but obviously those are just with, you know, chronic retinal detachments. Now, what causes a vitreous, what causes a retinal detachment? Well, the first, the, most retinal detachments occur spontaneously. Um, and they usually develop after vitreous detachment, most of them. And this is a sign of vitreous detachment. You can see this Weiss's ring um, over the optic disc, this white oval connection. This is a complete Weiss's ring. It's not always so easy to see. I find it's easiest to see with a 90 diopter lens. Sometimes you can see it with the indirect. Um, the Weiss's ring is an indication that the vitreous jelly has pulled away from the disc and usually the posterior retina. And sometimes when the vitreous pulls away from the retina, the vitreous tears the retina. And if you get a tear of the retina and you don't fix it, you get a retinal detachment. And here's another example of a Weiss's ring, um, indicative of vitreous detachment. And when someone has the symptoms of a vitreous detachment, also new floaters and flashing lights, um, they'll often see a cobweb when they see the when they have a full Weiss's ring. Um, you need to carefully look at the retina, and I, I usually advocate scleral depression, again, so you could get a full look at the retina um, to see if there's a tear, because if left untreated, that can lead to retinal detachment. Another way that you can see a vitreous detachment is with an OCT. This is an OCT scan that shows um, vitreous detachment. Um, for those of you who watched my OCT lecture, and by the way, I think I'm going to do OCT2 next year if anybody liked the first one. Try to make it better. Um, but in any case, uh, here's your retina um, from here to here. And uh, above in the black hollow vitreous cavity, you have this line and that's the posterior hyloid face. Otherwise, it's, in other words, it's the part of the vitreous that's normally attached to the retina. Um, so this posterior hyloid face, the fact that you can see it above the retina means the vitreous is detached. I'm trying to change the next slide. There we go. Um, Here's another example um, of the vitreous detachment being shown on OCT scan. Um, there's the posterior hyloid face being pointed to by arrows. You can actually see the vitreous above the posterior hyloid face in this situation. There's a lacunae, um, like a space of fluid and more solid vitreous above that has a granular appearance. There's still a little vitreous attachment to the optic disc, as you can see um, by the large arrow. 
Um, so you don't always get a complete vitreous detachment. Sometimes part of it detaches and not others. And that's why when somebody comes in with vitreous detachment, if I examine them um, and I don't find a retinal tear, uh, if they've only had the detachment for days or a few weeks, I'll ask them to come back again in a few weeks because part of the vitreous may not have separated from the retina and you want to make sure you get another look at the retina in case further vitreous detachment ensues after your exam. You hate to send somebody out and tell them everything's okay and then more vitreous pulls away from the retina days later and they develop a tear. So it's a wise idea to examine the patient a second time. Now some people examine the patient like six weeks after they had their initial symptoms. I'll usually do it two to three weeks after my initial exam. Um, I'll look at them again to make sure there's no retinal tear. So we're talking about retinal tears now. By definition, if you have a regmatogenous retinal detachment, you need to have a retinal tear. That's the only way you get a regmatogenous detachment. And as I said, most retinal tears occur because of vitreous detachment. And here's a typical retinal tear. You have the flap, um, which is right here. Um, and then you have the base of the tear, where it's a little more reddish in color underneath that. And so, just to orient you, to the right of your screen would be the optic nerve. This, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess, yeah, this, must be, this must be a left eye. And we're looking at 9 o'clock in the nasal periphery. Um, and so that the disc is to the right of your screen, and the aura serrata, the ciliary body, the anterior retina is to the left. So as you head left, you go more peripheral. And the, the flap of the tear is always on the more peripheral anterior side. The base of the tear is always on the more posterior side towards the disc. Um, and you have this, when you have a tear in the retina, you have an opening in the retina. And fluid from within the vitreous cavity can now go through that opening in the retina. And the fluid can now dissect under the retina. And what you're looking at here is actually not just a tear. This is actually a, a, a small, what I would call a subclinical retinal detachment. Um, it's very small. It's basically fluid has already gone through this tear, just a small amount, because you can see if you look just above the tear and maybe a little on its bottom edge, it's kind of a gray, opaque appearance. I can just tell you by looking at that, you can't see the fundus background. So there's fluid under the retina there. This patient has a retinal detachment. And I'm hoping you can see my marker as I bring it around here. Um, I'll put dots at the edge. But there is basically a retinal detachment that extends all the way around here. And within these red dots I just made. Um, and then in more inferior, you can see, even though it has a grayish appearance, you can see through it here. Um, and there's probably not, I mean, I think this is just the vitreous base you're looking at, so it has this gray-white appearance. But you can tell the difference between what I encircled, where the fluid is definitely located, and this other location, where it's just the vitreous is attached here, uh, at what I would think might be the vitreous base. And then to the right is, there's no vitreous attachment, there's no fluid. So there's retinal detachment here, subclinical retinal detachment, because fluid is going through this tear. Now, if you see a tear in the retina, you need to treat it. So how do we treat these things? Well, you, if you have fluid, you have to treat around the fluid. Um, if there's no fluid, I forget to get to close that. Um, so here's a patient. This is that same patient. I guess I was wrong. It wasn't nasal. Um, I believe there's the same patient. We placed laser around that cuff of fluid. Um, and so this is laser treatment. You need to surround the tear for 360 degrees so the fluid cannot dissect anywhere beyond 
the laser. The laser is forming a barricade, so fluid cannot go beyond it. You want to place the laser as close to the tear as possible. If there's fluid there, you can't put laser in that location where the fluid is. The, the, the retina won't uptake it. So you have to put laser on attached retina, not detached retina. So if there's some fluid around the tear, you've got to put it around the fluid. If there's no fluid, you put it directly around the tear. And the laser um, will form a barricade that seals up nice and quickly and, and prevents the retina from detaching. Another way you can treat it is with cryotherapy. With cryotherapy, you likewise surround the retina with the freeze. So both are equally good. Um, cryotherapy, retinal laser, um, they're both good ways to treat the tears. Uh, to try to prevent retinal detachment. You're basically tacking the retina down with glue around the tear so fluid can't get under the tear and can't dissect under the retina. That's the purpose. It's to prevent retinal detachment. Okay, now, when a patient has a retinal detachment, and, and again, this, this happens because someone had a tear and we didn't seal it up. Either we didn't detect it, uh, they didn't come in in time, the treatment didn't work, whatever it is. Fluid then gets under the retina and it keeps going and the retina comes off the wall. Um, and when the retina detaches, the patient will notice this curtain or shadow in their purple vision. If the retinal detachment proceeds and gets into the macula, the patient will lose their central vision. And once they lose their center vision, they may never regain it. So in terms of urgency with retinal detachments, it's more urgent when the macula has not detached. So a lot of people get confused with this. But when somebody has good vision, let's say this patient here, their retinal detachment is limited to the superior retina. It has not involved the macula yet. Now, I, you know, you really can't tell for sure because sometimes it's involved the macula. It, it looks like this, but you don't realize that some shallow fluid has actually gotten down there. Um, and one of the ways you can tell is with an OCT scan. You could look at the macula and see if it's attached. Um, but, or you can sometimes tell clinically. But you can often tell by the vision. I mean, if this patient saw 2200 or worse, then you know their macula is detached. You don't need any more information. If this patient sees 2020 uh, or 2030 and it looks like this, your macula is attached. And when the macula is attached, it's more of an urgent problem, particularly when the retinal detachment is located superiorly because the patient has the potential to see very well in this circumstance. And so if we can fix them, before the macula detaches or shortly after it just detaches, we can usually regain for them or preserve for them good vision for most of their life. To the contrary, um, when the macula has already detached, and when I say the macula, I'm talking about the fovea, the dead center of the retina, um, the dead center of the macula. When the fovea has detached, the patient's vision is going to be 2200 or worse. And at that point, it isn't usually going to make a whole lot of difference whether they're fixed right away or in several days. Now, when I say right away, the golden rule here is when, the, you, when maculas are attached, the studies show you want to fix it within 24 hours if you can. Um, obviously, if it's 26 or 28 hours, you know, fine. Um, but you want to get them fixed that day or the next day um, if the macula is attached, if the macula is detached, uh, it's said that you can fix them up to a week and the prognosis really won't be any different. And this is what the studies find. Now, from a personal standpoint, I just try to fix everyone as soon as I can. Um, and I find that in most situations, I'll usually schedule them the next day because a lot of these patients, number one, they may have eaten already when they come in to see me. Number two, the operating room already has a schedule, and by the time you get there, it's going to be 11 o'clock at night, and you're going to have people who don't know what they're doing, and it's just a lot easier to put them on the next day when you have a staff that has done this a thousand times, just from the standpoint of equipment tends to break down, and 
you want people there who know how to fix it and you don't want to have problems in the middle of the night. And so from a logistics standpoint, it does tend to work out better by just scheduling people the next day. Um, and so that's what I usually do with most, if not all, the rental detachments. If the macula is off, then sometimes I may not do it the next day. Maybe I'll do it the following day. But I'll usually do it within a couple of days. Um, so if the macula is on, I'll do it within a day of the, when I see them. If the macula is detached, you know, within a few days in general. But you really have up to a week to fix these macula off detachments. They're not as urgent. And the longer it's been like this, the less urgent it is. Patients will sometimes say, yeah, I lost my vision a month ago. And you look at this and you say to yourself, well, you know, they're not going to gain back their central vision. There's no rush here. And the higher the detachment, the more likely that's going to take place. Um, here's another retinal detachment. And you can't really tell whether the fovea is detached or not. It comes right up to it. Um, a lot of people will say to me, this is an inferior retinal detachment. Well. It might or might not be the tear that's responsible for the detachment is actually probably in the superior half of the eye, uh, or at least at, at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. I can tell by the regmatogenous, the, the, the bullous nature of this detachment. Um, this detachment, if you can't tell how long it's been present, you probably should fix it with a day or two. But I can tell you this macula is detached. And the reason I can tell, it's hard for you to tell, but... The obvious, you think that this elevated margin, um, you would think that this is the extent of the detachment, but actually, no. I can see up here, um, this area here looks like it's detached as well. It's very shallow, but if you look at the retina here and look at it here, very clear fundus background above my red dotted lines here, or my red dots, very dull low-lying fluid here. This is a macula off detachment, not quite as urgent as it would be if, if the macula was attached. Here's another example of a retinal detachment. Um, again, this is a regmatogenous detachment, and you might say to me, what? This doesn't look like a retinal detachment. But again, it's just very shallow subretinal fluid. Um, again, if you look um, in the superior part of the retina, I'll outline the detachment for you once again. Um, here's the border of the detachment. Um, and you can see above those dotted lines, you see the background fundus much more clearly than you do in, in the inferior half. And this is actually a macula off detachment, the fovea, right in the dead center over there. This is the fovea, this whole area there. Um, that has detached. You can see it's, it's the fluid around it. Um, and so this patient, on the other hand, may not have quite as bad as 2200 vision because the fovea is only shallowly detached. So this patient could actually have like 2060 vision with their retinal detachment. It's an unusual situation. Um, and in this situation, if you fix it, um, and, this, and the urgency is not here, but if you fix it, chances are they're going to regain most of their vision because the retina is so shallowly detached. So you're looking, you know, you're hoping to operate an eye that where the re, where the macula, where the fovea is still attached, or it's very shallow subretinal fluid. Now, how do we fix retinal detachments? Well, one of the ways we fix it is with a scleral buckle. A scleral buckle is a piece of silicone that we put on the outside of the eye. We open up, we, we open up conjunctiva, drape it out of the way, and then underneath conjunctiva, we put this piece of silicone on the wall of the eye. And in this case, the, we, in this case, the silicone is being slipped under the muscles of the eye. Now sometimes, um, and, and this is the silicone right over here, this white thing. Um, and the silicone, this is a silicone tire, uh, this is a 287 tire, they have numbers, or I think it's a 287, it slipped under the muscles and goes around the wall of the eyeball. Now, we don't always, I don't always, I don't usually stick it around the entire wall of the eye. Some guys do um, to buckle the entire retina. I tend to do it in just little locations where the tear is located. Um, but 
this is one of the ways we fix it. And we're basically pushing the wall of the eyeball into the tears of the retina. So by pushing the wall into the tear, we're closing the tear. And then we seal the tear with laser or cryotherapy, um, which basically tack down around the tear so that no more fluid could go in. Sclerobuckles years ago were the only way to treat it, and now there are other ways to treat it. I tend to only use, sclerobuckles have become less and less commonly used to fix retinal detachments. They still are used, and they're still very good for certain types of cases. I personally uh, will use them for patients that have lattice degeneration with retinal holes. Um, if the detachment occurred because of the hole, rather than a tear in the retina, or if the patient just has a lot of lattice with holes, I might just use a sclerobuckle. Um, sometimes I'll use it, I tend to use sclerobuckles in younger patients who still have vitreous attachment. Um, and I tend to use them more when the retinal detachment is developed from a tear that's inferiorly. Um, so those would be the indications where I would use a sclerobuckle. Everyone has their own indications, but I think those are the proper ones. Um, the reason I use it for in for young patients again is because the vitreous hasn't detached to most of them, and I don't want to have to produce the vitreous detachment when I go in there. Um, sometimes the vitreous is very adherent to the retina, and it becomes very difficult to detach it, and you can tear the retina doing that. And so I'll tend to in a young patient just buckle the tears or holes and fix it. Um, and I tend to do it when the retinal detachment, when the retinal tears are inferior because the alternative is to do uh, procedures that use gas and gas tends to rise up and it's hard to get the gas to close the breaks that are inferiorly. So um, sclerobuckles are certainly a good way to go. Here's an internal appearance of what a sclerobuckle could look like. I can't tell you how many patients over the years have been sent to me to look at the retina because the doctor sees the retina is elevated um, and they think it's a retinal detachment. Um, the sclerobuckle is 360 in this case. Here's your sclerobuckle. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Here's the sclerobuckle. Almost, the margin of it is this and it goes all the way out here. Um, so you can see it from here to here. I kind of made a mess, but uh, and if we just keep going along, it goes in both directions. So it's from this point more anteriorly all the way out to here where I made my last red dot. That's the sclerobuckle. That's where it's elevated. Um, and you can see that it goes 360 around the eye. Um, so we're pushing the retina, we're pushing the wall into the retina so that we close the retinal break and then we put freeze or laser around the tear in the retina to keep it closed. Now, another way that we can fix retinal detachments is with gas. And there are two ways that we use gas. One of them is called pneumatic retinopexy. That's an office procedure where we inject a gas bubble into the eye. Um, because we're, if we're doing a pneumatic retinopexy, we're limited in the size of the gas bubble that we put in the eye. We're just, you know, you can't inject too much gas. You'll raise the intraocular pressure too much. So here's a patient who had a retinal detachment that was located supertemporally. We injected a gas bubble in there, and the bubble um, is pushing the retina back. Actually, you know what? Yeah. Um, and I might be getting a little confused. In any case, the, we, we're limited to the size of the gas bubble. So when you have a retinal detachment, that uh, retinal detachments that will respond to pneumatic retinopexy tend to be ones where the tear is located, let's say, between 11 and 1 or in the superior half of the retina for sure. And there's usually only one tear. If there are more than one tear, then you want all the tears to be very close together because you have a small bubble and it can only push in one spot. Now, the way pneumatic retinopexy works is you first surround the retinal tear with cryotherapy and then inject a gas bubble that pushes the hole. The, the, the bubble closes the tear. 
you have to have the bubble push against the tear so that no more fluid can go in the tear. And then the retina will, will the, the subretinal fluid, the fluid that's beneath the retina, will get absorbed by the retinal pigment epithelium. So the pigment epithelium is constantly pumping out fluid that's under the retina, but if fluid keeps coming into that space, the retina will stay detached. If you can prevent fluid from going back into the subretinal space, in other words, if you can block the tear with a gas bubble, no more fluid will go in there, and the eye will pump out the fluid that's under the retina. Now, you've got to also seal the tear so that when the bubble goes away, it stays sealed and no more fluid could go in there. So that's where the role of cryotherapy or laser come in. Uh, laser can't be applied to detached retina, so with a laser, the procedure